sporting angry wood at this point, and my dick envied my hand. But how she responded to me, how she moved and sighed and pleaded, wound itself around my chest, filled my lungs. I experienced something akin to wonder. She'd been right. It didn't take long. When she gripped my wrist as she panted and rocked on my lap, her mindlessness at my hands made me want to give voice to my possessive and claiming thoughts. Your body is mine. This is mine. You are mine. I didn't, though. Even as I felt her glorious body clench around my fingers and watched her come apart in beautiful waves, I swallowed the words. Because she was mine, but with an expiration date. Chapter 15 The traveler sees what he sees. The tourist sees only what he has come to see. G.K. Chesterton Jessica I saw Duane at church. Reverend Seymour held two services every Sunday, the fast service at eight and the leisurely service at ten. Bethany Winston, when she was alive, and all the Winston boys went to the fast service. It lasted for an hour, tops. My mama called it fast food religion. She complained loud and often about the regular attendees, calling them Catholics parading as Baptists. My family had always attended the 10 a.m. service. It lasted anywhere between one and a half to three hours, and community worship was the name of the game. Sometimes it felt like everyone in attendance spoke at least once, asking for prayers or saying a special prayer or giving witness. Even after church was over, it was still going on. Groups of people met in the hall. They socialized, ate donuts, held prayer circles, and drank weak coffee. For this reason, I'd hardly ever seen Duane at church, and I likely wouldn't have except my daddy unexpectedly woke me up early Sunday morning for a heaping helping of fast food religion. I suspected he was anxious to get Sunday service out of the way because the cowboys were playing the Patriots at noon. This suspicion was confirmed when I spotted the fixings for nachos and a six-pack of Corona in the fridge, my father's version of wild and reckless behavior. We arrived a few minutes early and sat in the back. Duane and three of his brothers, Billy, Cletus, and Bo, arrived a short time later and strolled to one of the middle pews. At first I was struck speechless by the sight of them, four tall, fine-looking men with broad shoulders and narrow hips dressed in their Sunday uniform of black pants, white button-down shirts, moving with an intrinsic kind of swagger, grace, and confidence in their step. Really, it was too much handsome. It felt like an assault. The last time I'd seen so many male Winstons together all at once was when I was 13, and all six of them were at the church picnic. Roscoe, Bo, and Duane had been in braces at the time. They were cute, handsome men. But now they were all grown up. I imagined it would be difficult for any red-blooded female to keep focus on the worship with an entire pew of Winston men in attendance. As soon as my wits recovered from the Winston handsome assault, I thought about calling out or making some sign to Duane, but I felt my daddy's narrowed eyes on me and therefore opted to remain quiet. Furthermore, I felt conflicted about how our date had ended the night before. I'd assumed things were going splendidly. Well, it had gone splendidly until the very end, when I tried to reciprocate his wonderful ministrations— and instead of enthusiastically taking me up on the offer, he gently pushed away my advances. He drove me to my parents' house, mumbling about having me home by a respectable time. Once there, I received a kiss on the cheek, and he left without making any new plans. Service started, and I couldn't concentrate. For me, the difficulty was having Duane within such proximity— It's problematic for your soul when your body is recalling fleshy pursuits from the night before, and the week before that, and the week before that. I felt a twinge of embarrassment at how I behaved, how I'd been behaving since weeks ago at the community center, how I'd basically thrown myself at him multiple times, and how he'd gently rejected me each time. Maybe he didn't want my enthusiasm. Maybe he wanted to take things slow. 
or maybe my fervor for his touch and kisses and embrace was a turnoff. This last theory didn't sit right. He seemed to like it, liked making me feel good, watching me lose my control. Maybe he just didn't want to lose his control. Well, this behavior was not so typical for me, and my thoughts turned inward as I tried to determine why I'd been acting so out of character. Yes, I liked to kiss and be kissed, flirt and have fun. However, anything beyond kissing had never felt quite natural with anyone else. Putting on the brakes in the past had been effortless, and I'd mindfully explored at my own pace, even the guy, a.k.a. the Shetland Pony, I'd lost my virginity with. In college, if I felt pressured by a boy to round the bases, I'd move on. Walking away had always been easy. Yet with Dwayne... Well, I realized I didn't feel in control. I felt needy. I felt urgency. I felt desperate. I wanted to be with him or close to him all the time. When we weren't together, I was thinking about him, specifically conversations we'd had as kids and adolescents and viewing them through a new lens. He was becoming dear to me with alarming speed because I was allowing our history to tangle with our present. And truthfully, part of the problem was I just liked him so much. I wasn't going to play any games. Games were dishonest but I made a solemn promise to be more circumspect and careful about flinging my heart and panties at him in the future. He caught me unawares with his backstage trickery, and then his vulnerable honesty at the lake. I decided I was going to slow down, adopt a more mindful attitude. If he wanted to take things slow, then I could take things slow, too. When the service was over just 35 minutes after it had begun, I was surprised my father didn't rush out of church. He even placed a staying hand on my arm when I moved to leave the pew. Just a sec, Jess. I glanced at him, allowing my confusion to show on my face. My daddy gave me a small smile and lifted his chin towards the aisle, where people were filtering out. Your young man is here. Wouldn't be right leaving without a word to Duane. I squinted at my father, immediately suspicious of his intentions. At best, my father was indifferent to all my previous boyfriends, the ones he'd met anyway, and at worst, he'd been dismissive and rude. Daddy, is this your way of telling me you like Dwayne Winston? I whispered. No, this is my way of telling you I like Dwayne Winston. He cleared his throat and returned my squinty expression. Jess, I like Dwayne Winston. I couldn't help the surprised laugh that bubbled forth or the smile of wonder that claimed my features as I studied my daddy. But you don't like anybody. That's because ain't nobody good enough for you. And Dwayne is? No, but his mama, rest her soul, was the best sort. Now, if I had my pick, I'd rather Cletus or Billy, but you know how Jackson and I are worthless with cars. It would be nice to have a mechanic in the family. I'm sure my eyes bulged. Daddy, we just started dating. Yeah, but it's clear that this man has his mind set on the long term. And if Dwayne Winston turns out to be a reason for you to stay in Green Valley instead of following through with your absurd plans then I'll happily put up with him courting my daughter. I gave my daddy a sad smile, and my heart fell just a tad. He didn't bring up my plans to leave often, but when he did, he always used words like absurd, reckless, preposterous, misguided, and foolish, stopping just short of calling me stupid. I didn't like disappointing my parents, so I never brought them up. Hello, sir. I twisted back toward the aisle, finding Duane standing just inside our pew with his hand outstretched to my father. The other three Winstons were loitering in the pew to my right. I realized they were all waiting to pay their respects. After greeting my father, Duane turned his attention to me. He didn't offer his hand. Instead, he stuffed both into his pockets, nodding once in my direction and saying, Jessica. In that way, he did with a slight whisper and giving me the entirety of his intense focus. Hi, Duane. 
I tried to be circumspect and mindful. After all, we were still in church, but it didn't work. My simple greeting sounded beyond delighted, even to my ears, verging on enthusiastic. Music only I could hear switched on. This time it was Just the Way You Are by Bruno Mars, except the she's were replaced with he's. Goodness, I was pathetic. Because of the distracting music in my head and the intensity of Duane's attention, I missed most of the other conversation and the friendly chit-chat between my daddy and the rest of the Winston boys. I was only able to recover when Duane shifted his attention back to my father. I imagine you and Jess have plans for the day, I heard my daddy ask. We didn't. We hadn't made any plans. Therefore, I was surprised when Duane nodded. Yes, sir, we do. What are you kids up to? He asked, using his sheriff's voice. We're heading to the shop, and I'm planning to teach Jessica how to change a tire. I'm sure my face betrayed my astonishment. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Bo try to hide his smirk, and I was glad my back was mostly to my father, so he couldn't see my expression. Good idea, son. Why, you had a teacher had to check the fluids, change the oil and such. Then she could teach me and Jackson. Be happy to, sir. Dwayne gave my daddy a short, respectful nod, then returned his eyes to mine. Once again, I was struck by how he was looking at me. He was looking at me like he had plans. Brown sugar? Why would he put brown sugar in the radiator? Because someone told him it would stop the leak. Did it? No, brown sugar doesn't work, but eggs do. I'd left church with Duane. All the Winstons had driven their own cars. Now I was facing him, one leg tucked under me, my elbow resting on the bench seat of his road runner and my face propped in my palm. I stared at his profile, trying not to notice how he'd rolled his shirt sleeves to his forearms. The man had beautiful forearms. Eggs? People put eggs in their radiator? Yep. I'd done it before to stop a leak, in a pinch. Some places in these mountains it's easier to find a hen house than it is to find electrical tape. Why do eggs work and not brown sugar? I reckon because they're heavier when cooked, sink in hot water. Brown sugar gums up, but it floats. I stared at Duane for a long moment, thinking about his reasoning. Huh. That's crazy. He shrugged as we pulled into the Winston Brothers auto shop. I seen crazier. People with no money, desperate to have a working car, or worse than patients with no health insurance or access to a doctor. They'll try anything. Tell me something else. Like what? He didn't park out front, instead opting to wind the car around to the back of the building, which I thought was odd for exactly three seconds. Then I remembered it was Sunday. I surmised he didn't want anyone knowing we were here and therefore checking to see if the shop was open for business. Something about cars and wackadoodle customers. Tell me something else weird or funny. Dwayne cut the engine and glanced at me. Let's see. Sometimes people will complain about the cost of service, but we can't do anything about how much parts cost. So Cletus came up with the idea of adding fake line items to spread the cost around. Like what? Like muffler bearings. Muffler bearings? I asked just as Duane exited. I was already out with the door shut by the time he made it to my side, despite his hustling. Yeah, it's strange. Duane took my hand, frowning at the car door behind me like he was irritated with it for letting me out. People won't question an itemized bill as long as each individual charge is small. I came up with a few fictitious charges after arguing with this one guy about the cost of a new transmission. What are some of yours? Well, let's see. Dwayne's eyes went up and to the right as we walked toward the back of the shop. Blinker fluid? I giggled. Blinker fluid? You told people they needed blinker fluid? He nodded, a reluctant smile tugging his mouth to the side. Or spark plugs for a diesel engine? Power antenna fluid, that kind of stuff. I shook my head, laughing harder. I can't believe no one has caught on. I don't think they want to catch on. They feel like they're getting a good price on the main work, and no one really wants to know how their car works. 
People just want it to work. They want it fixed. He released my hand in order to open the locked door and flipped on the overhead lights as we entered. The space was just as cold as the outside and smelled like a medley of oil and actual car fluids. I can see that. I mean, if you told me my car needed muffler bearings, I wouldn't know enough to contradict you. We don't do it to everyone, just people who are perpetual complainers, or we get a sense ahead of time who might be trouble. Watch your step. His voice echoed in the cavernous shop, and he squeezed my hand, lifting it as he indicated to a muffler on the cement floor directly in our path. I followed his lead, careful to watch where I stepped and spoke as I thought. It's interesting to me how some people need to be pacified and don't even know it. About themselves, I mean. Lots of people are like that. Almost everybody, to one degree or another. Yeah, maybe. I can see that. I'd like to think I will always want the truth from everybody, no matter what, no matter how uncomfortable or hurtful. But I'm sure there are some situations where remaining ignorant is likely best. I agree, to an extent. We skirted the garage to a side door, then navigated two landings of stairs to a big room. It appeared to be a combination office, break room, and apartment. A big desk and computer sat along one wall facing the window. A small cot, counter, fridge, and sink were along the other. File cabinets lined the third, and a single round formica table with three chairs sat in the center. To an extent? I asked. Yeah, to an extent. He left me at the door and crossed to one of the file cabinets. I wandered in after him, glancing around as he fished in a drawer for a few seconds. Be more specific. What do you mean, to an extent? He then withdrew something wrapped in a plastic bag and poked a hole to rip it open. Well, take you, for example. Me? Yeah, you. You're almost too honest. I considered him and his statement for a beat, not sure if it was a compliment or an insult or a complicult. When I couldn't make up my mind, I asked, is that a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing, real good. He answered with no hesitation, drawing a set of new coveralls out of the plastic bag. I like it. I've always liked it. But I worry for you sometimes. Now that made my insides feel soft and warm. I was walking towards him without realizing I was moving. Obviously, he had me caught in some kind of charming tractor beam. You worry for me? Yes. Most of the time, what you're thinking is on your face like an open book for anyone to read. I guess... He paused like he didn't know whether or not to continue, but then eventually shrugged. It reminds me of my mama and my sister. You're guileless, trusting. And that's great for me, but it can also make you a target. I'm not that trusting. Dwayne's eyes narrowed, and he issued me a sly smile. Yes, you are. I'm not, I protested, feeling my hackles rise. Okay, whatever you say, he shrugged, handing me the coveralls, obviously making a half-assed effort to pacify me. I clenched my jaw, liking and disliking the way his sly smile lingered. You think I'm naive? I am not naive. I'm worldlier than you know. Naive, it always sounded like an insult to me akin to childish. I'm just saying, when you trust someone, you really trust that person. You've always been that way, ever since we were kids. I studied him, wondering why we were talking about this. Therefore, I eventually asked, why are we talking about this? Are you trying to tell me not to trust you? I would never tell you that. That's not a satisfactory answer. His features cracked with an involuntary smile. Then he took six steps forward, walking me backward until I was against the wall. Though he was invading my space, he didn't touch me. I had to lift my chin to keep administering the dirty look I'd adopted. Jessica, he whispered, his gaze sweeping over my face like he was attempting to memorize this dirty look I was giving him. My priority is making sure all your dreams come true. You can trust me on that.
but can I trust you not to push me into a lake while I'm in my Sunday best, or switch out my travel magazines with urology journals? He nodded and placed a gentle kiss on my nose, but as he retreated, he said, No. No? No. If I get a chance to push you into a lake, I'm probably going to take it, especially if you're wearing that dress. His eyes flickered down just briefly, then back to mine. I huffed, felt my dirty look transform into a disappointed frown. See, now, I've been working under the assumption that you liked me. Dwayne's sly smile returned and his eyes heated. I recognized this look. It was his I've got plans look. I do like you, Jessica. You see, now, that dress is white. And if it got wet, it wouldn't matter if you left it on or took it off. I kept my eyes narrowed, though I felt my own involuntary smile tug at the corner of my lips. A lovely, spreading warmth moved from my chest to my stomach to my thighs. I remembered the solemn promise I'd made to myself during church, not to fling my heart or my panties in his direction, to be circumspect and mindful. He was making it very hard to keep my solemn promises, let alone be mindful. Nevertheless, and even though I was starting to feel that uncomfortable, desperate, building sense of urgency, I managed to squeak out, I'd like some privacy while I change, please. The light behind Duane's eyes wavered, like I'd said something to confuse him. You want some privacy? I nodded. Really? He took a step back. I nodded again. His smile was gone, and in its place was a thoughtful, verging on concerned frown. He examined me for a bit longer, then said, You can trust me, Jess. You know that, right? I know, and I do. Good. To an extent. He smiled, scowled at my use of his earlier words, then shook his head like I was a nut. Fine. I'll meet you downstairs, princess. We'll be changing attire first. I gave him two thumbs up. Sounds good, Red. His scowl deepened, but so did his smile as he turned toward the door and yanked it open. I heard him mutter as he left. Maybe after that we can go find a lake. We changed four tires. The shop had one of those high-powered thingamadoodles, yet he insisted we do it the old-fashioned way with a car jack and a tire iron. Next, he showed me how to check the oil and various car fluids, remarking on the differences between several makes and models, like the fact that old VW Bugs' engines were air-cooled and didn't have radiators. I was having fun, mostly because watching Dwayne in his element was fun. I realized Dwayne Winston loved cars. He loved how they worked, how each car was different, nuanced, a puzzle to be solved. And he told me more stories about nutty customers that made me laugh, even though I couldn't quite follow them. One was about a man whose air filter was sucked into the throttle body, and another described a customer who added eight quarts of oil to his four-cylinder engine because the dipstick looked dry, except at the tip. Some of the terms he used, like throttle body, made me press my lips together, avert my eyes from his big hands, and fight a blush. I'd never realized before, but automotive speak was ripe with inadvertent sexual innuendos, like manifold couplings, dipstick, and lube. Or maybe I just had a dirty mind. Or maybe it was just Dwayne. Perhaps his mere presence did things to my throttle body. Or maybe it was some combination of the three. Whatever the issue, I was feeling hot under the collar of my oversized coveralls and had to unzip them to my chest, surreptitiously fanning myself after he used the phrases drive shaft and push rod in the same sentence. While I fanned myself, I walked over to a stereo sitting on a well-lit table. Small, greasy machine parts covered the surface of the table, making me think the car part was either being disassembled or reassembled. I switched on the stereo to CD mode and pressed play, curious to see what had been playing last. 
To my astonishment, the cool, harmonic melodies of the Beach Boys filled the air. I glanced over my shoulder and found Duane watching me with not quite a smile, though his eyes were glittery. The Beach Boys? That's right. He nodded once and strolled to where I stood, wiping his hands on a rag and stuffing it into his back pocket. He'd changed into a set of coveralls, too. However, his fit were old with faded grease stains and had his name embroidered over the left side. Everyone likes the Beach Boys. At least that's what my mama used to say. Everyone likes the Beach Boys and pie. I grinned, because Bethany Winston was right. Well, she was right about me, at least. I liked the Beach Boys and pie. I turned to face him, and he stopped in front of me, smirking as he studied my appearance. I was pretty sure I had grease on my face, probably my nose and several smudges on the new coveralls. I likely looked a mess. Yet Duane seemed to like what he saw because his eyes grew warm with what looked like affection. Come here, he said, holding out his hand. I placed my hand in his as chords from fun, fun, fun played over the stereo speakers. To my delighted surprise, Duane pulled me into a dancing hold and proceeded to swing dance us around the garage. I was so shocked at first, I'm sure I stepped on his toes and did more stumbling than dancing. But the steps I'd learned in college during my two-week swing dancing phase quickly came back to me, probably because Duane was an exceptional leader, and soon we were moving together in a way that felt effortless. The next song on the CD was Brown-Eyed Girl by Van Morrison. I laughed out loud when he sang the words to me, because I could either laugh or swoon, and I was delighted from the tips of my ears to my toes, feeling dizzy with the force of exhilaration and happiness. Build Me Up Buttercup by The Foundations, I Want You Back by The Jackson Five, and Uptown Girl by Billy Joel rounded out the next three songs. I was out of breath, sweaty, and making no attempt to hide my euphoria when a slow song finally came on. Again, the Beach Boys. This time it was Don't Worry Baby. Duane grinned down at me and pulled me close, pressing my body against his, his bearded jaw at my temple, and moved us in a small, swaying circle. I closed my eyes, using the first full minute of the song to catch my breath. Then I used the next thirty seconds to force my heart to slow, but it wouldn't. First of all, I could smell him, and he smelled good. So, so good. Plus, his arms around me felt remarkable, and the way his body moved with mine, the feel of his chest and stomach and thighs. Oh, sigh. I both loved and hated his embrace, Loved for obvious reasons. Hated because I knew I needed to keep myself at a distance when all I wanted to do was snuggle and kiss and grope him with abandon. But if I did that, then I'd likely have to face another of his gentle rejections. I needed to be mindful and circumspect. I felt the familiar building of desperation and urgency, but I pushed it away. He wanted to go slow. I could go slow. I could do that. I could control myself. I could. I felt Duane lean away, felt his gaze on me, so I opened my eyes and met his. He was frowning, searching my face. What's wrong? I shook my head. Nothing. His frown escalated in severity, his forehead creasing. What's wrong, Jess? And don't say nothing. You're all stiff and distant. Emotion I didn't recognize felt like a swelling balloon in my throat, and I pressed my lips together, not knowing how to respond. And then he said, Just be honest. So I sighed and was honest. I'm trying to go slow, but it's not easy. I, well, I really like you. Like, really like you. I'm thinking about you all the time, and last week was difficult when we were apart. 
It may sound crazy, but I missed you terribly. And not because you get me all hot and bothered. Yeah, that's a part of it. But you make me laugh, and being with you feels so good and comfortable. But based on how you keep putting me off, I think you want to go slow. I'm trying to. I shrugged, searched the space around his head for the right words, and finally settled on. I'm trying to be less wild and reckless. I want to be respectful of you, of your wishes. And that's the whole truth. Dwayne's mouth parted slightly, and his eyebrows lifted high on his forehead. All hints of his earlier frown had vanished. Unless I was misreading his expression, he appeared to be a little lost, like maybe I'd stolen his breath and his wallet and his passport and his memories. Really, he looked stunned. I swallowed, not sure what to say or do as the slow song came to an end and silence took its place. My heart thundered painfully in my chest. The moment felt taut and untenable, so I moved to distance myself. Dwayne's grip tightened, preventing me from stepping away. Then something behind his gaze acutely sharpened, and the sharpness felt dangerous. My eyes widened in alarm just before Dwayne's mouth sought and claimed mine. He kissed me, wet, devouring, open-mouthed kisses, and gripped my arms a little too tight. He walked me backward until my legs connected with the hood of the Mustang— Pushing me backward, he released my arms, his hands moving to the zipper of my coveralls. Breathing hard, I gripped his wrists and ducked my head to the side to evade his mouth. Dwayne's savageness caught me off guard and sucked me into a vortex of ferocious longing. Wait, wait a minute, what's... I want you, Jess, so much you don't know. He unzipped the jumper, pulling it off my shoulders with a yank and trapping my arms against my sides, lowering my back to the car. His mouth and tongue worked, kissing and licking and sucking from my jaw to my neck to my nipple with his teeth and the tip of his tongue. I didn't know if I'd ever recover, as sharp slices of hot need ran down my spine into my lower abdomen. Dwayne, please. My arms were still trapped and I was laying on the hood of the car, writhing and arching my back, trying to get closer. He was over me, devouring my skin, pressing his thigh where I needed him. Don't change a thing. God, just don't change a single thing. Be wild for me. Be reckless. I love your kind of wild. I love... His words were lost as he moved lower, his hand replacing his leg. My breath came in short, excited bursts, and I briefly fought the sleeves holding my arms to my sides. But then my captivity was forgotten, and I melted against the metal of his Mustang, a bundle of nerve endings and feelings and insensible desire. He had me trapped. I was helpless to him. As he touched and tasted my body, he watched me his gaze a mirror of the urgency and desperation I felt at his hands and mouth. Maybe I was being absurd and reckless, misguided and foolish. I knew he would push me, I had no doubt, but I trusted him. I trusted that even though Duane would definitely push, he'd also be there to catch me when I fall. Chapter 16 I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. Oscar Wilde. The Importance of Being Earnest. Duane. She wanted to give me a blowjob. I suggested fried pie instead. It took some convincing, but Jess finally agreed. Yet her agreement came only after I pointed out that Daisy's nut house would be closing in an hour. If we were going to secure pie, the time was now. While she righted herself, I grabbed my clothes, took a walk upstairs, and shoved my head and neck under the cold water faucet, thinking of England and the Queen. This was a trick Cletus taught me some years ago. When faced with a stubborn boner, thinking of all those wrinkled, disapproving monarchs in their fancy clothes usually worked. It didn't exactly work this time, but it worked enough. I couldn't keep wearing my tinted coveralls, so I switched back into my pants. I'm not sure why I turned her down feeling her lose her mind against my mouth and fingers, this time lying on the hood of the Mustang I was determined to give her. 
was going in my long-term memory storage for frequent replay. I should have taken her up on the offer to reciprocate, but I couldn't. Fuck, I wanted to, but I couldn't. Not until everything was just right. Not until we had more than a few hours. So instead, I tried to recall the names of Henry VIII's six wives and how each had met her demise. Both easing and increasing the torture on the ride over, Jess snuggled close to me, opting to use the center seat belt and laying her head on my shoulder as I drove. She sighed a lot, and she smiled a lot. At one point, she picked up my hand from where it rested on her thigh and studied my fingers, holding them close to her face and tracing my knuckles. I like your hands. My hands like you. She smiled again, then sighed against my neck. This feels good. What's that? I slowed to make the turn into Daisy, scanning the cars in the lot. It was fairly packed. I don't know what to call it. Post-orgasmic bliss, I guess. I released a short laugh and shook my head. Don't tell me I've given you your first. She shrugged. Even though we'd parked and I'd turned off the engine, she made no move to relinquish her spot curled against my side. No, I'm quite talented at the art of self-pleasuring. At this statement, two thoughts warred for my attention. First, I was vehemently determined to get her to myself again as soon as possible because I'd very much enjoy watching her talent in the art of self-pleasuring. And second, unless I'd misunderstood, her admission meant I was the first guy who'd brought her to orgasm. My possessive impulses were back with a sudden fierceness. I leaned slightly away so I could see her eyes. Jess, have you ever... I mean, are you... A small V formed between her eyebrows as I struggled to ask my question but then her forehead cleared when she understood. Oh, no. No, I'm no virgin. First of all, my hymen broke when I was a teenager while horseback riding at Mon's farm in Texas. Thank God, because I hear breaking through that thing the old-fashioned way is like getting stabbed in the hoo-ha. And secondly, I had sex with a guy in college. He was really nice, but it was underwhelming in the extreme. I frowned at this news, irritated someone else had touched her but also strangely both pissed and relieved the experience had been underwhelming. Just one guy? She nodded, looking unperturbed, then asked, How about you? How many girls have you been with? I studied her, bracing myself for her reaction to the truth. Just one? Jessica blinked several times, like I'd startled her and she choked out. Just, just one? I nodded searching for any clues as to what she was thinking. Just one, she repeated, mostly to herself and pulled away from me. After several seconds, her gaze darted to mine, then away again. She laughed without humor, staring at her lap and said, I guess you really were in love. What do you mean? I rested my arm on the bench behind Jess's shoulders, surprised by her words, wondering if it were possible she already knew how I thought of her. With Tina. I guess you really loved her. I reeled back and said much louder than I intended. Tina? In love with Tina? Oh, hell no. Jessica examined me with a questioning frown. Then why did you... Why were you only with Tina? For five years. I half rolled my eyes and tilted my head toward the door to Daisy's. Let's go inside. Are you avoiding the question? No. For the record, I was never in love with Tina. i just like some pie if we're going to talk about this. I drawled, figuring it was time to return her unfailing honesty with my own. I was happy to see Jess's answering smile and nod of agreement. On her way in, I scanned the diner. The place was packed, especially for a late Sunday afternoon. I didn't see a free table. I was about to suggest we order our pie to go when Jess pointed to two newly vacated spots at the counter near the door. We can sit there. Before I could answer, she pulled me to the empty stools. The seats were pretty good, all things considered. I could see the rest of the diner from our position, but the door was to our back. Nevertheless, it was a good place to scope out any booths that might become available. Do you need a menu? She asked, reaching forward to where the laminated trifold menus were kept. No, I know what I want. Good. Me too. She smiled, 
looking at my mouth like she was planning on having it for supper. I cleared my throat so I wouldn't groan. Closing my eyes, I pinched the bridge of my nose, trying to remember what we were discussing in the car. This was a mistake. Images of Jess on the hood of her Mustang filled my vision, the faith in her eyes, the raw want and trust. I meant it when I'd said I'd loved her type of wild and reckless. It was sweet, honest, and generous. She was a good woman, and I didn't want her holding back or feeling like she needed to. Thus, I needed to settle on a place, and soon, a place where we could be alone together, maybe for days, and we could do things right. Admittedly, my motivations weren't entirely honorable. I needed to satisfy the relentless hard-on between my legs, especially when her honest words were playing on repeat between my ears. I'm trying to go slow, but it's not easy with you. I really like you. I'm thinking about you all the time. I missed you terribly. Being with you feels so good. I want to be respectful of you, of your wishes. So, you were saying about Tina, Jess prompted, interrupting the self-inflicted torture. I nodded, sucked in a deep breath, and opened my eyes. I found her watching me with so much trust and admiration, I almost pinched myself. This was my reality, and one day, she was going to walk away. Tina, I nodded, cleared my throat again. She waited for a beat, then prompted once more. I asked you why you stayed with her for five years, if there was no love between you. Why didn't you move on, date someone else? What would have been the point? No one else was you, I thought. I shrugged, stalling, settling on one version of the truth. Laziness and convenience, I guess. She knew what was up from the start, that I didn't want anything serious with her or anyone else. Like I've said, she wasn't my girl. Jess's lips slanted downward on one side and her eyes narrowed as they moved between mine. So you've never been interested in anyone? I'm interested in you. The word slipped out. Her fearless honesty encouraged my own. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Why hmm? Hmm. Because I feel like you've cheated yourself out of five years and the possibility of something great. You could have met someone, fallen in love, been loved in return. But it's like you gave up before you even started. I didn't give up. I was biding my time. For what? For who? Someone you felt suited? No, not someone. For you. Jess's expressive eyes widened, then she blinked. You've been biding your time? For me? Maybe I had to work up to her level of brutal honesty, but eventually I got there. And now that I'd said the words, I sure as hell wasn't taking them back. That's right. There was no point in dating other people. No one else is you. Her face both fell and brightened at once, like my words made her sad and happy. Oh, Dwayne. She sounded heartbroken and elated. What am I going to do with you? Stay? I wasn't going to say that. Asking her to stay would be taking her dreams away. Instead, I shrugged. You could buy me pie. Jess stood from her stool and stepped between my legs, winding her arms around my neck. She pressed herself to me, giving me a tight hug and whispering into my ear. You're a siren who doesn't sing. I chuckled, returning her embrace, and placed a quick kiss on her neck. I couldn't quite swallow. My head was mixed up. What I wanted, knew, and needed didn't align. I wanted her to stay. I knew she had to go. I needed to remember every day was one day closer to the end. Otherwise, her leaving would be my destruction. Maybe I wasn't being fair, encouraging her to lose control while I refused to cede control. But self-preservation required it. She gave me one more squeeze, then leaned away. Meanwhile, I battled between forced numbness and a painful desire to give in, let go of my survival instinct. Jess gave me another adoring smile. I'll go get our pie. Be right back. I let her go and she rushed away, though I followed her with my eyes as she walked the length of the counter and disappeared into the kitchen. My attention affixed to the swinging galley door for a long time. I finally managed to swallow around the thick discomfort in my throat, the 
painful desire to give in replaced with a cold certainty that I couldn't. It wouldn't be fair, not to me and not to her, because then I would ask her to stay. Well, looky what we have here. I stiffened in my seat and turned on my stool slowly, not cursing though I wanted to. I was in no hurry to see Repo. Repo, I said, likely sounding as irritated and bored as I was, while my eyes moved over to the rest of his companions. There were a few younger guys I didn't recognize. A few I did. One was Kip Sylvester's son, Isaac, and his presence was a surprise. He was a year or so older than me, and last I knew he was still in the army. I gathered seeing him here in the company of the Wraiths meant he'd been discharged. I had a few tetchy thoughts then, like wondering what his father, the principal, and his mother, the socialite, would think of his involvement with the Wraiths. Before my gaze settled on Tina, my ex, near the back of the entourage. I had to fight another eye roll because she was giving me one of her looks, all while rubbing up against one of the bikers. Hi, Dwayne, she said, flapping her eyelashes. Tina, I acknowledged, hoping my visible indifference toward her would hide my frustration at seeing her now. I'd been calling her nonstop for the last week. Bo had also been calling, trying to find a time to meet up so the three of us could discuss a plan for copying and erasing the Iron Wraith's computer files. But she'd responded with only text messages, telling us both to come see her at the Pink Pony if we wanted to talk. I wanted to go to that strip club again like I wanted kidney stones. Oh, you don't mind, do you, son? Repo walked toward me, lowering his voice as he approached. Your girl Tina has been keeping lots of our guys real happy. I shrugged. Why would I mind? She was never my girl. Besides, spreading happiness is what she does best. Repo chortled, his hand coming down on my shoulder, and he shook his head. You're not so bad, Dwayne. I'm not so good, either. I looked meaningfully at his hand still gripping my shoulder. Repo's smile widened, and he released me. He glanced at his entourage and then lifted his chin toward two booths at the back of the diner. Pay their tab and ask them to leave. Nicely. Knowing Repo, he was intending to occupy the two tables even though they were currently filled. If Daisy had been here, Repo wouldn't have been able to pull a move like this. But she wasn't. The crowd of bikers strolled to the booths and I watched with mild curiosity as one of the Wraith's members smiled at the occupants, withdrew several bills, and said something I couldn't hear. Almost immediately, the customers shuffled out of their boots. I'm glad you're here, Repo said as I continued to watch the scene at the back of the restaurant. The customers were now nodding politely to the bikers as they went. It saves me a trip to your house. My eyes sliced to Repo's still smiling face and narrowed. You need to borrow a cup of sugar, old man? Repo's eyes also narrowed. I ain't baking no cakes. We both know why I'm so interested in your ornery company. I examined the older biker for a minute, peripherally aware of the displaced customers as they filed out of the restaurant. They didn't look upset, but they didn't look too happy either. You got three more days, son. Repo's typically friendly tone adopted a hard edge. I'll be expecting your answer. I thought about giving him my answer right this minute via my middle finger, but movement caught my eye, distracting me. Distraction quickly turned to dread when I spotted Jessica making her way back. She was carrying a tray with four slices of pie and two cups of coffee. Repo must have noticed my redirected attention because he turned and followed my line of sight. When his eyes connected with Jessica, he stood a bit straighter, his grin wavering, then falling, like the vision of her was shockingly unexpected. Jess was smiling her big smile at me, but I saw the precise moment when her attention snagged on Repo. She blinked, her steps faltered, and the big smile fell from her face, became polite and confused. She made her final approach with hesitant steps, her eyes clearly wary. Maybe her reaction had something to do with the fact that I was currently grinding my teeth. If my outward expression came anywhere close to the lethal impulses I'd barely restrained, I wasn't surprised she decided to tread with caution. Obviously, I didn't want her anywhere near the wraiths, nor did I want the wraiths anywhere near her. Thus, we needed to leave. Am I interrupting something? 
Jess glanced between Repo and me, not putting the tray down, like she hadn't made up her mind whether or not the pie would be safe. Nothing at all, Miss James. Repo responded, giving her a tight smile and reaching for the tray. His voice was hoarser, softer than usual as he asked, Can I help you with that? He was acting like a hypnotized loony bird, and I didn't like it. So I stood and walked around the biker, stepping between them and intercepting his reaching hands by taking the tray myself. I'm sorry. Her gaze flickered to me, then back to the biker, giving him a quizzical smile. Don't I know you? You look awfully familiar. Maybe, round town. But I know your mama real well. Again, his voice was soft, respectful. I tossed a furious look over my shoulder at Repo, not liking the way he was staring at Jess, all soft and revering like she was some kind of fairy princess, then turned back to her while I set the tray on the counter, blocking her view of the biker. Hey, can you go back and grab us some takeaway containers? We'll get this to go. Her gentle eyes studied me, and I saw a question hovering near the surface. In the end, though, she nodded and walked back to the kitchen, tucking her long, blonde hair behind her ears as she went. I waited until she was back in the kitchen before turning back to Repo and lowering my voice to a harsh whisper. Really? You know her mama real well? What the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you say that? Even though we were in a busy diner and I imagined we were making quite a scene, no one was paying us any heed. I hoped the locals assumed our heated exchange was about my piece of shit father. It wasn't unusual for Winston boys and the Iron Wraiths to clash on the subject from time to time. Repo kept his attention fixed to the spot where Jessica had disappeared and ignored my question. The sheriff's daughter, huh? That isn't really any of your concern, old man. He turned his black eyes to me and not a trace of good humor remained. He took a step toward me and lowered his voice so only I could hear. That is my concern. How's Jessica James any of your concern? He appeared to struggle for a moment, then finally said, because you're going to be my mechanic soon. That's not decided. He continued like I hadn't spoken, his glare narrowing. Do you think you'll be able to run our shop and still see that girl? Or are you thinking about double-crossing me? You think if you get tight with that family, they'll let Jethro off easy? That ain't so, son. Because what we got on Jethro is a federal matter, not local. I don't run your shop. I ground out. The muscle at his jaw ticked and his black eyes turned as mean as I'd ever seen them. Three days, son. Three days. I know how to read a calendar. I replied through gritted teeth. I needed to grab Jess and get the hell out of here. Because if we didn't leave soon, I was going to sucker punch one of the Wraith's most senior members and get my ass kicked by his younger brethren. I was good in a fight, but six against one were suicide odds. And you're a fool if you think you can run our shop and be getting close with that girl, too. She's too good for you. Quit being a selfish fuck and leave her alone. Mind your own goddamn business. I've seen it before. Some of our boys thinking they can be with her kind. It don't work out. Look at your daddy. Look what he did to your mama. He would ruined her. You want that for Jessica James? I'm not one of the wraiths. Repo's stony expression abruptly cracked with a little smile that looked more bitter than amused. And he said, Not yet. Chapter 17 The world is a book, and those who don't travel only read one page. Augustine of Hippo Jessica Two days. Monday and Tuesday. Two days of impersonal text messages. And all I kept thinking was that these were two days I'd never get back. We had limited time together, Duane and I, so two days without his company made me feel like I was being cheated, like he was reneging on his side of the deal. Since Sunday, the most intimate of our exchanges had been via text message, as follows. Me. Hey, Red. Want to get together tonight? Him. Can't. Me. I miss you. Him. You too. That had been Tuesday around 4 p.m. Now it was Wednesday just after noon and nothing. 
Therefore, I decided to force the issue. It was early release day, so I skipped out right after the bell and I made pie. As well as I bought the ingredients for meatloaf, mashed potato, and collards, enough to feed eight. I asked Claire to drive me over to the family's house that evening, intent on making those boys dinner, but also getting Dwayne alone so we could set a few things straight. If I was being clingy and overreacting, I needed to know, because I wanted to see him every day of the remaining time we had left. I wanted to see him every day, talk to him, listen to him laugh, and make me laugh. I wanted to kiss him and snuggle against his delectable body, and I wanted to return the favors he'd given to me. I wanted to make him feel good and treasured all the time. As we pulled up to the big house, I counted the cars. Dwayne's sexy machine, the roadrunner, was present, as was Cletus's Geo Prism. I was pretty sure the Ford truck was Billy's, which meant the candy red Pontiac vintage muscle car was Bo's. Four of the boys were at home. Claire, who'd been very supportive of my show up and surprise your boyfriend's family with dinner plan, helped me unload the groceries from her car and set them on the porch. I told her to drive away before I knocked on the door. They wouldn't be able to turn me away if I were stranded. Plus, I was holding a pie. This was a strategic decision. My mama once told me, no one turns away a lady bearing pie. If you want to get your foot in the door, bring pie and hold it in front of you. She called this the pie effect. Therefore, with a pile of groceries on the big porch behind me and a still warm apple pie in my hands, I knocked on the door to the family's house. The main structure sat on over 15 acres, backing up to the Great Smoky Mountains National Forest. The house itself had a wide, curving staircase, at least seven bathrooms and beautiful, large windows lining the back. It was a big house and had once been very grand. Over the last 20 years or so, the house and the land surrounding it had fallen into a state of messy disrepair. Winston was their daddy's name, but their mamas came from an old, established Tennessee family with the last name of Oliver, very high cotton. The house had been called Oliver House until around 10 years ago. Her father, Mr. Oliver, had been a policeman, a man of business and of considerable money. Bethany Oliver had married beneath her station or so all my mama's friends had whispered after Sunday service, by getting hitched to Daryl Winston at the very young age of 16. They'd had seven kids. He was terrible, and the rest was history. The old house had no doorbell, so I waited, only the butterflies in my stomach keeping me company. When no one answered after a stretch, I knocked again. After knocking for the third time with no answer, I worried. I glanced over my shoulder at the line of cars and decided to swap my worry away. Surely one of the brothers was at home. Left with very few options, either walk in uninvited or do a quick survey of the property, I decided to take my pie and go around the back. I figured walking in uninvited would be my last resort. It took me a bit to circumnavigate the house. Machine parts littered the path. I noticed a busted old cat earth mover, dull yellow with patches of rust, sat behind a giant detached garage. I made a mental note to check inside the garage before I walked into the house. Thankfully, I spotted a red head with a broad, muscular back about a hundred paces from the back of the house, standing on some sort of covered deck. I squared my shoulders and marched to the structure, seeing that either Bo or Duane was tending to a large, smoking grill. When I was about 20 feet away, the redhead, his back still turned, said, Do you have the sausage? He was Duane. My heart knew. The butterflies in my stomach flew to my chest, making breathing a labor. I was nervous. But I was also here, and I'd committed to this ambush. I wasn't going to shrink away now, even if dinner is bribery was the price. But I did have to clear my throat of my nerves before responding. No, but I have apple pie. Clearly startled, Duane turned fully around, his eyes moving up and down my form. He was surprised, and his features were a cloudy mess of stunned relief. I felt a good bit of tension leave my bones when he finally smiled like he couldn't help it and rushed forward. Duane intercepted me on the second step leading to the deck and, paying no heed to the dish in my hand, wrapped his arms around my body and gave me a big, 
getting down to business kiss. His mouth and hands felt wonderful and possessive, one slipping under my sweater and shirt to grip the bear of my back. I liked the kiss so much I almost dropped the pie. Too soon, but really after a full minute or more, the kiss was over, and he was nuzzling my ear. We were both breathing a bit hard. Goodness, I missed you, I said on a sigh, loving the texture and feel of his beard against my jaw and his hot breath on my neck. I miss you too, Jessica. He nibbled on my ear, whispering my name like it was a dirty word, but not a curse word, a dirty word, something erotic and scandalous. I had an odd thought then, that I liked my name on his lips more when it was whispered. We were interrupted by a voice from behind me. Is that pie? Dwayne stiffened a little but didn't relinquish his hold on me. Instead, after releasing a frustrated-sounding exhale, he lifted his head from my neck. Likewise, I glanced over my shoulder and found Dwayne's mirror image strolling toward us, an easy, friendly smile claiming Bo's features. But they weren't really a mirror image of each other. I decided one of the main differences between Duane and Bo was that Bo's smiles were easy, freely given. Duane's smiles were difficult, hard won, and I'd learned to treasure each one. I'll take that, Bo said as he breezed past, grabbing the pie from my hand. As he crossed to a picnic table on the deck and placed the dish on top of it, he added, I do love apple pie. Don't eat any of that. Dwayne said as we both watched Bo lean close and sniff it. I can't eat it. I don't have a fork. Yet. Bo looked around the deck like he was searching for something. Besides the picnic table and the large smoking grill, the 20 by 20 foot deck had several Adirondack chairs, a big wooden chest that I suspected was actually a cooler, likely full of beer, and an old wooden hutch painted lime green. The exposed wood ceiling was strung with white Christmas lights, which would come in handy once the sun set. Bo walked over to the lime green hutch and dug through a few drawers. Watching his brother, Dwayne shook his head like he was disgusted. He's looking for a fork, he explained, his hand slipping from my body, but then, in the same movement, tucking me under his arm. Don't eat any of that pie. It'll ruin your dinner. I'm just going to taste it. Dwayne looked like he was going to protest again, but I cut him off with my question. When did y'all get this deck? I don't remember it being here. Drew, Billy, and Jethro built it for Mama two years ago. She likes having dinner out here when the weather is nice. Dwayne was still speaking about his mother in the present tense. It made my heart hurt a bit. I didn't correct him, but I did give him a squeeze. I hate to ask because I don't want you to think I'm not happy to see you. Dwayne pulled away, just far enough that he could look into my eyes. But what are you doing here other than to bring me pie? Cletus walked past us at just that moment, and Billy wasn't far behind. This was good timing because now I could announce my plans to all of them. I'm actually here to make dinner for you and your brothers. I responded happily, gesturing to the pie Bo had placed on the picnic table. The pie's for dessert. I hope you like meatloaf. Oh, Jess. Dwayne appeared to be completely torn, and his voice held true regret. I wish you'd talk to me about your plans ahead of time. Tonight is sausage night. Sausage night? Yes, Cletus Winston's famous sausage is famous. Cletus uncovered a heaping platter of raw sausage that he'd set next to the smoking grill. These boys have been looking forward to my sausage all week long. Cletus. Billy's tone held a warning as he claimed the Adirondack chair nearest the grill, nodding to me as he sat. Evening, Jessica. I noted that Billy's Tennessee accent was back, thicker. Cletus cocked an eyebrow at his older brother, clearly not impressed. You're going to tell me you haven't been salivating for my sausage. I had to cover my mouth with my hand and press it there hard. Otherwise, I was going to launch into a fit of hysterical giggles. Dwayne scowled at his older brother, then squeezed my waist, drawing my attention back to him. 
His mouth curved to the side when he saw me struggle to contain my laughter, but he made no remark on it. Instead, he moved us to the picnic table, set me on his lap, and opted to clarify the situation. See now, since there's five of us left here, with Ashley back in Chicago and Roscoe at school, we each have a night of the week where it's our responsibility to cook. Then we fend for ourselves on the weekends. Bo, unable to find a fork, gave up his search and pulled three beers out of the wooden chest, setting two down in front of Duane and me, before claiming a seat across from us. Thank you, Bo. You're welcome, Jess. Cletus takes a trip to Texas twice a year to spear hunt wild boars, and so once a month he feeds us wild boar sausage. Duane continued, Spear hunt? I knew my eyes were bulging out of my head. Wild boar? Aren't those things huge? Let's just say they make a lot of bacon and sausage. Cletus indicated to the plate of sausage again, then pointed at the smoking coals in the grill with a long grilling fork. I can't believe you spear hunt. Isn't that terribly dangerous? He shrugged. Well, now, I don't think it's respectful to shoot a boar from the comfort of a hiding place and while wielding a firearm. That's not a fair fight. Nowadays, I feel like people are too far from the food they eat. How many people do you know who would eat a steak if they had to slit its throat, electrocute it, and watch all the blood drain out? Oh, Cletus, really? Bo made a face. I was hungry before you started bringing up slaughterhouses. My point is, if I'm going to kill a wild animal, I don't see why I should make things easy on myself. He does it with a bunch of Native Americans, fellas. Good guys. They all get together and run around the forest in loincloths. Dwayne supplied before tipping his beer back and taking a long pull. I watched with fascination how his lips wrapped around the bottle, how his throat worked as he swallowed. By the time he took it from his mouth and caught an errant drop with the tip of his tongue, I felt a little dazed. As well, I'd completely forgotten what we were discussing. When he finished, he glanced back at me, but then his brow furrowed in question, likely at my dreamy expression. Hey, Jess, you okay? I nodded, sighed, and wished he'd been licking an errant drop of something off me. Yeah, I'm fine. You look a little hot. This came from Bo, and I found him watching us, mischief behind his eyes. So I frowned at him in his teasing. He mimicked my frown, though not quite successfully, because his mouth curved into an impish smile immediately after. Maybe Dwayne should show you around the house. Might help you cool off. Sitting so close to my sausage likely has you overheated and excited, Cletus mumbled as he indicated to the grill with his chin. As I was saying, Dwayne's tone held a note of exasperation as he swept Bo and Cletus a hard look before turning his attention back to me. Billy cooks Mondays, Bo is Tuesdays, then Cletus on Wednesday, me on Thursday, and Jethro on Friday. We have a schedule, Cletus volunteered. We like our schedules. They keep things orderly. So who's filling in for Jethro on Friday? He left casseroles, lots of them, in the deep freezer. Billy answered in a flat tone. Hey, you could make us dinner on Friday, if you want, Bo suggested. Dwayne shook his head before I could answer. No, Jess and I will make dinner together tomorrow, on my night. That's cheating, Billy protested. There's no rules. And are you really going to turn down Jess's meatloaf? Billy didn't respond to Dwayne's question verbally, but instead allowed his icicle eyes and disapproving silence to answer for him. Can you come back tomorrow? Dwayne turned me in his arms slightly, his voice low and gentle. Yeah, I can come tomorrow. No problem. Do you mind if I leave everything here tonight? Dwayne shrugged. We have plenty of space in the fridge now Cletus has removed his sausage. Okay, I nodded, leaned forward, picked up my pie again and made to stand. Well, then, I guess I'll go. A chorus of no and what? Where are you going? And put that pie down and other protests kept me from going back to the front porch to collect my things. You should stay. Billy gave me a half-smile that was completely unexpected, as were his words. 
Stay and have dinner with us. Your company would be a welcome change. Yes, stay. Even if you're a big eater, there's plenty of my sausage for you. Cletus! His name was exclaimed in a unified shout by the other three brothers, each shooting him their own unique version of a dirty look. Well, I glanced at the pie in my hands, biting my lips so I wouldn't laugh, and turned my attention to Duane. I guess everything will keep until tomorrow. Oh no, we'll eat that pie tonight. You make a new one for tomorrow to go along with your meatloaf. Cletus nodded like this was already decided. If you're taking requests, I'd really like another apple pie. Bo gave me a wink from across the table. She is not taking any pie requests from you, Dwayne barked at Bo. Fine, fine, no need to get your britches twisted. It's not as though I was offering her my sausage like some people. I'm just saying, since she has to make a new pie irregardless, she might as well make another apple pie. Billy lifted his beard toward Bo, his tone completely condescending as he remarked, I feel I must tell you, Bo, that there is no such word as irregardless. It's just regardless. Stop correcting Bo's terrible grammar and go get the bigger bag of charcoal. Cletus kicked Billy's chair. These flames aren't adequate to cook my sausage. I was fighting another grin when Duane leaned close, removed the pie from my hands, and set it back on the table. He slid his hand back around my waist, sending lovely tendrils of warmth through my body. Ignore them, he whispered, his hot breath on my neck making me shiver. They're just trying to get you to make more pie. I don't mind, I whispered back. The crust recipe made enough for two, so it's just a matter of making the filling. Go show Jessica around. Bo flicked his wrist toward us, waving us off while giving me a conspiratorial look. She hadn't been here in years. Go show her the upstairs. The upstairs? Dwayne made a face. There's nothing upstairs except the bedrooms. He means go spend some time being physically intimate with your pretty girlfriend until dinner is ready. Cletus supplied, not sparing us a glance. He was frowning at his coals. We'll make a ruckus and call you down when it's time to eat. Dwayne scowled at Bo. Bo shrugged. The arch of his eyebrows and his pleased smirk were positively devilish. We'll go inside and unpack the groceries for tomorrow, Dwayne said pointedly and continued to glare at Bo. You do that. You go unpack those groceries. His twin nodded, still looking unrepentant. You unpack those groceries so hard. Before Duane could lean over the table and assault his twin, I added with my biggest, cheekiest smile, Then we'll go upstairs and be physically intimate until dinner is ready. I heard Billy choke on his laugh. Bo guffawed. Duane glanced at me, his eyebrows half suspended between wonder and disapproval. I winked at him. That all sounds just dandy. Cletus agreed, his tone level, as though I'd just said Duane and I were going inside to wash the floors. Then he added, But work up an appetite, woman, because you've never tasted fine meat until you've eaten my sausage. Cletus! We did unpack the groceries, but other than a few quick kisses in the kitchen, we weren't physically intimate, and Duane didn't take me upstairs. I didn't mind. I wanted to talk to him, make sure we were okay. Thankfully, things between us were easy and fun, leaving me feeling silly that I'd planned my elaborate dinner ambush. Looking over the last few days of minimal contact, I realized I'd overreacted. I could have stopped in at the auto shop or called him after work. I decided he hadn't been avoiding me. I'd inflated the meaning of his lack of contact in my head. After unpacking the groceries, he walked me to the woods surrounding their house, and we used familiar trails to navigate the forest. This path leads to the creek, he said, holding my hand in his and helping me over a felled log with unnecessary but not unwelcome solicitousness. The one that feeds the lake? Yep. I grinned. I haven't been out there in, goodness, in years. You want to go? 
I vehemently shook my head. No, you'll just push me in. He grinned briefly in response, the short smile quickly waning into a frown. Ashley spent a good amount of time on these trails while she was here. Every now and then, when she wasn't holed up inside the house, taking care of Mama, one of us would walk down with her to the creek. I glanced at Duane. Sawy's mood had turned introspective. Do you miss your sister? He nodded, frowning at the path. Of course. I missed her when she left the first time, and I miss her now she's gone again. I stepped closer to him and squeezed his hand, giving his side a quick hug. I bet she misses you, too. He nodded once, then turned his face away as though searching the trees to make sure we were on the right trail. Then, out of the blue, he asked, Do you really need more than three restaurants? I faltered a half step, but then quickly recovered. What do you mean? I mean, Daisy's place serves great breakfast and pie. The front porch makes a first-class prime rib. I don't see why you need more restaurants. I realized he was making a reference to our conversation on Saturday, when I'd stated that Green Valley only had three restaurants. It's not about the number of restaurants. I know. He frowned, shook his head. I guess I don't see what's out there that's so much better than what's here. Is Green Valley so boring that all you can think about is escape? As I studied him, I realized his question didn't necessarily denote a change in subject. His sister Ashley had left home when she was 18 and hadn't returned until just recently. And then she'd stayed only long enough to take care of their dying mother during the last six weeks of her life. Ashley had left again on the day of the funeral, left Green Valley and her six brothers for her life in Chicago. There's nothing bad about Green Valley. But nothing great, either. Nothing worth sticking around for. Duane pulled us to a stop. His eyes pierced me, and his gaze felt almost physical, like a beseeching touch. I knew he wasn't trying to make me feel bad about my dreams. He was trying to understand both my motivations and perhaps the reason why his sister had left so many years ago and kept leaving. But I didn't see Ashley's desire to leave Green Valley as anything resembling my desire to see the world. I sighed, my eyes skittering away so I could gather my thoughts. I didn't know how to explain my longing to wander and how it had nothing to do with my hometown. If I'd been born in New York City or London or Paris, I would still want to leave. I wanted to explore and experience and know. Have you ever heard of the German words wanderlust or fernweh? You used wanderlust on our first date. And I read a book some years ago about hiking, and the title had the word wanderlust in it. It was about people who loved to hike and cataloged some of the great hiking trails around the world. Wanderlust in German basically means to love hiking, but it's been repurposed by English speakers to mean a love of wandering. I remember the first time I heard the word Fahrenheit. In German, it means far sickness. It's like some people have homesickness, and that's considered normal, acceptable. Missing one's family and friends, what's familiar. I think everyone can understand longing for home. But I realized that the strange anxiousness I've always felt to be elsewhere was called Fahrenheit. I have Fahrenheit. How most people long for the familiar, I've always longed for the unknown. Heck, if I could manage it, I'd love to see Mars. I love to explore. And I don't think it's an easy concept to explain or for people who don't have the same desire to grasp. Duane frowned and nodded, his eyes moving away from mine. He was lost in thoughtful contemplation, but I could see he didn't really understand. Usually I accepted my friends and family's lack of comprehension, wrote it off as me just being too nutty, too much of a circle surrounded by squares. But for some reason I felt a swelling, desperate need for Duane to understand. Therefore I grabbed his other hand and tugged on it until he was looking at me again. This desire to explore has nothing to do with where I am. It has everything to do with where I'm not. So it's about newness, being in a new place. 
I shook my head, carefully entwining our fingers. I found I needed to touch more of him. I needed the connection. No, not really. It's like, here we are. I glanced around the brilliance surrounding us, fading colors of autumn on the smoky mountain path, dusty blue sky overhead giving way to nightfall. Someplace awesome and spectacular. But can you imagine? If you had the chance to see a thousand places that were equally spectacular? I want to see the Colosseum in Rome and St. Peter's. But I don't want to go on a tour during vacation. I want to live there, know the city, learn the people, eat the food. I want to sketch Michelangelo's paintings, even though I'm no artist. Then, after a time, maybe a year or more, I want to see the Yangtze River, see the Great Wall of China. And after that, the Redwood Forest. And after that, go diving in Fiji or maybe visit castles in Ireland. I glanced at him and saw he was watching me openly. Duane's frown had been replaced with not quite a smile, and his eyes held appreciation. However, it was the perceivable glimmer of understanding there that sent my pulse racing. I think I'm starting to get it. You're more than curious about the world, and I see it calls to you. His quiet voice was laced with empathy, and I saw he truly did get it. I didn't temper my heavy sigh of relief or my immediate grin or attempt to hide my pleasure. This pleasure was quickly followed by a sudden and deep sense of gratitude. I tried to explain this desire to my family and friends on more than one occasion. Invariably, my parents would always ask, but what about a house and a nice car and nice clothes and a TV and a familiar bed? They couldn't fathom that I wanted to live my life with experiences, not things. I had their core values, but in so many ways we were completely different. They'd never understood my dramatic, wild side. Consequently, I'd spent my childhood trying to suppress or ignore it, but it was no use. I craved freedom. They craved structure. I didn't know why my dreams and goals were so different from my family's. They just were. Until this moment, I hadn't realized how lonely I'd been having no one to share my dreams with and no one to understand? It was Duane's understanding that pushed me over the edge. I stared into his brilliant eyes and knew with absolute certainty I was in love with Duane Winston. And it didn't feel like a burden or a weight or something holding me down. Loving him made me feel paradoxically phenomenal and reckless and safe and strong and capable because Duane was all of those things. My big smile was beginning to hurt, but I didn't mind. I wanted to hold on to this moment for as long as possible because it was the first time and maybe the only time in my life I felt truly seen, known, and understood and I wanted to give him everything in return. I wanted him to know I saw him. I knew him, too. Duane's almost smile turned wry, and his eyes narrowed. You looking at me like that almost makes me feel ten feet tall. Aren't you? He laughed. I laughed. We laughed together. Duane tugged me forward and captured my lips for a quick kiss, sending a thrill of warmth to my toes, then whispered against my mouth, I guess I am when I'm with you. You say sweet things. Do I? Yes. Like when you said I was a siren who doesn't need to sing. I imagined my expression mimicked the dazed and floaty feeling of my heart. That was a sweet thing to say, even though it implied I sought your destruction by tempting you with my body. He shook his head, leaning away, one of his reluctant smiles teasing over his lips. Duane released me and pushed his fingers into my hair, his strong hands moving against my scalp and down to my neck. That's not what I meant when I said it. Then what did you mean? Have you read the Odyssey? No. Have you? Yes. It was required reading in my house. Remember, we didn't have a TV growing up. All we had were books and our imagination. 
Lord help us all, the Winston boys, left to their collective imaginations. I teased lightly, enjoying my view because Dwayne was my view. How much do you know about the story? His eyes studied me and he cocked his head to the side. Do you know the basics? Of the Odyssey? It was about Odysseus's travels, his journey home. What about the sirens in the Odyssey? I know a bit. I know the sirens are beautiful. Their beauty and their song inspire lust in Odysseus's men and tempt the sailors to crash their ship against the rocks, more or less. No, that's not what happens. It's not lust they inspire that drives sailors toward their own destruction. I squinted at him. Then what do the sailors feel? The sirens are beautiful, yes, but their song and their beauty call to the soul, not to the body. The sirens don't inspire lust. They inspire longing, a deep, wrenching longing, bone deep so the sailors would rather die than live without the siren. I stared at him as he stared at me. I could tell he was waiting for me to catch on to his meaning. It didn't take me very long because he voluntarily filled in the blanks. Your wanderlust, or farfignugan, or whatever, that's your siren song. He tilted his head to one side, then the other, as though studying me from different angles before adding, I get that. Again, my heart bloomed, and I wanted to give him a similar gift. So I asked, and yours is going fast. Is speed your siren's call? He shook his head, and his smile fell away even as he continued to study my face with his trademark intensity and focus. No, Jessica, he whispered, gaining a step forward and pulling me into his arms. Then what is? I lifted my chin. He didn't answer. Instead, he kissed me. Dinner was great. Cletus's sausages were delicious, and the boys ate all of my apple pie. But I was extremely cognizant of my 5.30 a.m. Friday morning alarm, so I had to leave much earlier than I would have liked. Dwayne asked Billy if we could use the truck, and when it was time for me to go, Billy, Cletus, and Bo stood on the front lawn and waved goodbye. It was actually really sweet, and a thought occurred to me as we pulled onto the main road, the Winston boys still visible in the truck's rearview mirror. These boys needed a woman at the house. They missed their mama, and they likely missed their sister. I decided I would make a habit of cooking with Duane every Thursday night. Also, it wasn't right that all five of Duane's brothers were single. Goodness, they were a handsome and sweet bunch. Their collective singleton lifestyle was a crime against women everywhere. I further decided I would take it upon myself to find each of them suitable girlfriends over the next year. What are you plotting over there? I glanced at Duane in the driver's seat. We were paused at a stop sign. He was studying me with knowing eyes. I shrugged and tried to suppress my guilty smile. Nothing much. That's a lie. Your plan is something. Duane pulled through the intersection and I lamented the fact that our houses were so close. I just thought it would be nice for me to help you cook on Thursdays. I turned in my seat and rested my elbow along the back of the truck's bench seat so I could stare at his profile. Mm-hmm, he said, like he didn't believe me. And what do you mean by that, mm-hmm, Dwayne Winston? I can see the gears turning. You forget I know your face by heart. You're scheming. I laughed, loving everything he just said. You know my face by heart. Don't change the subject. Dwayne made an unexpected ride onto a dirt and gravel road just a half mile from his house. It appeared to be one of the unmaintained roads used by park rangers and hunters. Where are we going? I want to show you something. It's why I borrowed the truck. Don't worry, this won't take long. I know you had to get up for work early in the morning. Can you give me a hint? We were swallowed up by trees and pitch black night on all sides. Sure. In fact, I just tell you... It's a hunting cabin. Billy and I built it four summers ago. No one else knows about it. Not even Bo? 
Dwayne shook his head. Nope, not even Bo. Billy, well, Billy suggested I keep it a secret. Why? Probably because Billy and I aren't as social as Bo or Jethro or even Roscoe. We both used to have a habit of losing our tempers when kept in close quarters at home. Cletus goes on long trips, boar hunting and whatnot, but Billy and I aren't in that habit. He suggested we use it as a place to lay low, cool off. Why don't you stay there all the time? It doesn't have electricity, and it's small. It's got an outhouse and an outside well, but not plumbing. I studied as much of Duane's profile as I could, given the lack of light. But you're showing me now? He nodded once. That's right. Is this national park land, or are we still on your family's property? My family's property. Basically, you and Billy share it. More or less. He doesn't use it much since he works all the time. Our house, the big house, is really just a place for him to store his stuff and sleep. So this cabin, it's like your fortress of solitude. He shrugged, his eyes flickering to mine. I like to think of it that way. A slow, burning thrill gradually warmed my belly as my overactive imagination ran away, stripped naked doing wild cartwheels and made salacious plans. This place meant privacy. Time we could spend together, just the two of us, sharing hopes and dreams. Maybe this place would be where I admitted how much I felt for him, how I loved him. Maybe we'd use it to make plans for our future beyond the next thirteen months. He pulled the truck off the gravel road and took a path I would have never noticed. After another few minutes, the truck's headlights illuminated a rough-hewn stone staircase leading to a dark wooden cabin. I didn't wait for Duane to open my door. Instead, I jumped out of the truck as soon as he stopped, but before he'd engaged the emergency brake— he left the headlights on, and they were the only source of light. Duane called after me. Slow down, Jess. Those steps aren't as solid as they look. I forced myself to pick my way more carefully, which allowed Duane to catch up and place a protective hand at my back. When we reached the door, I tried it and found it locked. I have keys, he said gruffly, unlocking the door and stopping me from bolting forward by gripping my upper arm. He waited until I was looking up at him before pressing the keys into my palm. Here, these are for you. For me? I grinned. I couldn't help it. He laughed lightly and shook his head, walking past me into the cabin and disappearing into the inky darkness. I hesitated at the door, listened to the sound of his boots scuffling on the floor, then the strike of a match. Pale illumination filled the small space as he lit a candle. I stepped in and closed the door behind me as Duane walked around the rectangular space, lighting wax candles as he went. It was small, really small, maybe 200 square feet. The walls were finished, which was surprising, but were painted plain white and held no photos or paintings. A stone, wood-burning fireplace took up most of one wall— a small table with two chairs took up another, and a queen-sized bed ran along the third. Are you cold? No, I said on a sigh, imagining us spending countless days and nights here, enjoying each other's company, sharing more of ourselves. Finally, I lifted my eyes and met Duane's schooled expression. He was studying me, my reaction to this place. Despite the careful coolness of his features, I could read his thoughts as clearly as though he'd spoken. He wanted to know if this place would do. If I would consent to him taking liberties with my body in this cozy cabin. He was so silly. So I said, Duane, you are so silly. I'm silly? He lifted an eyebrow and crossed his arms over his broad chest. Yes. See, now, this place is great, but I'd just like to point out that if you've been waiting for a room and a bed for us to start doing mattress cartwheels, then I think you're being silly. Do you think I need candles and romance? I waved a hand around the cabin. The place was small, but it was undeniably romantic. 
Add a fire in the fireplace, a bottle of wine, and naked cartwheels on the bed. It was basically a rustic den of seduction. Regardless, I continued my tirade. Baby, I do not need those things. You need to realize I don't want to be put on a pedestal. I don't want you to keep a respectful distance. I just need you. I like you wild and I love you reckless. Outside on a picnic blanket, inside the cabier roadrunner, on the bed in this here cabin, where we come together makes no difference to me. It's you I want. Each word was true. I didn't want or need romantic gestures or pretty things. I just wanted him. I was in love with him and nothing else mattered to me, not the where and not the when. As I spoke, I saw the corner of his mouth lift of its own accord, his gaze grow warmer. When I finished, he studied me for a long moment, his scorching stare skating up and down my body in a protracted perusal. Good Lord, I was getting hot. Fleetingly, I hoped he would take my words to heart and just take me now, fast and hard against the wall. The thought made my knees weak. But then he crossed to where I stood with slow, measured steps, and he didn't stop coming until he'd backed me up against the door. He placed one hand on the frame behind me and the other possessively on my hip. His eyes glittered and smoldered. He gazed specifically at my mouth as he said in a rumbly whisper, Jessica, I've been thinking about making love to you for a real long time, and I won't settle for our first encounter being rushed on a blanket outside in a car before dinner in my bedroom at home. I plan on taking my time with you. He leaned forward and to the side, the friction of his beard against my jaw and the hot breath dancing beneath my ear, making me shiver again. His fingers on my hips slipped under my shirt, his thumb rubbing a slow circle on the skin just above the waistline of my jeans. Dwayne, I whimpered, my hands grabbing fistfuls of his sweater. We don't need to wait, but we do, Jess because I plan on taking your time as well. He licked my earlobe, nibbled it, and I trembled. A whole night and a whole day. Please. My grip tightened and I yanked him toward me, needing his weight and warmth. But instead he leaned away. This time his eyes connected with mine and they were fiercely sober and stern as he said, You're already on that pedestal, princess and I respect the hell out of you, whether you like it or not. Like Saturday and Sunday, when Duane dropped me off, he walked to my door and gave me a very respectful kiss. But this time, he left me with a big grin. I wanted to call after him and say, I'm in love with you, Duane Winston. Instead, I let him go. Though I felt warm and tingly, certain of having good dreams, the anticipation of admitting my feelings was going to kill me dead in the best possible way. I floated into my parents' house, not quite finished with my happy sigh, when I heard my daddy call to me from the family room. Jessica, is that you? Yes, it's me. Can you come in here? I hung up my purse, kicked off my boots, and strolled, still ensconced in my happiness days, into the family room. My daddy was standing in the center of the room when I entered, his hands in his pockets and his expression grim. I felt my smile fall. What's wrong? He sighed, looking resigned, and said, There's no easy way to break the news, so I'll just tell you outright. Your mama called this evening. Aunt Louisa died this afternoon around five. She took a turn yesterday and didn't wake up. My good mood deflated like a violently popped balloon. I covered my mouth with my hand. Oh, no. Oh, goodness, but she was just... I thought she was getting better. He shook his head. My eyes lost focus as I thought about Aunt Louisa, my mother's younger sister, still so young at 42. Even though she'd always kept me at an arm's length, even though we'd never formed a real bond during our summers together, I still loved her. 
She was family. I can't believe she's gone, I whispered, without knowing I was speaking my thoughts. My father crossed the room, pulled me into a hug, then led me to the couch. Once there, he tucked me under his arm and let me cry a bit through my confusion. When I was mostly finished, she handed me a box of tissues and patted my hand. I've already purchased our plane tickets and called Kip Sylvester at the school to explain things. We'll leave tomorrow morning. Your mom will need your help. I nodded numbly. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. My daddy stirred a bit in his seat, then leaned away. I sensed his eyes on me, so I lifted my gaze. After a long moment, he said, This might be unseemly to discuss before your aunt is laid to rest, but I think I need to warn you about something before we get to Texas. Warn me? About what? I watched as my daddy gathered a deep breath, then released it slowly. His words were halting as he said, The thing is, Jessica, your Aunt Louisa, she was your... Well, she was very wealthy, and you spent a lot of time with her, more than anyone else. I think you need to prepare yourself for a significant inheritance. A what? If possible, my father looked even more mournful as he explained. Your mama's seen the will. Baby girl, I don't know how else to break this to you, but Louisa left you everything. She left you the house, her engineering patents, the farm, and all her money. We're talking several million dollars. Chapter 18 I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Herman Melville Dwayne We were cutting it close. After dropping off Jess, I drove back to the house and jumped into Bo's car. He'd been waiting for me, sitting in the dark inside his red 1967 Pontiac GTO, drumming his fingers on the steering wheel. He didn't say anything. He didn't need to. I knew we were running late. If we were lucky, we'd arrive at the meeting spot just on time. Jessica James was distracting. She'd been occupying my thoughts with more and more frequency. And now I was making new plans. These plans only served to increase my level of distraction. Showing Jess the cabin hadn't been premeditated, but when I realized I would need to borrow Billy's truck in order to take her home, I'd exploited the opportunity. Smart move taking Billy's truck. My twin checked his rearview mirror as we pulled onto Moth Run, the paved road adjacent to our property. The Wraiths knows not to come within ten feet of Billy. No way in hell they'd follow his truck. I nodded because it had been a smart move. I didn't share that avoiding the Wraiths hadn't been my only reason for taking the truck but avoiding the wraiths was the reason I hadn't given the Mustang back to Jessica yet. Both Bo and I were quickly proven right about taking Billy's truck when four motorcycles separated from the darkness and easily caught up with Bo's Pontiac. These guys are so stupid. Bo's face was twisted with irritation and impatience, an unusual expression for him. What do they think we're trying to do? Try to leave town undetected in my red GTO? Everyone knows this is my car. What a bunch of morons. Before I could add a layer of colorful trash talk, my cell rang. Who is it? Bo's eyes flickered between me and the road. I don't know. I don't recognize the number. Bo glanced at the screen, then back out the windshield. It might be Repo. He uses burners. Burners, of course, being disposable cell phones thrown away before they can be traced. Figuring Bo was probably right, I swapped my thumb across the screen and answered. What? You're finally leaving the house. Repo's raspy voice emerged from the other end. Yeah? So? So? You're late. Not yet. Repo chuckled. I guess you still have a few minutes. While I have you, why don't you tell me what Claire McClure was doing at your house earlier? I frowned and answered automatically and truthfully. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see Claire at the house. Our boys saw her pull into your drive around five this evening and then leave a few minutes later. You know her daddy is my president, right? I don't think he'd like one of you Winston boys messing with his daughter. Like I said, I didn't know she was there. 
what and who my brothers do is none of my business, and it ain't yours either. And why are your recruits watching our house? I knew I was being followed, but I didn't know the rates were watching the house. And I wasn't going to volunteer that Claire must have been the one to drop off Jessica. Given the facts that the rates set our driveway under surveillance, I was relieved that Jess hadn't driven over on her own. If she'd borrowed her daddy's car, I was certain I would now be getting shit from Repo about my relationship with the sheriff's daughter. Again. I'd been avoiding her for the last few days for this very reason, hoping they'd stop shadowing me after tonight's meeting. Instead of answering my question, Repo lowered his voice and said, None of your brothers better be doing anything with Claire. That girl is the property of the Wraiths. My instinct was to argue, point out that Claire McClure hated them almost as much as we did, and would raise hell if she heard anyone say she was property. Instead, I fought my urge to throw the phone out the window or smash it against the dashboard. I have to talk to your ugly face in ten minutes, so I'm hanging up now. And I did. Bo smirked at me. I fucking hate that guy. Nothing to like. I agreed. My flat tone still tempted to beat the shit out of my phone. Something needed to be smashed. Tina returned any of your calls yet? I shook my head, deciding to place the phone in the glove box out of my reach. No, just text messages telling me to bring you to the pink pony. You? Nope, I figure she wants us to go to the club and have a chat in person. I glanced out the side mirror at the four motorcycle headlights and flexed my jaw. I think so too. We'll have to pay a visit. Tomorrow night, you think? Or Friday? I shrugged. Either would work. Since Tina wouldn't return my messages with anything other than invitations to watch her dance, I'd called Hank Weller, the owner of the Pink Pony, and asked for Tina's schedule. She was no longer stripping Sunday through Thursday, only on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Hank also volunteered that she'd been spending more and more time at the Dragon Biker Bar, entertaining the Wraiths. At this point, I wasn't convinced she'd help us at all. Her loyalty might rest firmly with the bikers, what little loyalty she had. Still, it was worth a shot to feel her out, see if she'd be willing. You ready to do this? To anyone else, Bo would probably sound like his normal, good-humored self. To me, his levity sounded fake, forced, a cover for anger and determination. I'm ready. I wasn't nervous or afraid. These morons didn't scare me. They pissed me off, and I was ready for this annoying game to be over. As soon as we pulled up to the meeting spot, an abandoned barn about three miles from the Dragon Biker Bar, bikers swarmed our car and escorted us inside. Repo was sitting calmly by the door. Dirty Dave was pacing the dirt floor. In total, there were ten of them and two of us. I sized each one of them up with detachment and decided, if all six of us Winston boys had been present, we'd likely be evenly matched. You ain't stupid, but you're reckless, which can be difficult to tell apart, especially when the end result is the same. Repo greeted me with these words, not standing as we entered. His expression was outwardly friendly, but I could see simmering anger behind his black eyes. He didn't like that I'd hung up on him and I couldn't bring myself to care. Let's get this over with, I mumbled, rolling my eyes. Now hold on, Dwayne. Bo gave both me and Repo a valiantly convincing smile. I haven't seen Uncle Repo in a while. My response to these staged words were authentic. I tried not to gag. How Bo could say such shit with a straight face, and believably, was a miracle. Most of the fury behind Repo's expression eased, and he stood to shake Bo's hand. I crossed my arms over my chest. No fucking way was I shaking hands with these douche canoes. Luckily, my honest reaction was also the part I'd been assigned. I was bad cop. Bo was good cop. Thus, I stood passively as Bo and Repo exchanged pleasantries, noticing that the other nine bikers appeared to take their cues from Repo. They all visibly relaxed when they saw how friendly Bo and Repo were. Even Dirty Dave smiled at Bo, shaking his hand, calling him son instead of boy. My twin had this effect on people because he was so gifted at being insincere. I was convinced he could bullshit his way out of a federal prison if the need ever arose. He'd inherited our father's gift of artless charm. Jethro, my oldest brother, had similar abilities. 
Roscoe, the youngest, was a close third. Cletus, Ashley, and I possessed my mother's temperament, too candid for our own good. And Billy turned his charm on and off like a switch. He used it when it served his purposes, but I could tell he hated every minute of it. But unlike our father and despite their charisma, my siblings were good people, worthy of my respect and trust. Well, actually, Jethro was questionable at times. Regardless, I'd do just about anything for all of them. Eventually, I grew tired of watching Bo make everyone laugh. Are we going to get down to business anytime soon? The laughter tapered and Repo's eyes slithered back to me, though he now appeared to be in a much better mood. Sure thing, Dwayne. You boys ready to discuss terms of the partnership? I think you'll find our offer of a 30-70 split more than fair. Depends on who gets the 30% and who gets the 70%, Bo quipped, making Dirty Dave chuckle like a bashful schoolgirl. Now hold on. I shook my head and stepped forward. We haven't agreed to anything. Then what are we doing here, boy? Dirty Dave lifted his fat finger like he was going to wave it in my face, but something in my expression must have given him pause because he settled for sticking out his chin and barrel chest. Like I said, we haven't agreed to anything. You're trying my patience, Dwayne, Repo said, sounding more tired than angry. Bo cut in. What Dwayne means is we can't agree to something we're not sure we can deliver. Repo narrowed his eyes with confusion, not suspicion and glanced between the two of us. What does that mean? It means we can't use our shop for this operation. Its location is too public, and I don't think anyone here wants us to get caught before we get started. Bo's words were entirely reasonable. Repo nodded. Okay, fair point. I'm listening. I spoke next because the plan was for me to break the bad news in a completely irritating way, while Bo re-explained it, making it sound more palatable. So we're not going to do it, I stated, maybe with more belligerence than was called for. What Dwayne means, Bo glanced at me like he was exasperated with my attitude, is that we can't do it, not until a suitable location is found. Dirty Dave shrugged and said just as we thought he would. That's easy. Use brick and mortar shop. Can't. I shook my head stubbornly. First of all, it's associated with the wraiths. Secondly, I overheard Jackson James mention their office is working on a warrant for that place. Repo's eyes narrowed further. You overheard? Yep. Why do you think I've been so friendly with his sister? I hoped Repo would believe this explanation for many reasons, not the least of which was that if he did, then I'd be able to go about my business with Jess and not have to suffer through Repo's reprimands and disapproval. But more than that, I hope this version of my motivations would keep Jessica safe. I needed her safe and far away from this mess. Thus, I was surprised by Repo's answering thunderous expression and raised voice. You're using that girl, boy? You hurt her, I will break you in two. Bo stepped between us. Now, come on, Repo. You've known us since we were babies. You know Dwayne. Do you think Dwayne would be able to run a con on someone as clever as Jessica James? I should have been insulted by Bo's insinuation that Jessica was my superior in intelligence, but I wasn't. This was because he was likely right. Jess was smart, but I wasn't intimidated by her intellect. Likely because, when paired with her sweetness, it turned me on so much. Bo continued. All he's saying is that he's taking advantage of a rare opportunity. Access to the James household. That's not using Miss James. That's being resourceful to all of our benefit. Repo didn't look entirely convinced, and I was busy trying to figure out why he felt so invested in Jessica's well-being. I thought about his comment last Saturday at Daisy's and wondered just how well Repo knew Jessica's mama. Bo pushed the conversation back on track. So, that's where we are. We've been busy over the last two weeks. If your fine brothers here have been keeping tabs on us, they've probably told you how Dwayne and I have been scouting locations. Repo glanced at Dirty Dave. Dave gave him a short nod. Repo frowned and exhaled loudly, searching the floor as he considered the matter. Finally, he said, You should have contacted us. We have properties everywhere. One of them is bound to suit. I shook my head. 
No way. Like I said, we're not doing this using one of your properties. Why the hell not? Dirty Dave lifted his chin again. Because nothing could be more obvious, old man. Suddenly, you have two Winston brothers, auto mechanics, making frequent visits to one of your warehouses right after brick and mortar are put away. That's just stupid. Luckily, Bo didn't have to interpret because Repo nodded thoughtfully at my tirade. He's right. Better these boys find the space themselves, outfit it. The less evidence of a partnership between us, the better. Bringing brick and mortar into the wraiths was a mistake. It made things difficult over the years. Trying to get things done without police always doing random searches. No one else noticed, but I saw Bo's shoulders relax at Repo's words. His smile came a bit easier. I was still outwardly scowling, but took Repo's agreement as a victory. Jethro was due to return in two weeks. If we could hold the rates off for another two weeks, then maybe Jethro could help us sort this mess out without getting our hands dirty. Or maybe Tina could be convinced to wipe their files and bring us a copy. Either way, this was the stay of execution we needed. All right, looks like we have a plan. Bo rubbed his hands together, nodding at Dirty Dave, then at me. Yeah, Repo scrutinized Bo. But this search can't go on forever. You two need to find a place this week. Bo chuckled, like this demand was made as a good-natured joke. This week? Repo, we're coming up against Thanksgiving. Ain't no one gonna meet with us about property this week. We need at least until January 1st. If no one will meet with you before Thanksgiving, then ain't no one gonna talk to you around Christmas neither. You have until the second week of December, and that's it. I shook my head, but grumbled. Fine. Second week of December. Luckily, I was much better at pretending to be irritated than I was at pretending to be nice. Chapter 19 Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, with the possible exception of bad news, which obeys its own special laws. Douglas Adams, mostly harmless. Dwayne Jessica You're probably still asleep and didn't want to wake you. On my way to Texas for a funeral. My aunt died yesterday. Jessica Tell your brothers I'm sorry about dinner. Jessica I'll call you later today. I need to talk to you. Jessica. I miss you. I didn't see Jessica's text messages or her three missed calls until Thursday afternoon, not until Bo and I were on our way home from the shop, because I'd left my cell in Bo's glove compartment all day. When I did see him, I spent the next several minutes using every curse word in my arsenal as I listened to her voicemails. What the hell happened? Bo eyeballed me from the driver's seat. Hush, I'm trying to listen. I waved him off, restarting Jessica's first message. Hey, Dwayne, it's Jess. We just landed in Houston. I wanted to talk to you before we left the airport because the reception out at the farm can be spotty. It'll take us about an hour and a half to drive out there. Call me when you get this. She hesitated, her voice cracking a little when she added before clicking off. I really miss you. The second message was short. Hey, it's me. We're on the road now. Call when you can. And my heart was in my throat as I listened to the third message. Hi, we're at the farm now. This number is the direct line to the house. If you call, one of the staff will answer, and I left instructions that they should come get me if you do. So, call me? Did I mention I miss you? Bye. I immediately hit redial, praying she'd be available to talk. As she warned, one of the staff picked up and placed me on hold apparently searching the house for her. I could feel Bo's split attention between me and the mountain road, and he finally asked, Is that Jessica? What happened? Is she okay? Shh. I didn't want him distracting me. With each passing second, I grew more agitated, with the weight and with myself for leaving the phone in Bo's car. But relief flooded my chest when I finally heard her voice. Hello? Jessica, it's me. It's Dwayne. I'm so sorry I didn't get your messages. My phone was in Bo's glove compartment, and you know what? It doesn't matter. How are you? Are you okay? Do you need me to fly out? I can leave today. This was a thoughtless promise, and I knew Bo was looking at me like I was crazy. But I didn't care. If she needed me, I would fly out. 
The wraiths and their threats could go to hell. Then they could go fuck themselves and go to hell again. She sighed softly, but when she answered, her tone was low and stiff, like she was trying to keep from being overheard. Thanks for calling. I, I'm glad you called. I paused for a second, then asked, I'm guessing you're with people? That's right. I guessed she was hoping I'd lead the conversation, do most of the talking, since she was being listened to on her end. Can you call me tonight? Nine. My time. Yes. Her loud and enthusiastic response made me smile despite the situation. I mean, yes. I can do that. Good. You call me at nine. I'll keep my phone on me. Okay. I heard her struggle like she wanted to say more, something in particular. Instead, she sounded resigned as she said, Talk to you later. I guessed what she wanted, so I said it. I miss you, Jessica James. Me too, she said immediately, like she was anxious I wouldn't say the words, but relieved I had. I mean it, I miss you. You're too far away. If you need me to fly out, I can get on a plane tonight. Don't do that. Things are, well, anyway. I heard her take a deep breath and say, Okay, sounds good. Talk to you later. I hesitated, wondering if I should just go. In the end, I decided I'd be talking to her that night and could reassess the situation, then fly out Friday if needed. Eventually, I said, Okay, okay, we'll talk tonight. Yes, we will. Bye. Bye. I set the phone on my lap, staring at the screen for a long minute before adding the Houston number to my contacts. Bo exhaled loudly next to me. You mind telling me what's going on? Jess's aunt died. She's in Houston. Can't make dinner tonight. That's terrible. I nodded absentmindedly, saving the number. So, no pie? I glared at my brother. No, no pie for you, Buford Fitzgerald. No need for that tone, Dwayne Faulkner. I was just double-checking. When I continued to glare, he added, the woman makes a good pie. You can't blame me for wanting more of it. You'll get her pie only if and when I say it's appropriate. He grumbled something under his breath I didn't catch. I ignored him in favor of glancing out the window, and I saw the flashing police lights behind us through the side mirror just before the siren gave a yelp, making Bo jump in his seat. God in heaven! Bo obviously startled, frowned, and squinted at his rearview mirror. What the hell? Is that Jack? I nodded, grinding my teeth. Jessica's brother Jackson was pulling us over, and the hairs on the back of my neck abruptly itched. Something about the situation didn't feel right, almost like it was an ambush, like he'd been waiting for us. Just pull off, I sighed, closed my eyes, and rubbed my forehead. Let's get this over with. I wasn't even speeding, and this car doesn't have a broken tail light. He is such a jackass. My brother hit his steering wheel with obvious frustration, but slowed the car, navigating two more switchbacks before pulling carefully onto a mountain overlook. Bo was now repeating all my earlier cuss words under his breath as we waited for Jackson to approach the car. I was not surprised that Jackson, being the complete jackass that he was, shined his high-powered flashlight in Bo's face even though the sun was still out. Which one of you is Dwayne? he asked then pointed the flashlight at me. I'd adverted my eyes so I wouldn't be blinded and was reminded how much I seriously hated this guy. You can't pull cars over just because you're looking for somebody, Jack. Bo said, nice and friendly and with a shit-eating grin. Not unless that person is missing or under arrest. You're Bo, Jackson said, lifting his chin toward my brother. He redirected his attention back to me as he holstered his flashlight, still leaning against the car and into the window. Dwayne, did you know my sister's out of town? I sat a bit straighter, surprised Jackson had pulled us over to share his sister's whereabouts with me, and glanced at Bo before answering. Yes, yeah, I just spoke with her. My aunt died, my mama's sister. Jess is out in Houston with my parents, sorting everything out. Bo and I shared another look, and I read Bo's thoughts perfectly because they mirrored mine. Why the hell is he telling us this? I know all this, Jackson. Like I said, I just spoke to Jessica. 
Jackson nodded, and I realized he was schooling his expression, keeping his tone flat. Something dark and cold settled in the pit of my stomach. This was a setup. I was sure of it. Jackson was setting me up, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how. Abruptly, I knew we needed to leave before Jackson could say anything else. Well, thanks for the info. We'll just be on our way. I motioned to Bo to restart the car. If you know about the funeral, then I guess you know about the money, too. Right? I almost flinched. Almost. Instead, I swallowed and nodded, bluffing. That's right. Know all about it. Start the car, Bo. Bo did as I instructed, but Jackson didn't move away from the window. He just kept talking. Oh, did just tell you how she'd inherited all my aunt's money? That she's now independently wealthy and will be leaving Green Valley after Christmas? Bo's eyebrows lifted, just a fraction of an inch, but otherwise he did an admirable job of hiding his surprise. Outwardly dispassionate, I stared at Jessica's brother. Meanwhile, my heart was beating out of my chest and I'd broken into a cold sweat. Fear. I was feeling fear. The last time I felt fear, really and truly, was when my daddy locked me in the woodshed for two days with no food or water as punishment for sitting in his chair. I couldn't breathe. Bo answered for me. Like he said, Dwayne just talked to Jessica. He already knows all this. Now, if you'll step away from the car, we'll be on our way home, officer. Jackson frowned, looking disappointed and confused by my lack of outward reaction, then nodded once and backed up so we could pull away. Bo rolled up his window, being careful to check for traffic and using his blinker before pulling onto the mountain road. We drove in silence for a full minute, and I was thankful for the quiet. At first, I considered the possibility that Jackson was lying. I dismissed this, as one quick call to Jess would be enough to disprove any false claims. No, he was telling the truth. Staff had answered the phone at her aunt's house, now her house. It was a farm, she'd said. Jessica had mentioned horses on the property. Horses weren't cheap to maintain. And she told me that her aunt had just died. She didn't want to talk to me when others were present on her end. I pulled up the text messages she'd left earlier. I'll call you later today. We should talk. I miss you. Fuck. My forehead hit the window at my side. I closed my eyes as something sharp and intangible stabbed my heart. The pain was unbearable. Spreading up my neck and down my spine, I held my breath, waiting for it to pass. Did you know she was leaving? After Christmas? I shook my head and my voice was rough when I answered. No, I don't think she had plans to leave. Not yet. Not yet? She'd planned to leave. Just not yet. Not till she had enough money saved. I heard Bo mutter a curse, then clear his throat. It's sad about her aunt. Yes, it is. I wondered if Jessica was close to her aunt. I wondered if she was hurting. As much fear and, frankly, despair I felt at the idea of Jessica leaving. The thought of her hurting and me being powerless to help was worse. Do you think it's true? You know, Jackson's a little bitch. He could be trying to mess with you. Now he knows you have it bad for his sister. I ignored Bo's last statement and addressed the former. He's not lying. If she had the money, she'd leave tomorrow. She told me so on her first date. Bo shut his mouth after that. Again, I was grateful for the silence. I didn't want to talk about Jessica leaving, debate the truth of it. She had the means. She was leaving. There was nothing more to say. I'd planned to ignore Jessica's call at 9 o'clock by switching off my phone, letting it go to voicemail. I wasn't afraid of what she would say. I knew what she was going to say. I just didn't want to hear it over the phone when she was hundreds of miles away and be expected to respond calmly when all I wanted to do was rage. I didn't want to rage at her, didn't want to part ways with that between us, so I'd planned to ignore her call. I figured she'd either leave me a voicemail, tell me she was coming back and spare me the conversation, or she'd write me a letter, tell me she was never coming back and spare me the conversation. Either was preferable to having the conversation, because I could delete a voicemail and burn a letter, but I couldn't take back words said in anger. 
Regardless, my good intentions were ignored because when she called, I answered. Dwayne? Jessica. I heard her sigh when I responded like she was relieved I'd answered. Meanwhile, I couldn't swallow even though my throat was on fire. Oh my goodness, it's so good to hear your voice. I know I texted it to you and left you a voicemail, but I can't tell you how much I've missed you. I... I heard her sigh again, then sniffle. When she spoke next, her voice was full of tears. Dwayne, I need to tell you something. Go ahead. I imagine this is what it was like just after the hangman's noose was fitted over one's neck, but just before the floor gave way beneath the condemned. I knew the end was coming. I wondered if the finality of it would be a relief or a burden. But then she said, Dwayne Winston, I love you. I opened my mouth to respond to the words I'd expected to hear. We were over. She had her means and she was leaving sooner rather than later. But the reality of what she'd actually said rendered me speechless. I stared ahead, frowning at the wall of my room, feeling like she'd just thrown my swim shorts up a tree. I love you and I'm in love with you and I realize you're probably upset with me for saying it over the phone, but something happened. I found out something, and I felt like I needed to tell you, like you needed to know. I love you. Life is so short, too short for secrets and things left unsaid. I know we haven't been together very long, but I've known you most of my life, and I think I've always loved you, even though you were ornery and mean and argumentative, even though you were never the safe choice. Now she was crying. Big, heavy sobs making my chest ache in response. My fingers tightened on the phone. I wanted to hold her, soothe away her pain. But she was a thousand miles away and I wasn't prepared for this conversation. I hadn't planned on her love, hadn't counted on it. More accurately, I hadn't thought it was in the realm of possibility. Maybe Jackson had been lying. Maybe she had no plans to leave after Christmas. Maybe she did. But if she had the means to go, then I was the only reason she would consider delaying. I didn't feel elation at this news. I felt only misery. So, I love you, Jessica repeated for a fifth time. I closed my eyes, shaking my head, rejecting the chant that called to my soul, bone deep, and tempted me with my own destruction, and hers as well. Still, unable to swallow, I cleared my throat instead and closed my eyes, gathering my resolve. Self-preservation finally kicked in, and I knew what I needed to do. Jess, we'll talk when you get back, okay? My voice was steady and calm. A muffled sob sounded from the other end, and I nearly relented. I nearly gave in and told her how I loved her, how I adored her. But then I forced myself to imagine how she might look at me five or ten years from now. I would be the source of her misery because I would be the focus of her resentment. My mother had looked at my father that way. He'd been the thief of her dreams, of her life. She loved us kids, but we all knew she yearned for more. That road wasn't one I was willing to travel. Okay, she said finally, her voice small and dejected. Okay. Bye, Jess. It took her another moment and I knew she was covering the phone with her hand, possibly so I couldn't hear her cry. But then she said in a rush, Goodbye, Dwayne, and hung up the phone. I removed the cell from my ear and stared at the screen, at the number I'd saved earlier in the day, one I'd labeled as Jessica, Texas Funeral. I'd been an idiot. Jessica wasn't going to break my heart. I was going to break hers. Chapter 20. Travel brings wisdom only to the wise. It renders the ignorant more ignorant than ever. Joe Abercrombie. Last Argument of Kings. Dwayne. With a dark cloud over my head, Bo and I arrived at the Pink Pony at 10.30 p.m. The lot was full, but that wasn't unusual. This place was by far the best strip club in eastern Tennessee. I was no connoisseur, but Bo was, and I trusted his opinion. The interior of the pink pony was mostly pink. The walls were pink, as were the carpet, tables, and chairs. 
The dancing platforms were a shiny black lacquer, and four white fiberglass carousel ponies decorated the stage. Girls would use the attached carousel poles in their act, and sometimes they would ride the ponies. I knew the bouncer on duty from my days of picking up Tina after work. He waved us in, and I immediately crossed to the bar. I didn't notice any of it as we entered. The glitz, the tits, the girls, the patrons. Hank typically manned the bar on weeknights. We'd need his permission to go backstage, and I wanted to get this over with. As soon as he saw me, he gave me a smile that was equal parts pleased and disappointed. He finished pouring two shots from a bottle with a black label, then crossed to meet us. Oh, man, I was hoping to never see you here again. He reached his hand out and shook mine over the bar, politely ignoring my foul mood, then turned to my brother. Bo, are we still fishing on Sunday? Yep, butt crack of dawn. Bo shouted over the noise, sliding onto one of the stools and grinning at his old friend. Hank was four years our senior. Growing up, he was only around for the summers. His parents shipped him off to boarding school during the year. Now he was living it up. A Harvard Business School graduate turned local strip club owner and a source of extreme embarrassment to his parents. Based on your phone call last week, I'm guessing you're here to see Tina. He sounded like he hoped his assumption was wrong. I'll take some whiskey first. I pulled a 20 out of my wallet and lifted my chin to the Jack Daniels behind him. I didn't miss the way Hank glanced at Bo, as though asking for permission, before turning for the bottle on the wall and pouring three shots. One for each of us? Bo leaned forward and passed me one of the small glasses. Nope. Hank shook his head. Dwayne here gets three shots, and that's it. I'm pouring them now so he won't ask for more later. And they're on the house. I wasn't going to argue. If and when I wanted to get drunk, it wouldn't be at the Pink Pony right before talking to Tina Patterson about serious business. Thanks. I passed one of the shots to Bo. Here, I only want two. I picked up my shot and lifted it, but before I could down the amber liquid, Bo clinked his glass against mine and said, To making new plans. Better plans. I stared at my brother for a long moment and he held my glare. I appreciated the sentiment even though I was disposed to reject it in my present mood. I'd spent so long wishing for something that ultimately brought me misery. No, I wouldn't be making any more plans. Not for a while. I finished my two shots in quick succession while Bo and Hank fell into an easy conversation about boats. I didn't pay any attention. Instead, I used the time to scan the Pink Pony's patrons. I didn't see any Iron Wraiths members, but that wasn't unusual. Rumor had it the Iron Wraiths owned a stake in the G-Spot, a dirty little strip club down by the Dragon Biker Bar. Plus, they'd have to behave at Hank's club. He didn't take their shit. After scanning the crowd, I waited another five minutes for Bo and Hank to finish their conversation, but they were engrossed and I was too impatient to wait for a polite opening. Thus, when the pleasant numbness of whiskey took its hold, I interrupted. We need to talk to Tina. Any chance we could go in the back? Again, Hank looked to Bo as though asking permission, prompting my brother to add, We both need to talk to her. It shouldn't take longer than a few minutes. Twenty at the most. Hank nodded. That's fine. Y'all can use my office. He motioned to one of the bouncers and handed Bo the keys to his office. We shook hands again. Then we followed Hank's employee out of the main lounge and into the back area. I half listened, but not really as Bo greeted all the girls we passed. Only half heard them coo and flirt with my brother. I had no pleasantries for anybody and was relieved when we finished the gauntlet of barely covered breasts, glitter, and tall hair. Bo unlocked the office and the bouncer left us, stating he'd bring Tina. Once we were inside, Bo shut the door and walked to the desk. I stood by the door, leaning against the wall and waited. Inevitably, my thoughts turned to Jess. Without meaning to, I conjured her face was entranced by the slant of her mouth, mesmerized by the small freckles on her collarbone. She was a sickness. My sickness. I decided once this was over, I was definitely getting drunk. Maybe for a couple days. At least through Monday. You're going to have to fake it. I glanced at my brother, knowing he'd spoken but unsure what he said. What? With Tina. You're going to have to find some charm and fake it. 
She's not interested in me, wouldn't help me out of a shallow ditch. But she'd do anything for you, if you asked nicely. I frowned. She wouldn't. Bo smirked. She would. Yeah, like Cletus says, she's a crazy bitch, but she's got real feelings for you. As real as she can manage, you're going to have to use them if you want her to help us. I gathered, then released a large breath, wiping my hand over my face. This was a bad idea. Why? Because I'm no good at bullshitting. Then don't bullshit. Tell her the truth, or some version of it. You need her help. Tell her that. That'll make her feel good. Important. I opened my mouth to respond, but at that moment the door opened and Tina walked in. As soon as she saw me, she stopped, her mouth parting in surprise. I straightened away from the wall and crossed to her, reaching around and closing the door. She swayed toward me, her big eyes made bigger with paint and fake lashes. Dwayne? Tina? I tried to force some warmth into the word, but I couldn't. Too many years of drama and stupid shit were between us. I looked at her now and saw nothing but a black hole of aggravation and tedium. Why I put up with her for so long was a mystery. At my greeting, she stiffened. I heard Bo sigh and saw him drop his head into his hands. Gritting my teeth, I shook my head, searching for some inner strength or hidden powers of bullshit. What do you want? She spat. I studied her for a long moment. She was dressed in tight jeans and a blue halter top, real clothes, like she was on her way out. I need your help, I said simply. She blinked at me, my words obviously not what she expected. You need my help? Her tone was softer than it had been. Yes, I need your help. Oh, ah. Tina appeared to be flustered by my admission, but she rallied after a few seconds, giving me what I recognized as a look meant to entice. Well, you must need my help, seeing as you've been calling me for two weeks and you're here now. You must need me real bad. She strutted toward me and lifted her hand as though to place it on me. I caught her wrist before she could. No, I said. No? I'd surprised her again. No, I shook my head. Never that. Never again. Then wh what? She stuttered, then huffed her impatience. What could you want me for? Bo finally spoke. Tina, honey, there's more to you than your snatch. You have a brain upstairs. Might be worth dusting it off every once in a while. This earned Bo a venomous look, and I realized he and I had switched positions. I was now good cop. Well, my version of good cop. Shut up, Bo. Let me talk to Tina alone. You want me to leave? Bo straightened from the desk, sounded appropriately surprised. Yeah, give us a minute. Tina glanced back to me, her expression curious and uncertain. Bo made a show of his disgust on his way out the door. I hope you know what you're doing, because I told you this was a mistake. We never should have come here. She can't be trusted, Dwayne. Just leave, I said, holding Tina's gaze. He snorted, all part of the show, then stormed out of the office. When he'd gone, I let go of her wrist and walked to one of the chairs in front of Hank's desk motioning her to follow. Please, sit down. She didn't move, but said in a rush, You can trust me, Dwayne. You know you can. Bo never liked me, and he never understood us. I nodded, but made no verbal response. I was starting to think I never understood us. Again, I motioned to the chair. Please, sit down. We need to talk. She gave me a hopeful smile, then crossed to the seat, sitting as I'd instructed. I sat in the other chair, positioned it so we were facing. I couldn't bullshit. That wasn't my strength. But I could be focused, and I could be precise. And I was good at honesty. Thus, I focused on pushing distracting thoughts of Jessica's sobs from my mind. I explained the situation to Tina in precise, but not explicit detail. And I was honest. I didn't have a choice. My family needed her help, and there was nothing I wouldn't do for my family. Chapter 21 Half the fun of the travel is the aesthetic of lostness. Ray Bradbury Jessica I wasn't mad. 
I was hurt and sad and confused by, well, everything, but I wasn't mad. My aunt's funeral took place on Friday, except she wasn't my aunt. She was my birth mother. This devastating tidbit had been revealed as soon as I'd arrived to her house from the airport. My daddy traveled with me and both my parents, the only parents I'd known, and Aunt Louise's lawyer pulled me into the office on the ground floor and told me the truth. A big part of this truth was that she'd purposefully waited to tell me until she'd gone, and no one knew the identity of my biological father. Aunt Louisa hadn't seen fit to share my paternal parentage with anyone. In light of the fact that Louisa had waited until dying to tell me she was my birth mother, I was feeling understandably emotional and reflective and reckless and angry I'd been cheated out of knowing the truth while I'd had time to do something other than accept a huge inheritance from a woman who hadn't liked me much. So I told Dwayne the truth. And he'd responded by saying nothing. Nothing. I told him I was in love with him and he hadn't reciprocated. I'd been foolish. I'd allowed myself to fall too hard and too fast and he probably thought I was crazy. Maybe I was. Maybe Aunt Louisa was crazy or maybe my biological father was a whack job who fell in love too hard and too fast, who valued freedom and wanderlust over lasting relationships and responsibilities. Maybe I was the person I was because my biological parents were circles surrounded by good, generous, reliable, square pegs. It certainly would explain a lot. When the will was read on Saturday, I was again named as her daughter and therefore the official sole beneficiary. I'd had two days to adjust to the truth of my biological beginnings, but it was still a shock when the executor said, To my daughter, Jessica James, I leave my entire estate. All patents, holdings, accounts. After the word accounts, I'd zoned out, feeling sick to my stomach. My daddy left on Sunday, needing to return to work. Before leaving, he told me that I was his daughter. He told me he held me the day I was born and made me his, and nothing would ever change that fact. I cried. He cried. We hugged. He cleared his throat and told me to take care of my mama and let her take care of me. Mama had stayed and tried to help me get things sorted, I'd decided it didn't matter whose uterus I'd inhabited. My parents were my parents. They'd raised me. They'd bandaged my cuts and kissed my hurts and attended my school place. Aunt Louisa might have left me her empty, cold estate, but she'd never tuck me in at night. She wasn't my mother because she hadn't been my mother. I tried calling Duane again on Sunday. He didn't pick up and he didn't return the call. My heart splintered a little more. By Tuesday evening, Mama was anxious to get back for Thanksgiving, so we took one of my new-to-me cars, a new model Jaguar F-Type, and split up the 14-hour drive. I'd never driven a luxury sports car before. It was fun. Or rather, it would have been fun if I hadn't been so sad. I told Aunt Louise's lawyer I would return after Christmas to make arrangements. I decided to wait the month because I honestly didn't know what I was going to do. Mama and I left early Wednesday morning and pulled into our driveway just before 10.30 p.m. We talked very little on the drive. I asked her all the obvious questions. Do you know who my biological father is? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't Louisa tell me before she died? Why did you adopt me? And she had very few answers. She did reassure me that she chose to adopt me, that she loved me as her own and always had. But every question made her cry like the world was ending, so I stopped asking questions. Exhausted when we arrived home, I excused myself after receiving a round of hugs from my daddy and brother, numbly took a shower and readied myself for bed. I pulled on my favorite sleep shirt a black silk nightshirt that fell just above my knees, woolen socks, and climbed under my covers. Except now I was settled and should have been feeling comfortable, but 
I couldn't stop thinking. The money, what to do with it, what to do with the house and all the land, wasn't what kept me awake. I wasn't ready to wonder about my Aunt Louisa or why in tarnation she'd kept me at arm's length while she was alive and took the secret of my father's identity to her grave. Maybe I was simmering in these questions, but I wasn't ready to confront them. Regardless, she wasn't at the forefront of my thoughts either. The truth was, I couldn't stop thinking about Duane. During the drive home, I decided, on I-20, someplace between Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, I was going to search him out. He missed me. He'd said so. He'd offered to fly out to Houston. We'd made plans before I left, plans that included a whole night and a whole day in a rustic den of seduction in the woods. We'd made 13 months of plans. Now, at home, I tossed and turned, wondering if I'd misunderstood or misinterpreted things between us. I replayed every conversation, every touch, and every look over and over in my head, all the words he'd said that felt like promises. I think we're suited. I've always wanted you. When we make love, the house fell quiet, and still I fretted. Unable to stand the sound of silence any longer, I grabbed my coat, my car keys, and the keys to Duane's cabin. On the way out, I also nabbed a small flashlight from the kitchen drawer and pulled on my tennis shoes, not bothering to tie the laces. Finding the turnoff from Moth Run proved to be relatively easy, but I began to doubt myself in the sanity of taking a $60,000 sports car on a Tennessee unpaved mountain road until I spotted the rough path that led to his place. Less than three minutes later, I spotted the cabin and my breath caught in my throat. I was momentarily paralyzed by the sight because light flickered through the windows, and what I guessed was smoke from the chimney rose into the air, made visible by how it blotted out the stars in the sky above. Inexplicably, I was suddenly quite furious. Riding the wave of intense anger, I put the stick shift in first gear, forcefully engaged the emergency brake, and turned off the headlights, opting to traverse the remaining distance by foot. No car was in sight. Not Billy's truck and not Dwayne's roadrunner. I didn't dwell on this trivia because with each step I grew more agitated. By the time I'd silently picked my way up the rough stone steps, I was good and pissed off. I didn't knock before I tried the handle, found it locked, then laughed to myself maniacally as I searched for the cabin's keys. No keeping this crazy lady out, I muttered nonsensically to myself. Hide all you want. I have a key. A key you gave me, you stupid hillbilly. You shouldn't give a girl keys to your man cave if you don't want her to open the door. No sooner had I found the keys and exclaimed, Aha! With wild satisfaction did the door swing open. My head whipped up, a ready frown on my face, and I was assaulted with the image of a sleepy, peeved Dwayne Winston in nothing but unzipped blue jeans and black boxer shorts. Of course, my frown gave way to wonder as my eyes moved over his body. Warmth permeated my bones. Goodness, I loved his body. It called to me. It wanted me to touch it. It promised to hold me and provide the comfort and reassurance I desperately needed. Jessica. The truly perplexed way he said my name cut through my wishful thinking and I lifted my gaze to his, found him looking at me, stunned, like I might be a figment of his imagination. I'm not drunk, I yelled at him. I don't know why I volunteered this bit of information, maybe because showing up in the middle of the night to his cabin in the woods, dressed in my pajamas and coat and untied tennis shoes, seemed like something only a drunk person would do. His eyebrows drew together. Dwayne Winston, I... I... I swallowed, my throat working without success. My chin wobbled, my eyes stung, and not knowing what else to do, I punched him as hard as I could in the shoulder. Ow! Ow? What'd you do that for? He was rubbing his shoulder, now looking at me like I was crazy. I wasn't crazy. I was simply a woman scorned in the Shakespearean sense. I'm mad at you. 
You're mad at me. Yes, I needed you and you don't love... I trailed off, unable to complete the sentence and moved to punch him again, even as tears blurred my vision. Obviously anticipating my intent, he easily intercepted my wrist and used my momentum to pull me forward into the cabin. He kicked the door shut and caught me around the waist before I could face plant on the floor in front of the fire. Stop! I'm so mad at you. I thrashed against his hold, the tears now streaming freely down my face. I thought we were in this together. I thought you wanted me. I thought you'd be there for me when I needed you. But I tell you how I feel, and you want to talk about it later? Was this all a setup? A big lie? Do you even want me at all? He snaked his arm around me and managed to keep my arms from flailing. My back was pressed to his front and he had me in a tight hold. Jess, you are such a bastard. I had just one goal. Hurt Dwayne Winston. Hurt him just as badly as he'd hurt me with his cool dismissal of my confession. Just calm down for a second, he growled in my ear. Calm down, calm down. Yes, calm down. He dragged me farther into the small space. I tried to wrench myself free, digging my nails into his bicep and scratching viciously as I bellowed, I am never going to calm down. With one smooth movement, he twisted me around and pushed me backward. I thought I was going to land ass first on the hard floor, but instead my back connected with a soft mattress. A split second later, he was on top of me, holding my wrists above my head and pressing me against the bed with the weight of his body. I bucked beneath him to no avail. His breathing was ragged, and so was mine. I took the opportunity to glare daggers at his skull. But it wasn't long before I realized he appeared to be just as angry as me. As soon as I comprehended his fury, Dwayne's eyes lowered to my mouth, like my lips distracted him. Then his expression changed, teetered between furious, hungry, and lost. Jessica, he whispered. I wasn't mad anymore. Well, I was mad. I just didn't feel mad. I felt tired, and all the hurt beneath the anger bubbled to the surface. I'm so mad at you, I repeated, like the watery words might protect my heart, and I felt hot tears slide past my temples into my hair. His gaze lifted to mine and he winced. His hold on my wrists loosened and he let them go. Dwayne cupped my face with his big hands and I felt his thumbs lightly wipe away the wetness at my temples. Don't be mad, Jessica, and don't cry. Please don't cry. He brushed his lips against my forehead, pressed a lingering kiss between my eyebrows. Then he moved over me, trailing kisses from my eyebrow to my cheek, to the corner of my mouth, my jaw, my neck. Once there, he licked and bit the exposed skin, making me shiver and tense. His hand slipped from my cheeks, lower to my neck, my shoulders, tugging at my coat. Instinctively, I lifted myself, and he shifted his weight to accommodate the movement, his mouth capturing mine, making my head swim. I loved his mouth, loved how he kissed. I wanted to lose myself in him, and he was making it easy for me to do so. Unwilling to break contact, together we worked to free me of my jacket. I heard him toss it to the floor and I climbed on his lap, straddling his legs and kicking off my untied tennis shoes. Dwayne's fingers sought my skin, caressing my thighs, slipping into my panties to squeeze my bottom. I decided, just as soon as we were finished kissing, I was going to demand an explanation. But first we would kiss, because my brain told me I needed it. My heart seemed to think so, too because it warmed and expanded, making my chest feel airy and achy in the best way. My hips, however, seemed to think I needed more than just kissing in his caressing hands, because they rocked against his middle. Okay, that's not quite right. I grinded against him. Multiple times. I did that. I'm not ashamed. 
the friction felt necessary. My grinding made him groan, which made me moan. His fingers dug into my hips, encouraging me and mine fisted in his hair, like we were anchoring ourselves together. Like maybe, if we could just hold on, we could hold on to this moment, being wrapped in each other. The moment passed, and it was glorious, but I needed more, a lot more. In fact, I needed everything, no more in-between, I needed to know I wasn't alone in risking everything. Given our historical pattern, my need followed by his retreat, I also needed to stop giving him all the say, all the power. If he couldn't give me everything, then I wanted nothing. I couldn't keep bashing myself against a door he kept firmly closed. It hurt too much. Therefore, despite how glorious this kissing and grinding and touching business was, I pulled myself away, pushed against his chest, and stumbled from his lap. Now just just wait a minute. I held up my finger and backed away two steps. My legs were wobbly, and I was still gathering my thoughts. Therefore, I didn't get very far before he caught me, brought me back to the bed, and climbed on top. He lifted my nightshirt until my chest was exposed and then went to town, biting and sucking and licking. Hush. He breathed against my skin. Just for tonight, Jess. Just give me tonight. Just for tonight? I couldn't focus. I didn't understand what he meant. Instead of deciphering Duane code, I moaned mindlessly, grabbing his hair and keeping him in place. Goodness, I needed him. I needed this. I needed the comfort and reassurance that he wanted me as badly as I wanted him. I'd grown accustomed to feeling as though a part of my heart was perpetually vacant, yet he had filled that empty hole. Or I thought he had. Duane understood me. He wanted me. I wasn't strange. We fit together. We fit perfectly. We were suited. And I loved him. I loved him so much. He was tugging at my panties, so I lifted my hips, felt them slide down my legs. I shivered, not from cold, but needing his heat. My fingers left his hair and fumbled for the waistband of his jeans. Each time we were together and things turned passionate, Each time I felt the promise of his skin, I also felt a maddening kind of urgency. It didn't make sense. But there I was, grasping his pants and boxers, shoving them down with my hands and eventually my feet. Likewise, Duane pushed my nightshirt over my head, forcing me to lift my arms when all I wanted to do was grab him and hold on. I hadn't had access to his body before. Not really. I'd never seen his bottom as an adult, nor his thighs or calves. I wanted to see them, touch them, spend quality time getting to know them and all their hopes and dreams. But I was trapped, my wrists held down and tangled in my silk shirt. Granted, I was sexy trapped, unable to move as I would have liked because Duane's hot, hard, naked body covered mine, but I was still trapped— "'You are so beautiful, Jessica,' he whispered, "'his muscular thigh between my legs pressing against my center. "'Spirals of erotic heat twisted low in my belly, "'making me arch and whimper. "'Duane kissed his way down my body, "'biting and licking like I was being savored. "'He was exploring me in much the same way I'd longed to explore him.' But now I was teetering on mindless selfishness, needing him to keep working his magic, stiffening with delighted suspense as he kissed my hip, the front of my thigh, the inside of my thigh, and then... Hell and tarnation, I couldn't stand it. He was breathing on me, his mouth and tongue so close, but no lollipop action. I wanted to scream! I felt him hovering, and I lifted my head, determined to give him whatever encouragement he needed to make this happen, and found his sapphire blues looking back at me. As soon as I gave him my eyes, I saw the pink of his flat tongue lick his lips. Really, this man should have been employed by the CIA because the sight was torture. I was so primed my legs were shaking. Therefore, I was about to either holler at him or 
beg. I wasn't sure which, but before I could, he lowered his mouth to my center and we both moaned. My head fell back and I sighed the big sigh, the sigh of thank you, Jesus. I didn't think much about the fact that I was thanking Jesus for my building orgasm because, again, selfish mindlessness. It had me tilting and lifting my hips, rocking them against his mouth, chasing and cherishing all the prickles of sensation. When I came, it felt like being tossed skyward, the feelings of belonging, the spikes of heat and rightness and desire and fulfilled longing coursing through my body. Then he was gone. Then I heard the very distinct sound of a condom wrapper ripping open. Then there was a pause. Then he was back. I opened my arms to him, wanting to cuddle and lose myself in his strong arms and confused by his placement of the banana wrapper. My confusion was short-lived because he didn't come to my arms. Not exactly. He hovered above me, his sheathed erection rubbing against my sensitized flesh. I sucked in a shuddering breath, my eyes flying open, and I stared at my beautiful man. He was so everything, so sweet and handsome and passionate, so wonderful and kind, and I was desperately in love with everything about him. I need you. He kissed me his hot mouth claiming mine, the hardness of his length separating me and nudging at my entrance. Can I have you, just for tonight? Yes, you can have me forever. I nodded, my fingers digging into his torso. In this position, I might be able to fondle his bottom like I'd wanted. I wouldn't be so lost to selfish madness because I'd already had my orgasm. I could use this lovely invasion as a chance to explore, show Duane how I cherished every inch of him. Yeah, I thought about that for exactly two seconds, because as soon as he pushed inside, the selfish madness returned, and my mouth opened with soundless wonder. He was moving in a particular way, his body high over mine so that with every stroke I was feeling him like I'd felt his tongue. My body was hot and damp, and so was his. Oh, what are you doing to me? I panted, bracing, feeling completely out of control. I'm making love to you. Dwayne's eyes moved between mine, his soul completely bare, and I knew. I knew he loved me. He hadn't said the words yet, but it didn't matter. His eyes told me everything, and the certainty was bone deep. I love you, I love you, I love you, I chanted, holding on to him, hoping my saying the words would encourage him to open his heart and admit the truth. He didn't. Instead, he kissed me. The friction between us became a smooth glide, and I moaned into his mouth, not recognizing the sound I made at all. I closed my eyes. It was at this point I realized I was teetering on the edge of my release, and I wanted desperately to share it with him. I wanted us to move together. I didn't want to push. I wanted him to come with me in tandem of his own free will. I opened my eyes, found him watching me, and was nearly made breathless by the intensity of his focus, the force of his gaze. Jessica, I... He whispered, starting and stopping. It was enough. I moaned in response, higher pitched this time, and again not a sound I recognized as one I had ever made before. Nonsense words and promises I didn't know I was going to say tumbled from my lips. He didn't respond. Just continued his delectable conquest, spreading my legs wider and bringing my knees to my shoulders. Duane, I need you. I love you so much, so much. He cursed tensed, growled in a way that sounded like a surrender, burying his face against my neck and biting my shoulder. I was tossed skyward again. This time he was with me, and we held on to each other like the world was ending and beginning long after our shared ecstasy was over.
Chapter 22 The three saddest things are the ill wanting to be well, the poor wanting to be rich, and the constant traveler saying anywhere but here. E. E. Cummings Jessica Can I ask you a question? I asked, breaking our hour-long silence of touching and petting and kissing. Sure, he said, his voice sounding drowsy and not at all sure. We were cuddled together in the bed, my back to his front. I faced the interior of the cabin, the fireplace directly in front of me. I was completely relaxed. Really malleable was the right word for my present state, caught in that dreamy world of satisfied to the point of exhaustion, but too excited for sleep. Not yet. Again, I wanted to hold on to the moment. Do you always have condoms in your wallet? Or only when you come to your fortress of solitude? Are there random wood women who come to the cabin and service hillbillies? I felt his tension ease, and he chuckled while nuzzling the back of my neck. That's three questions. Okay, forget the last two. Yes, I always have condoms in my wallet. Hmm. What? What does hmm mean? It's just that I never took you for an optimist. His renewed laughter made me smile. He clarified while stroking my hip possessively beneath the covers. I'm not. Billy does random wallet checks, and every year for Christmas he stuffs our stockings with condoms. I think he'd sterilize us all if he could. Now I was laughing, and that meant we were laughing together. My laughter tapered, and I spoke as I thought. I really like your brothers. Dwayne was quiet for a beat. His beard tickled my shoulder when he finally spoke. Yeah, they're okay. I smiled at his affectionate and dismissive remark, letting the subject drop. I wasn't ready to invite anyone else, not even via discussion, into our lovely slice of heaven pie. Not yet. The fire was burning low, just coals at this point, embers of red glowing in chalky black cinders. I loved how wood fires smelled, tart and smoky. They reminded me of dessert, s'mores, and hot lemon curd baked in a pie iron. My daddy was my brownie pack leader growing up. He taught me all the campfire dessert shortcuts. How did you get here, Jess? Pardon? I'd been lost to my thoughts, desserts and campfires. Now I'd associate wood fires with Duane. This thought made me happy. I felt him shift behind me, lean up on his elbow. Did someone drive you? No, I drove. I have... Well, I have a car now. It's a long story. I frowned, remembering I hadn't spotted his parked car when I arrived. By the way, where's your car? Where's a roadrunner? Duane dithered, his body tensing behind me. At last he cleared his throat and said with a sigh, I wrecked it. I choked on nothing, my eyes bulging, certain I'd heard wrong. You, you what? I wrecked it last weekend at the canyon. I twisted in his arm so I could see his face, a rush of alarm making my muscles tense. I rested my palm on his cheek, needing to touch him as my eyes moved between his. Are you okay? Are you hurt? No, I'm fine. I wanted to search his body, see for myself, but then I reminded myself of the sex cartwheels we'd just finished. If he'd been injured, then he could hardly have accomplished such a physically demanding activity. He didn't look sad or mournful about the car, and his lack of reaction did not compute. You loved that car. His expression didn't change. Not really, but he shrugged. It's a good car. Why aren't you more upset? It's not a person, Jess. It's a thing. Things can be fixed. Eventually, maybe I'll fix her up. But that car is awesome, and you never lose. I wasn't quite myself last weekend, he mumbled distractedly, his attention dipping to my chest as his hand lifted to cut my breast. 
He touched me like he appreciated my texture, using his thumb to draw circles on my skin. Then why would you risk it? I ignored the pleasure radiating from where he enjoyed my body because I wanted to understand how Duane could be so dismissive of his badass car. I only risk what I'm willing to live without, he said, still with an air of distraction. He moved, guiding me so my back was against the mattress and he was above me again. Just before he bent his head to my chest, he licked his lips. The wet, slick heat of his mouth closed over my nipple, and he sucked, swirling his tongue in a circle. Despite my best efforts to remain focused, my breathing became erratic. Duane, I struggled to remain sensible. Duane, that's not real risk at all. It's only real if you risk what you need. I need to be inside you again, Jessica. He half whispered, half growled, and I felt his need press into my inner thigh. Okay, I sighed, adding absent-mindedly, but you should know I'm still mad at you for not taking my call on Sunday. I shouldn't have done that. I should have taken your call. He nipped the underside of my breast. I squirmed, my eyes closing. You had to promise me. I need you to promise you'll never do that again. I sensed him falter, his movements stilled, and several long seconds passed where the only audible sounds were our combined breathing and the crackle of the dying fire. His continued stillness prompted me to open my eyes and lift my head. He was still over me. His mouth parted like he was going to speak but needed to think first on the words. Duane's sumptuous eyes examined my face, searching. His expression was enough to give me pause, and I was about to withdraw, push him further for the needed promise. But then he said, As long as we're together, I'll never ignore your call. I promise. Something about the assurance felt off. Too careful. I was groggy, therefore I replayed his words in my head three times before I caught the disclaimer. No. I shook my head, narrowing my eyes in an attempt to stay focused. No, no disclaimers, just a promise. You need to promise me you will never ignore me again. For the rest of our lives, you will call me back till we're dead and buried. He continued to stare at me, and as he stared, I watched Duane war with himself. After a protracted minute, he rose to his knees his eyes conducting a quick but heated sweep of my face, hair, body, and then he climbed off the bed. He paced the short distance to the fireplace, then the table. He halted there, his hands on his hips, giving me his glorious backside. I watched the broad shoulders rise and fall and propped myself up on my elbows, waiting. The longer I waited, the heavier the sinking sensation twisted in my belly, giving me vertigo. Duane? Abruptly, he turned and stalked back to the bed, careful not to touch me. He sat on the edge, grabbing his boxers from the floor and pulled them on. I watched him dress, at a complete loss as to what he was thinking. What are you doing? He gave me his decidedly stormy gaze. You're asking too much. I can't promise that. Again, I replayed his words in my head three times before I understood. When I did, I'm sure my expression mirrored the explosion of anger catching my brain on fire. I scrambled from the bed, taking the sheet with me, and stood over him as he yanked on his jeans. Why the hell not? You know why not. I don't. I really don't. My hand fell against my thigh with an exasperated smack. Sometimes you talk to me and sometimes you don't. You tell me you've been waiting for me for five years, biding your time. You're hell-bent on courting me, but heaven forbid I give you a blowjob. We make this deal for thirteen and a half months. Meanwhile, you're straddling the line. I'm all in, and you're half in, half out. He stood from the bed, buttoning and zipping the fly of his jeans. I lifted my chin to maintain eye contact. I decided he was too tall and imposing and unreachable. You're leaving, Jess. You're not all in. 
You're dipping your toes in the water until it's time to go. I felt that remark in my spine, between my shoulder blades like a knife. It took me a moment, but I finally managed, albeit more loudly than I'd intended, to respond, That is complete bullshit, Duane, and you know it. When have I ever given you any reason to think I'm not completely invested? What I know is, when you leave, you can't expect me to have friendly feelings about it. When you leave, you shouldn't call me, ever, because I am not returning your calls. I won't want to see or talk to you. This time the pain was in the front and the back, my spine and my chest, and I'm pretty sure I flinched. His words felt like a blow, a slap across the face, especially after what we just shared. I knew tears were gathering in my eyes, but I didn't care. Dwayne studied my features only briefly before turning around and walking back to the table like he couldn't stand looking at me. I swallowed my emotion, but it continued to rise, making my scalp feel hot and my skin overly tight. And then I heard his frustrating grumble. This was a mistake. I couldn't think. All the air had been sucked out of the room. I backed up to the mattress and sunk to it. He was a pendulum, and I couldn't keep up with his perpetual motion mood swings. One minute we're cuddled up in bed, and the next... I don't understand. I stopped, then decided to just say what I felt. I don't understand why you offered me a when you obviously had no intention of following through. Can you explain that? travels. He told me you were planning to start after Christmas. I blinked twice, shaking my head in an automatic rejection of at least half his words. Well, that's a lie. Duane straightened, his abruptly wide eyes evidence of his surprise. I rushed to clarify. Not all of it. I mean, my aunt did leave me with money. From the looks of it, and with good investments, enough for me to travel the world and not work if I so decided, but I have no plans to leave Green Valley imminently, and certainly not just after Christmas. His eyes dimmed and his mouth flattened. Why not? Now I studied him, how he appeared to be restraining himself, holding himself away from me, and everything clicked. He'd been so cold so aloof when I told him I loved him. He thought I was leaving. He thought I was just going to leave and never come back. Wait a minute. I jumped to my feet, my mouth opening and closing as I tried to decide which part of this tangled mess to address first. You thought... And then you... And we just... I gestured to the bed and decided to settle on my last thought. So Jackson tells you about the money and you assume things are over between us? Do I mean so little to you? Did you ever want me, or was that a lie? Dwayne frowned, balled his hands into fists, and said nothing, but behind his frown I perceived a restlessness to contradict, but I wasn't finished. Or is this about you not trusting me? You don't trust me, and that's why we made love tonight. You don't trust me to stay. 
Just for tonight, Jessica, that's what you said. He didn't deny it. He just continued to watch me piece everything together. Admit it. The only reason you gave in tonight is because you thought I was going to leave right away. Now that I can leave, you don't trust me to stay. You don't trust me at all. I trust you, he countered quickly. I ignored his statement, desperation making me say, We are far, far from over, Dwayne Winston. Jess, he shook his head, looking visibly torn. We have an expiration date. In fact, we are over. I don't see where we can go from here. You're going to be making plans to leave. We had this trial before the 12 months started, and I'm calling it off. You don't get to call it off. I charged forward, waving my index finger around like it was a sword. I am calling it off. I'm walking away because I'm not going to keep you from doing what you need to do. What do I need to do? Leave. I flinched again. My next words were accusatory, half outraged question and half statement. You want me to leave? I'm not answering that. Didn't you just hear me? I'm in love with you. Why don't you ask me to stay? I demanded with a frustrated shout and a firm push against his chest. You don't ask someone you love to give up on her dreams. I reeled back, my mouth falling open, wide, wide open, and I'm sure I looked a bit like an astonished owl. Two fat tears trailed down my cheeks, hot and unwieldy. Dwayne gritted his teeth and looked away, his eyes focusing on a spot behind me. Shifting on his feet, refusing to make eye contact, he appeared to be regretful. He was obviously wishing back his hastily shouted admission, and that made me immeasurably sad. Meanwhile, none of my internal organs knew what to think. They wanted to have a, he loves you, he finally said it, party. But the manner of his confession and immediate withdrawal afterward made my heart hesitate to place the catering deposit. My voice wasn't entirely steady as I asked, Were you going to admit the truth if I hadn't pissed you off? We're not discussing this. Why not? I cringed at how needy I sounded, how lost. I finally had his eyes again, but now they were blazing with fury. Because you're leaving, and we're over, and it's pointless. That's why. And everything has to be perfect, right? Everything has to be just right. Heaven and all the angels forbid Dwayne Winston ever does anything without precision and guaranteed success. I must have struck a nerve because his gaze morphed from heated to incensed and he advanced on me. Fine. Fuck yeah, I love you. What do you think this is all about? Well, now we're finally getting somewhere. In case you didn't hear me the first hundred times, I love you too. He ignored me. Or maybe he didn't hear me. I look at you and I see my future and it is something great. But I can't do anything about the fact that our dreams don't align. And since I do love you, I want you to live yours. He backed me into the bed, but I held my ground, catching his arm before he could turn away. So what about you? I'll be fine. Fine? Fine? Screw fine. Yes, fine. I'll be just fine knowing you're somewhere in this world following your siren call. He was withdrawing again, so I held on to him tighter, not allowing him to turn away. Why are you like this? Why do you insist on being so noble? Why does everything have to be defined? His chest rose and fell with a large breath, his eyes darting away, and I knew I was pushing him beyond his level of comfort, but I couldn't help it. I tried softening my voice, coaxing. Dwayne, I have been nothing but honest with you. The least you can do is tell me, he interrupted, bringing his flashing eyes back to mine. My father always took whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. He took my mama, us kids. He'd take and take and take. I promised myself I was never going to be like that. Because when you have a father who is a selfish bastard, who takes what he wants whenever the fuck he wants it, the last thing you want to be is without honor. My heart hurt for him, but I didn't know what to say, how to make it better. Regardless, he didn't give me a chance. 
Dwayne peeled my fingers from his arm and cradled my hand between his. You want to go out there and live your dreams? Then I'm going to remove myself from the equation. I'm not going to stand in your way, because I would rather see the sadness in your eyes now than the resentment in your eyes months or years from now. We are over, and I have to be the one to end it. I have to be the one to walk away. It has to be my decision. You need to give me that at least. He dropped my hand and stepped away, his eyes moving around the cabin like he was searching for something. Finding his shirt, he pulled it on. I watched numbly, part of me still cuddled up with him in bed as he sat in one of the chairs by the table and put on his socks and boots. I was feeling so many things, but none of them were eloquent. Broken, sad, broken and sad, that's what I was. Silent tears slipped through my eyelids while he slipped through my fingers. I didn't have the brain power or the heart for an impassioned speech. I was tired and my heart was bruised, but I couldn't let him go. Not without exploring every option, not without a Hail Mary pass, I couldn't keep bashing myself against a door he kept firmly closed, but I could leave a note. Therefore, on a desperate whim, I asked with an unsteady voice, Truth or dare, Duane? He shook his head, his eyes closing briefly to cover his discomfort, like the sound of my voice caused physical injury. Truth or dare? You want to play truth or dare now? Yes. Pick one. Truth or dare? Fine. He clenched his jaw, then gave me his eyes. They were cool and distant. Dare. I nodded once, making a decision to be vulnerable just once more. I dare you to extend the term of our relationship to indefinite. His expression didn't change. He just stared at me, the line of his mouth flat and straight. So I pushed, begging. Stay with me tonight. Don't leave. Stay with me, and not just for twelve months. Stay with me always. He winced, and I could see his hackles rise. Before he could speak, I lifted my hand to stop him. I see you don't understand my meaning. I understand you perfectly. He ground out, his rough tone unyielding. No, you don't. I waited a beat, wanting to be sure he saw I was serious before I handed him my heart on a platter. Come with me. That made a dent. He blinked his surprise before he could catch himself and blurted, What? Come with me. I dare you to come with me. Next month, next year, whenever, I dare you to come with me when I go. And stay with me. Stay with me always. Chapter 23 Happiness is not a state to arrive at, but a manner of traveling. Margaret Lee Runbeck Duane I walked home. I left Jessica wrapped in a sheet. I left Jessica. I left, and I left part of myself in the cabin. I sensed the emptiness in my middle, in my gut, as soon as I crossed the threshold and entered the cold night. Her suggestion that I leave with her, travel the world, and share her life, her adventures, sounded like a fairy tale. A perfect fairy tale. And I'd been so surprised by the proposition that my mind actually considered the possibility. But then I remembered the shop my brothers, my obligations, the shit with the wraiths, and how everyone had been affected when Ashley ditched us years ago. I remembered my father and how he took what he wanted without a care for his family. He came and went as he pleased. Leaving with Jessica was a fairy tale, perfect in theory but completely impractical in reality. But when Cletus relied on me, needed me, they couldn't handle the workload on their own. My savings were invested in the auto shop, and 
I wasn't going to travel the world using Jess's aunt's money. Was I too proud? Fuck yes. I was too proud to take money from Jess or anyone else without working for it. So I left before I reconsidered, before I heeded my siren call. But even then I'd been undecided. I kept seeing her face, the tears shining in her beautiful eyes as I walked out. The image of her called to me, to the depths of my soul. Each step was a burden. I turned back to the cabin at least three times, and the tightness in my chest made breathing near impossible. That was until I spotted her car. Jessica's new-to-her car was a brand-new F-Type Jaguar, 5-liter V8, manual transmission, all-wheel drive, 495 horsepower. I knew my automobiles like most people know their ice cream, so I knew the MSRP, manufacturer's suggested retail price, was just under $100,000. I stared at it for at least a full minute. Then I walked the remainder of the way home without looking back, taking satisfaction in the sound of every twig that snapped violently under my boots. By the time I arrived at the house, I was in desperate need of breaking something. No way was I going to be able to sleep. Getting drunk was an option, but I'd been drunk for most of the last five days, and it was our first Thanksgiving since Mama died. Besides, getting shit-faced an hour before dawn wasn't my style anyway. Concluding the only option available to me at present was splitting more wood we didn't need. I decided to veer toward the woodshed once the house was in view. But as I cleared the trees, I stopped short. Jethro, my oldest brother, was walking up the porch steps to the front door, carrying a large duffel bag slung over his shoulder. I was too surprised by the sight of him and too caught in the momentum of my misery to call out before he entered the house. But the sound of our front door shut and pulled me out of my stupor. My mind was a mess as I quickly jogged to the porch and rushed through the screen door. I needed to speak with him, bring him up to speed. But I was also five different shades of pissed off with my oldest brother. Somehow, likely because violence was already on my mind, the five shades of pissed off won out over being sensible. Thus, when I entered the house and he turned around, a big carefree grin eating up his face, and he said, Hey, Dwayne, did you miss me? I punched him in his face. I pulled the punch at the last minute. I didn't want to knock him out. I just wanted to beat him up a little. Maybe get knocked around myself. He staggered back, more from surprise than from the force of my fist, and threw a completely perplexed frown at me while clutching his jaw. What the hell was that for? I didn't answer. I let him read the intent in my eyes, gave him a few seconds to prepare, then I charged at him. Jethro was a good fighter. We all were, but he was better than most of us. Being the oldest and spending a good part of his youth fucking around with the wraiths, he learned to fight fierce and dirty. But he taught me all his tricks long ago, and his fight now wasn't fueled by weeks of frustration, of dealing with biker threats, and Jessica James's confession I could do nothing about. Perhaps he was trying to defend himself against my assault, but that didn't deter me any. We crashed around the living room, banging into walls, sending picture frames falling to the floor. He had me in a headlock, and I used the position to elbow him in the ribs, then administer a kidney punch as he struggled to contain me. My nose was bleeding, and I took satisfaction in the sight of his split lip when we were interrupted by a harsh whisper. What are y'all thinking? We glanced up in unison. Cletus's furious expression had an instantly sobering effect. He stood on the stairs, looking as upset as I'd ever seen him, and loud whispered down at us. Making a ruckus at five in the morning? Making a mess of things? On Thanksgiving? Today is Turkey Day! Plus, you know how Billy needs his beauty sleep. Otherwise, he'll be whining at us till dinner. I don't want to listen to that swell on my day off. And besides, you interrupted my quiet time. Jethro grimaced, shooting me a dirty stare, which I returned, and loud whispered his response. Sorry, Cletus. Cletus's hands were on his hips, and he gave us both a hard look, his eyes sticking to me a bit longer than Jethro. Take your fight outside. I nodded, staggering to the front door and whispering contritely. We will. And now you owe me pancakes, Dwayne Faulkner Winston. Cletus added with a reprimanding whisper. Blueberry pancakes. 
Then he pivoted and disappeared down the upstairs hall. I didn't know what Cletus did during his quiet time, but Bo seemed to think it was yoga. I opened the front door, then turned and gestured for Jethro to exit the house. You first. He lifted his chin, covered with three weeks' worth of unkempt beard. His hands were still balled into fist. He'd never been the trusting sort. Then again, I had just attacked him in our living room. I shrugged and exited to the porch, walking to the far corner. I waited till he followed me and shut the door before saying, You've always been a selfish asshole. Jethro nodded once, working his jaw back and forth. His steps were measured as he crossed to me. Everybody knows that. And you could always start an argument in an empty house. Now, why don't you tell me specifically what I did to inspire such an unforgettable welcome home? Traps, I growled, closing the remaining distance between us and keeping my voice low. You installed traps in four cars for the iron rates so they could run drugs without getting caught. Jethro's eyes widened even as his brow pulled low. How do you... Because, dummy, they videotaped the whole thing. And now Repo is exploiting your shitty decisions as blackmail. He wants to use the Winston Brothers Auto Shop as their new chop shop. Or else he's sending you to federal prison. Oh shit, Jethro said on a shocked and defeated exhale, then sunk to the rocking chair to his left. I watched dispassionately as his elbows came to his knees and he buried his face in his hands. I was quiet, something I knew how to do well and waited for my brother to process reality. Did you do it? Did you agree? He didn't lift his head, so his words were spoken to the wooden porch floor. No, we've been stalling. Jethro's shoulders rose and fell, and he nodded. Good. Good. He was silent for a beat, then asked, And Cletus doesn't have a plan? No, Cletus doesn't know. Jethro lifted his head from his hands, his eyebrows knit together. What do you mean Cletus doesn't know? You didn't tell Cletus? No, Jethro, I didn't tell Cletus. Why would I want to bring him into this god-awful mess of yours if he can keep his hands clean? Isn't it bad enough that Bo and I have to deal with it? My oldest brother jumped to his feet. Dwayne, Cletus installed the traps. Now he'd surprised me. I straightened from the wooden beam where I'd been leaning and stared at him. He was half-smiling. Come again? Cletus was the one to install the traps in those cars. Not me. Do you think I'd be able to install those contraptions? Did you see how they work? You have to... He appeared to be searching his memory for the description. You have to wire them just so, where they won't open unless the car is off, but the key is in the ignition, and the seat belt is fastened, and there's a hurricane in Florida, and no beer left in the fridge and everyone's favorite dessert is banana cream pie, or some such complicated nonsense. I was still stuck on the fact that Cletus, not Jethro, had been the one to install the traps, too stuck to admire the genius of how they worked. So, Cletus knows. He knows all about this, how you got out of the wraiths. Jethro nodded. Yeah, when I decided enough was enough, and those biker boys told me what I needed to do, the cost of my freedom? The first person I thought of was Cletus. I frowned at my brother. Was he there? When you showed them how the traps work? No. He installed the traps, showed me how to use them. I went to the wraiths on my own, took credit for the installations. I was trying to minimize his involvement. So he doesn't know they're being used to smuggle drugs. Jethro made a sound in the back of his throat and shifted on his feet. I mean, he probably guessed it. I knew, of course, even before the wraiths told me so. Why else would they want secret traps? But on the video, you start cussing them out when they tell you. Because I had plausible deniability up to that point. Once they told me, and I knew for sure, I became an accomplice. That's why I was so pissed off. If they didn't tell me, then I could always claim ignorance. Jethro was good at that claiming ignorance, shifting blame, or he used to be, before he got himself straight. We need to tell Cletus, Jethro said, with a kind of certainty that gave me my first glimmer of hope. He'll definitely know what to do.
We took turns in the downstairs bathroom wiping blood from our faces. I walked into the kitchen once I was finished assessing the damage and rehanging fallen pictures. I found Jethro making coffee and ice in his lip. Thus, after grabbing myself a bag of peas for my eye, I set to work making enough blueberry pancakes to feed a small army. Without prompting, Jethro good-naturedly related his adventures trekking the Appalachian Trail. I was amazed how he was able to keep from fretting about the Iron Wraith's blackmail attempt. I'd been twisted up, either thinking about how to outsmart the Iron Wraiths or debating what I should do about Jess, or counting the hours until I could see her again, or trying to figure out how to get her alone, or wondering how the hell I was going to survive without her. Thus, Jethro's tall tales were a welcome distraction. We had to wait until Cletus emerged before approaching him. Having interrupted his quiet time earlier, I had no desire to instigate his wrath further. Cletus's retaliation was always unanticipated and devious. He was a fan of polite revenge, knowing how to get his point across with very little fuss. We both stilled when we heard footsteps on the stairs, and Jethro poked his head out of the doorway. What the hell? What happened to you? Recognizing Billy's voice, my shoulders sagged and I turned back to the griddle. Jethro didn't answer. Instead, he walked back into the kitchen and reclaimed his spot at the kitchen table. Billy entered the kitchen seconds later, his eyes moving from the bruise high on Jethro's cheek to the cut on his lip. Did that happen on the trail? Yeah, I was assaulted by a gang of ninja raccoons. Jethro took a sip of his coffee. Billy gave him another long look, then turned to the coffee. But he stopped again when he saw my face and the less than subtle swelling around my eye. He lifted an eyebrow, glanced between the two of us, then left the kitchen without his coffee saying as he went. Never mind, whatever it is, I don't want to know. But do let me know when the hotcakes are ready. And there better be a turkey today, because I already made the stuffing, and something or someone is getting stuffed. Getting a turkey was Cletus's job this year, I called after him. No sooner did Billy leave than Bo shuffled in, scratching his balls and yawning. Do I smell pancakes? Yes, I nodded then tilted my head toward Jethro. You also smell skunk. Bo lazily glanced where I indicated, then did a double take when he saw our oldest brother. Bo was suddenly awake, his brow pulling low and the set of his mouth grim as he studied Jethro, perhaps trying to determine whether or not he was going to be sensible or violent. Prior to Jethro's miraculous reformation, seeing him with a black and blue face was a normal occurrence. But since he'd changed his ways a few years ago, he hadn't come home with more than a scratch. What happened to your face? Bo finally asked, and not kindly. Your twin happened to my face. Bo nodded, his features relaxing, then crossed the kitchen to the coffee machine. Good. Saves me the trouble of doing it myself. So what's the plan, Dwayne? We're waiting for Cletus to get up. Bo halted his coffee porn and glanced between me and Jethro. I thought we weren't going to involve him. He already knows. He did the initial installations. Well, I'll be. Bo shook his head, his eyes losing focus someplace over my shoulder. Then he abruptly snapped his fingers. That makes sense. Ain't no way Jethro could have installed those traps. I don't know why we didn't figure it out earlier. Just then, Cletus walked into the kitchen, obviously still in a temper. Don't speak to me until I've had my hotcakes. I'm still angry at both y'all. Jethro jumped up from his chair. Bo set his coffee cup down on the counter with a loud thunk, and I straightened to attention. All of us were standing like statues staring at Cletus, wanting to speak but knowing better than to disobey his request. It took him a little bit to notice our rigid readiness, but when he did, his eyes narrowed and bounced between the three of us. All right, now take that back. Y'all are making me nervous. Maybe somebody should tell me what's going on. Chapter 24 Traveling in the Company of Those We Love is Home in Motion Lee Hunt Dwayne The four of us took our breakfast to the Quonset Hut, escaping the house before Billy knew we were leaving. By some silent agreement, Jethro and Bo appointed me as the storyteller likely because they both had a habit of extreme and unnecessary embellishment. 
I explained the situation, provided the timeline, and described what steps we'd taken so far. All the while, Cletus ate his pancakes and drank his coffee, nodding at intervals and frowning at other intervals. For example, when I mentioned I'd enlisted Tina's help, he scowled. Are you finished? He asked at length, his eyes on my untouched plate. With the story or with my food? My pancakes had gone cold, but I wasn't hungry. Both? Yes, you can have them. I passed him my plate and rubbed my hand over my face. I was tired and the thought of eating made me nauseous. But it was more than the exhaustion. Everything hurt, and not because of my fist fight with Jethro. Cletus took three bites, making us all wait in suspense, and then asked, What I want to know is, why didn't you come to me in the first place? And also, how do you get these to be so darn fluffy? It's like eating a blueberry-flavored cloud of awesome. We didn't tell you because we didn't want to make you an accomplice, just in case we had to follow through, Bo answered for me. I see. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and concern for my well-being, he said using his most formal tone, then added, But that was really stupid of y'all. So what are we going to do, Cletus? Jethro got right to the point, giving our brother a charming smile despite his split lip. Nothing to do. Cletus shrugged, sipped his coffee, and then set it down. Bo and I exchanged looks of despair. If Cletus didn't have a plan, then we were going to have to rely on Tina. Cletus must have seen our expressions and understood what they meant, because he added, Let me clarify that last statement. There's nothing to do because it's already been done. In these cases, federal law requires the installer to inform local law enforcement when traps are suspected of being used for illegal purposes. The police have already been informed about those secret compartments because I informed them years ago, when I first installed the traps. Now Bo and I exchanged looks of astonishment. I don't think either of us were capable of speech at that moment. However, Jethro narrowed his eyes on Cletus and sounded half insulted. What do you mean the police already know? Did you rat me out? Cletus tisked at Jethro and scrunched his nose like my oldest brother smelled badly. No. Well, his eyes moved up and to the right as though reconsidering his answer. Not in the way you mean. I informed the police when I installed the traps because I suspected they'd be used for illegal purposes. Whether or not the police actually know about the traps is a different matter entirely. I was too tired for Cletus's riddles. Cletus, would you just speak plainly? What did you do, and what does it mean for us? Should we be worried about the iron rates? I'll answer your questions in reverse. First... You do not need to worry about the iron rates. They have no power over you, Jethro, or me, or Bo, for that matter. In fact, we are in a position to blackmail them, if we so choose. Well, thank heavens. Bo sat back in his chair and heaved a loud sigh of obvious relief. Second, what this means for us, Cletus used air quotes around the word us, is that we should... The four of us go to the Dragon Biker Bar and meet with Repo, or even Razor himself. One of us will need to explain the situation, i.e. the Winston boys are immune to their threats. So they'll quit their harassing and stay on their side of the schoolyard. You want to talk to Razor? Jethro asked like Cletus was certifiable. Razor was the Iron Wraith's president and one truly dangerous motherfucker. No, I didn't say that. I said one of us. Again, he used air quotes around us, but this time his eyes slid to me and he looked at me with meaning. What? I asked, shaking my head. You can't mean me. Now all three of them were looking at me, and they were nodding. It makes sense, Bo said encouragingly. I was not encouraged. It does, Jethro agreed. Razor hates my guts already because of, well, the past. He doesn't know Bo, but he can spot a bullshitter a mile away. Are you calling me a bullshitter? Bo frowned at Jethro. Yes. Yes, I am, Jethro admitted smoothly. Okay, just making sure. Carry on. 
Bo's smile was back, and he looked quite satisfied, likely because it took one to know one. And Cletus, well, no offense, Cletus, but Razor won't respond well to your style either. Agreed. Cletus nodded once and took another bite of my cold pancakes. When he spoke next, he spoke around a full mouth. It has to be Dwayne. He's abrupt, irritable, and those charlatans don't scare him any. He's perfect. It was my turn to exhale loudly, shaking my head but not willing to argue the point just yet. We'd have plenty of time to debate this later. Right now, I wanted answers. So, what did you do, Cletus? How did you inform the police without them knowing? You know how I help with those mail sorter machines at the police stations and the central office? I maintain them for three counties. Just one of the many ways I spend my time helping the citizens of Tennessee. Yes, we know, Jethro answered for all of us. Well, funny thing about those machines. Letters get stuck and unstuck all the time. When a machine breaks and needs fixing, I sometimes find letters that are years old. Bo and I quickly shared a glance. Are you telling me that you planted a letter in one of those machines? Down at the station? He asked. Cletus shook his head. No, of course not. I didn't plant anything in any of the machines, but I did slip a certified letter in with a stack of old mail, mail found in one of those machines during a service call, and then subsequently placed into storage unopened. I even know the box and shelf number where it's kept. I believe I even have the receipt for the certified letter upstairs someplace. Again, Bo and I were rendered speechless, and this time Jethro was as well. The three of us sat in stunned silence for several seconds, watching Cletus eat my pancakes like he didn't have a care in the world. Jethro stirred from our trance first. Well then, I guess Dwayne will just explain to Razor that the police have a certified letter in their possession detailing the existence of the traps. That's right, Cletus agreed. I included pictures of the cars, their VIN numbers, and the traps. As well, I described the sequence for opening the compartments. I have a copy of the documentation in my room, someplace. Bo shook his head and barked a laugh. I can't believe you, Cletus. Believe me, Bo. But there is one more thing. Cletus said grimly, moving his eyes to me. You never answered my original question. Yes, I did. We didn't tell you because... Not that one. He waved his hands in the air as though swatting my words away. The pancakes. How did you get them to be so light? It's amazing. I shook my head at my eccentric older brother and answered honestly because I was so tired. Egg whites. What? I stood and stacked the plates. It's egg whites. I keep them separate, then I whip them till they're stiff and fold them in at the end. It makes the pancakes super light. Oh. Also standing, he nodded, as though deep in thought, but then unexpectedly asked, Why do you look like that, Dwayne? Like what, Cletus? Like your heart is diseased. I told you. We're in the clear. No need to worry any longer. And your egg white secret is safe with me. I know, I nodded, but didn't respond further because I had nothing to say. I wasn't going to whine about Jessica. I was going to suck it up and move on, eventually, in about 30 years. Unfortunately, Bo liked to gossip. He's upset because Jessica James just inherited a mountain of money from her aunt, and now she's leaving. I glared at my twin, promising retribution at a later date. He gave me a sympathetic look in exchange, which only fueled my ire. I didn't want pity. Miss James is leaving? In the middle of the school year? Cletus appeared to be genuinely distressed. But we were just getting to integrals. I shrugged. I don't rightly know. What do you mean you don't know? Jackass James pulled us over, told us both a week ago. Bo pressed the point while Jethro raised an eyebrow and glanced between the two of us. Jessica James. Jethro said her name thoughtfully, as though trying to recall her image. Didn't she wait tables at Daisy's Nut House? You've had a thing for her since I can remember. Thanks for the reminder, Jethro. 
I gave him a hard look and set the plates back on the table in front of him. The Iron Wraith's blackmail problem might be close to solve, but I was still feeling very little charity where my oldest brother was concerned. Well, is she leaving or not? Because we have a test next week and I feel pretty good about the material. Cletus pressed. I stuffed my hands in my pockets and shook my head. I don't know. She said she doesn't have any plans to leave immediately, but she doesn't have any reason to stay. Cletus and Bo's frowns were severe. No reason to stay? What kind of swill is that? What are you, pig liver? What a heartless doxy. I huffed, not liking Cletus's uncharitable assessment, because if memory served, I was pretty sure doxy meant the same thing as floozy. I was also growing impatient and needed this conversation to end. Look, she wants me to go with her, okay? She's not heartless. She's following her dreams, and I can't fault her for that. And I can't hold her back, so I broke things off. Bo and Cletus shared a look. Then Bo said, So, what's the problem? Why don't you go with her? Dumbfounded, I stared at my twin, then my older brother. They were watching me as though expecting me to explain myself when the reasons were perfectly obvious. I looked at Jethro for help, but he was staring at me like he didn't understand the problem either. I growled at their thick-headedness and turned away, shaking my head and making for the exit. Cletus stepped in front of me, blocking my path. Now hold on, Bo's question is valid. We all know how you've been pining after Miss James. What's the problem? Maybe I can fix it. I answered through gritted teeth. The problem, Cletus, is that I'm part owner in the shop, in case you've forgotten. He shrugged. So? So, you and Bo think you can keep up with business without me? He shrugged again. Maybe, maybe not. If I'm honest, I'd say probably not. But then we could always hire a replacement. I stared at him, again dumbfounded, and added, What would I live on, huh, if I went off with her? All my savings is in that shop. We'd buy you out if you want. This answer came from Bo. Or you could get a job wherever you and Jess land. Auto mechanics, good ones, aren't easy to find. Plus, there's your racing. There's always circuits out there, especially if you stay in the South and Midwest for a bit. Or you could stop being such a proud douchebag. Let Miss James and her inheritance keep you in style. Earn your keep the old-fashioned way. Jethro grinned as he said this, cocking an eyebrow, then winked at me. I was tempted to punch him in the face again. Sign me up for some of that, Bo said, also grinning, but then his smile fell and he cleared his throat, looking away when I glared at him. The point, my dear brother, is that there's nothing keeping you here other than your own stubbornness. Cletus's tone was instructive and gentle, and incredibly irritating. What about honor, huh? Obligation. To whom? Us? Bo and me? Cletus shook his head. You think we want to look at your grumpy face for the next twenty years, regretting your decision every day? No, thank you, sir. You're already ornery enough as it is. Cletus wiped his mouth with the corner of his napkin and placed the used paper towel on top of the plate stacked in front of Jethro. You better get started on those dishes, he said to Jethro. It's the least you can do given the trouble you've caused. And you, he turned to me. You need to call Tina and tell her we got it covered. We can't have her messing things up or making complications. I nodded. What about me? Asked Bo, sitting back in his chair, looking mighty relaxed and pleased. Well, now, Bo, you and I... Cletus clamped his hand on my twin's shoulder. We need to go find ourselves a turkey. Chapter 25 a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Mark Twain Jessica Tina brought her new boyfriend to Thanksgiving dinner. He wanted us all to call him Twilight. This was an odd and difficult adjustment for our family because his real name was Isaac Sylvester, and my brother had known him since kindergarten. His father, Kip, was my boss, and his mother, Diane, ran the bakery in town and read poetry at the library on Thursday nights. His sister, Jennifer, was the baker of those infamous award-winning banana cakes. 
and he wanted us to call him Twilight. I was too tired and melancholy to truly feel the level of bafflement this request deserved. However, I did notice the initial exchange between my brother and Isaac slash Twilight when they arrived with Tina's mama. It went something like this. Jackson. Tina, I didn't know you were bringing Isaac. Good to see you, man. Isaac slash Twilight. It's Twilight. Jackson, looking bemused. No, it ain't. It's not even noon yet. Isaac slash Twilight. No, my name is Twilight. Jackson, still looking bemused. Say what? Isaac slash Twilight. My name. Call me Twilight. Jackson. You mean like that My Little Pony character? Tina. Jackson? I didn't know you were My Little Pony fan. Jackson, scowling, then motioning to Isaac slash Twilight. Jessica's always watching it growing up, and I'm not a fan. Not like Twilight Sparkle over here. Isaac slash Twilight. The name is Twilight, not Twilight Sparkle. Jackson, irritated. If you want me to call you Twilight, then don't be surprised if I slip up a few times and call you Pinkie Pie. A similar conversation ensued when Twilight was brought in to greet my dad, except Dad said, That's not a name, son. That's a time of day. It didn't take long for us to realize that the Isaac Sylvester we used to know wasn't this Twilight fella. Last I'd heard, Isaac had joined the army and was stationed in Afghanistan. That was six years ago. But now the leather jacket he wore, covered with iron wraiths patches, quickly told us everything we needed to know. My father's method of solving the inherent awkwardness was to put a beer in all empty hands and turn on the football game so loud no one could speak. Tina stayed with the men in the family room, basically sitting on Twilight's lap. Meanwhile, my mama, my daddy's sister, and I made dinner. It was just as well. Mashing potatoes was a good outlet for my gloomy aggression, and neither my mother nor my aunt expected me to talk much. I was feeling hollowed out, like Duane had removed some essential part of me and taken it with him. I had no way of getting it back. Therefore, Thanksgiving was spent in a distracted haze of sadness and self-doubt. My family attributed the depression to my mother's death. Several times during the day, my mama put her hand on my back and rubbed the space between my shoulders. Then she'd say, I know, I know it hurts. Give me a quick hug and walk away, fighting her own tears. I'd watch her go, grimacing to myself because I wasn't preoccupied mourning the loss of Louisa. I mean, I mourned her. I was sad she died, but she'd spent all my life, especially when I was in college, keeping me at arm's length. I guess now I knew why, but not really. Her actions still didn't make sense to me, and I was too exhausted to contemplate Louisa's decisions. The reality of Louisa's betrayal, because it was starting to feel like one, was too fresh. My mama seemed to think I was feeling a great deal more despair about Louisa than I was, and contradicting her assumption felt wrong. It felt heartless, especially in the face of her genuine pain. So I kept my mouth shut and accepted her sympathy, offering my shoulder as a safe place for her to cry. Meanwhile, the focus of my conscious desolation was of the red-bearded man troubles variety. Matters were not helped when Tina sauntered into the kitchen after dinner. I'd offered to do all the dishes. All of them. All. On my own, with no help, because I really just needed to be by myself. I didn't hear her come in because I was scrubbing the roasting pan and trying not to cry. Hey, Jess, want company? She asked right before her arm wrapped around my shoulders and gave me a squeeze. I'm so sorry about your aunt. I stiffened then sighed, relaxing and giving an odd sideways lean into her embrace. I couldn't hug her without drying off my hands, and that just felt like too much effort. She obviously didn't know the truth yet. I made a mental note to talk to my parents about the plan going forward, how they wanted to proceed, if they wanted people to know I'd been adopted. Thanks, Tina. I acknowledged her sympathy with a head nod, but no need to keep me company in here. I imagine your boyfriend can't be feeling too comfortable with Jackson poking fun at his new name. Tina leaned against the counter at my side and giggled. Twilight isn't my boyfriend. 
We've been hooking up a lot lately is all. I brought him to ease my mama's mind. She thinks I'm some kind of biker whore, so I figured bringing a familiar face from the race would make her feel better. I slid my eyes to the side and scrutinized my cousin. What do you do with the race, anyhow, when you're there at the Dragon Biker Bar? She shrugged. We play pool, get drunk, have fun, fool around. Sometimes I put on a show. Do you ever feel like you're in danger? I mean, they don't have the best reputation. She shrugged again, and this time when she giggled, it sounded nervous. Well, not in danger, exactly. I mean, things can get pretty intense and scary, like some of the guys can be really rough, but I think I like it most of the time. I really like it when they fight over me. I like that part a lot. I nodded thoughtfully. I was trying not to judge, trying really hard, because watching two men fight over who would be having sex with me didn't sound all that appealing. And I didn't know how to answer the questions I suddenly wanted to ask, but knew they would be imprudent, not to mention impolite. What Tina did and who she did it with and why in tarnation she did it was none of my business. I felt her eyes on me. Apparently, she misinterpreted my struggle because she said, Dwayne and I aren't back together. I stiffened with surprise and dropped the roasting pan I'd been holding, splashing water on my apron. What? What did you say? I said, Dwayne and I aren't back together. Despite what you may have heard, we aren't. He came to see me on Friday at the Pink Pony, and I know some people like to gossip. I'm sure you heard about it. I felt many things at that moment, and all of them were of the ugly, jealous variety. I recognized something about myself just then. I wasn't enlightened or open-minded, not even a little. I didn't want Dwayne going to the pink pony, watching and admiring naked women, and I didn't want him seeking out Tina. Just the thought of it made me angry, and feeling more and more like a woman scorned in the Shakespearean sense— and lots of crazy woman scorned thoughts bounced around my brain, making me dizzy. The room tilted, and I gripped the edge of the sink. Maybe Dwayne didn't want to leave Green Valley because he didn't want to leave Tina and all the dancers of the Pink Pony. Maybe I wasn't enough for him. Maybe he'd been expecting me to conform to some role where he raced cars and got lap dances on the weekends while I stayed home, knitted him socks, and folded his laundry. But that wasn't right. That wasn't the Dwayne Winston I knew and fell in love with. That wasn't even the Dwayne I grew up with. Reason raised its hand and suggested I doubt my cousin, or doubt her version of events at least. Reason had a calming effect, and that's when I realized she was still speaking. So, just because he'd been texting and calling me like crazy for the last three weeks didn't mean I was open to restarting anything between us. Like I said, I've moved on, and so should he, I told him. She stopped talking abruptly, frowning as she pulled her phone from her pocket. Helplessly, I watched as she smirked at the screen of her cell. He just can't stop calling me, she tisked, then showed me the incoming number. It was Dwayne's number, and he was calling her. I watched her send it to voicemail. I felt her eyes on me, though mine were affixed to the phone. Dwayne was calling her. He left her messages. Now, maybe I was being willfully blind, but I could not swallow the notion that Dwayne cheated with Tina, or with anyone for that matter. He loved me. He did. I knew it. And no one could convince me otherwise. And he wasn't a cheater. I knew him. Therefore, with cold conviction, I turned my tired gaze back to Tina. You're lying. Her full lips parted like she was offended, and she stuttered for a bit before managing. What? You just saw his number flash on my phone. You just saw him call me. I shook my head. I'm not doubting the calls or the messages, Tina, but you're still lying. This smells like a skunk in a perfume shop. First of all, you come in here on Thanksgiving, the day after I come back from my Louisa's funeral, and tell me how Dwayne has been visiting you at the Pink Pony, waving that phone in my face, wanting to stir shit up. I don't buy it. You're trying too hard. 
Tina was giving me her angry bitch face, which was actually pretty scary, but I was too numb to feel fear or intimidation. After an intense and drawn-out staring contest, Tina rolled her eyes, flipped her hair, and snorted. Whatever. You can believe what you want, but that doesn't change the fact. That's right. Nothing you can do or show me will change the fact that I know Dwayne Winston and he is a good man. He's not his father. He's not a cheater. He wouldn't do that to me or to anyone. And I know he loves me. I know it. I trust him and I love him. And and now I was crying. I didn't know why she was doing this, why she wanted to make me believe that Dwayne had been running around behind my back, but I didn't care to know her reasons. Still using wet hands, I turned from Tina and grabbed a paper towel, using it to wipe my eyes and nose. I could feel her stare, feel her intense dislike as she pressed. I thought you weren't together. Isn't that what you told me at dinner a few weeks ago? Or were you lying? I shook my head, sniffled, and squared my shoulders as I faced her. Not that it's any of your business, but we weren't together when you and I had dinner. Then we worked things out a few weeks ago. So why are you crying now? She spat, pursing her lips, her eyes narrowed slits. Suddenly I was too tired for this conversation, for her brand of crazy. So I said, that's also none of your business. I turned away from my cousin and the remainder of the dishes, needing the solace of my dark room and softer tissues. Hey, wait, we're not done here. I turned and walked backward, shaking my head at her nasty audacity. You are my cousin, Tina. I will always love you, notwithstanding your spitefulness. I will. If you ever need my help, I'll be there for you. But we're not friends. I don't like being lied to, and I don't like you trying to cast aspersions on Dwayne's good character. So we are done here. I'm finished, and now I'm leaving. Dwayne. I think you've broken my heart. I've never had my heart broken before, but I'm pretty sure this sick sadness is it. I didn't sleep after you left. I cried for a long time, though. I feel like I kept trying to give myself to you, and you kept withholding yourself from me, and now I guess I know why. I'm not so good at letting go. Once I get an idea in my head, I hold onto it with both hands, so you'll have to pardon my inability to just walk away now without saying my piece. You said a few things on Wednesday night slash Thursday morning that weren't true, so now I want to set the record straight. I meant it when I said I have no immediate plans to leave Green Valley. I still have the rest of the school year to finish, and there's no one who can fill in or take my place. I may have the wanderlust. My soul may long to see and live in the world, to explore and have adventures, but that doesn't make me a flake. That doesn't mean I don't take my obligations and promises seriously. Tina came to Thanksgiving at the house yesterday and told me you've been chasing after her for the last three weeks. She showed me text messages that you'd sent, and then you called her phone, left a message while I was standing there with her. Just so you know, I don't believe her. I know you, Duane. You're not anything like your father. You're not a cheater. I love you and want to be with you all the time, so yes, I asked you to come with me when the time comes. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe that's asking too much. But I want you to belong to me, and I want to belong to you. I wish you would ask me to stay or help me try to find a compromise. Compromise isn't dishonorable. Asking me to stay isn't either. Please ask me to stay. Love always, Jess. I read, then reread the 17th iteration of my letter. Presently, it was the day after Thanksgiving. I'd been working on the letter all day and had discarded the other 16 because after getting past the part where I told him how much I loved him, my mind invariably returned to the moment when he'd left the cabin. He'd left me standing in that sheet with a dead fire and a coal bed. He just walked away from me. So I would become spitting mad. I was still mad now, but I recognized calling him insulting names in the letter, like shit for brains, might be counterproductive to the letter's purpose. I needed him to read it. 
It was a way for me to monologue and share my thoughts without the unhelpful shit-for-brains comments slipping out. Plus, name-calling wasn't likely to inspire affection and an open heart. I set the letter back on my desk and rubbed my eyes, reflecting on how complicated life had become over the last month. Likely it was the ghost of J.R.R. Tolkien making me crazy as retribution for the blasphemy in my sexy Gandalf costume. Knock, knock. I turned from my desk and found Claire poking her head in my bedroom door. Her mouth was flattened in sympathy. Hey, how you holding up? I sighed, twisting to my desk and quickly flipping the letter over. Come in and shut the door. She did, moving to sit on the edge of my bed nearest my location. I turned fully in my seat to face her. I'm so sorry about your aunt. Your mama says you two were really close. I stared at Claire for a beat, then shook my head. That's not true. We weren't close. Didn't you work for her? Live with her over the summer during college? Yes, but we weren't close. When I lived with her, she had me stay in one of the maids' rooms, and we never took meals together unless Mama was visiting. Claire's face screwed up with confusion. Well, that's a strange way to treat family. It must have been strange for Claire to label it as such, especially considering Claire's experience with her own extremely dysfunctional family. I organized her house and schedule. When she had visitors, she'd tell people I was on staff. She never once called me by my name, let alone admit I was related. I just figured she was embarrassed by me. I shrugged, shrugging off the twinge of hurt feelings I'd long ago set aside, but now felt remarkably fresh given the fact that she'd given birth to me. At first, during the early days of my employment, my feelings hadn't been hurt. I thought working for Louisa would bring us closer together. Ironically, in retrospect, I thought she'd be like a second mother. I thought we'd talk to each other about topics other than hiring a new driver, replacing the tile in the blue damask bedroom, and her various nail and hair appointments. But working for my aunt had only served to segregate us into the roles of employer and employee. I'd never grown attached to Aunt Louisa because she didn't want me to be attached. She distanced me in a way that had felt purposeful. Huh. Claire sat back on the bed, crossing her arms. That is so bizarre. The way your mama spoke just now, she made it sound like your aunt loved you most in the world. I sighed again. I was doing a lot of sighing. I wasn't ready to tell Claire that my aunt was actually my birth mother. I wasn't ready to talk about Louisa because I didn't know how to feel about her. So, once again, I pushed my feelings away. I decided to tell Claire the truth, minus the maternity reveal. I never figured her out. But she left you all that money. Yeah, she left me everything. Claire tilted her head to the side, her bright eyes assessing my face. Is that why you look so forlorn? Don't tell me you're feeling guilty about your aunt's money. I shook my head, biting my lips so I wouldn't speak the truth about my mood. If I'd learned anything from this disaster, it was to be considerably more guarded with my heart. I'd always thought that if I were open to love, then love would find me. As it turns out, if you're open to love, then heartbreak finds you and leaves you naked in a cabin with no electricity or indoor plumbing. But Claire knew me too well. Her eyes narrowed on my lip, and she tilted her head the other way, her assessment becoming full-on scrutiny. Jessica, what are you hiding? I shook my head faster. What's going on? You're miserable, and it isn't your aunt, and it isn't your inheritance guilt. Something has happened. I shook my head even faster, but now Claire was a blur of red hair and white skin because my eyes were filling with tears, and crap, I just sobbed. She reached forward and pulled me into a hug, stroked my hair, and held me tight. Goodness gracious, what is going on? You're shaking. I grabbed fistfuls of her shirt and cried on my friend. Cried and cried. I don't know how long I cried, but it was a good while, and it was embarrassing. She hushed me and spoke soothing words. 
Her shirt at the shoulder was soaked by the time the tears ebbed. Can you talk now? Can you tell me what happened? I opened my mouth to speak, but hiccuped instead. I needed a moment, or an hour. Therefore, I straightened away and grabbed letter number 17 from my desk. I handed it to her and managed to squeak out, Read this. I'm going to wash up. Then hurried from the room. I took my time in the bathroom, scrubbing my face, blowing my nose, giving myself a mirror pep talk. I felt a bit less pathetic when I stepped back into my bedroom. Crying and being sad is like an upper respiratory infection. Snot makes me feel pathetic, and the absence of snot makes me feel less pathetic. Oh, Jess, I'm so sorry. Claire looked both sympathetic and confused when I entered the bedroom. She crossed to me and squeezed my shoulders. I feel like I pushed you into this thing with Dwayne, but I just can't imagine. I never would have... He left you in a sheet? She sighed, befuddlement winning out over sympathy. I finally felt stable enough to explain the entire situation, so I did. We sat on my bed and I told her everything about how I'd called him from Texas, how I'd tracked him down to the cabin, how we loved each other, how he was using honor to abandon me to my empty dreams. When I finished, Claire was staring at me, her fingers halfway covering her open mouth. I shrugged, not sure what else to do. It's all right. I'll be fine. She nodded, frowning, and it was clear she didn't believe me. Fine. You'll be fine. You pack a bag. Come stay with me tonight. I gave my friend a small smile. That actually sounds really nice. Claire's frown intensified. Then she tisked. Well, come on. Let's get a bag packed. We'll stop by the Piggly Wiggly on the way for some ice cream. We were just pulling out of the store parking lot when my phone rang. I glanced at my screen but didn't recognize the number. I stared at it for one ring longer, then swiped my thumb across the display and answered, figuring it was likely a wrong number. Hello? Jess? Jess, is it you? Jess, it's me, Tina. I... Your help. Real big trouble. I need you to... Totally fucked. And they found. Tina, wait a sec. I can't understand you. You're cutting out. Where are you? I heard some static on the other line. Then she said, The dragon. You have to hurry. I stole this phone. Are you at the dragon biker bar? Do you need me to come get you? I glanced at Claire, found her watching me with alarm. Yes, I need... But that's all I got, because her side clicked twice, then the line went dead. I brought the phone to my lap and pulled up the recent calls list. Not only did I not recognize the number, the area code wasn't local. What was that all about? I'm not sure. It was Tina, and she sounded frantic. I think she was calling from the Dragon Biker Bar. At least she said yes when I asked. She wants me to come get her. She wants you to go to the Dragon? To pick her up? Actually, she sounded like she was in trouble. I took a deep breath, staring at my phone for a stretch, trying to figure out what to do. Then I dialed Jackson's cell number. What are you doing? Colin Jackson. I'm going to ask him to meet me there. At the Dragon? You want to go to that hellhole? She sounded incredulous and a little panicked. The bar served as the club headquarters for the Iron Wraiths. Since her daddy was the club president and her mama was his old lady, Claire had spent much of her early adolescence at the infamous biker bar with the MC members and club girls. If memory served, she hadn't seen or spoken to her folks since marrying Ben McClure years ago. As I waited for Jackson to pick up, I tried to calm Claire. Listen, don't come. Just take me back to my house, and I'll drive over on my own. The hell you will. You're not going there by yourself. She glanced in her rearview mirror and started her car. Backing up, she maneuvered the small parking lot. But we're stopping by my house first. I need to get something. Claire, take me home. I know that place doesn't have good memories for you. Jackson's phone clicked over to voicemail, so I hung up and decided to text him about what was going on first. Her grip on the steering wheel tightened, and I noticed her eyes were a bit wider, but she dismissed my suggestion. No, I'll go. It'll be fine. I didn't know if she was trying to convince me or herself.
Chapter 26 Never Travel Faster Than Your Guardian Angel Can Fly Mother Teresa Jessica As I waited in Claire's truck for her to grab whatever she needed from her house, I called Jackson again, and this time I left a voicemail. Then I called my daddy and did the same. I rationalized it was sufficient they know where we were. It wasn't unusual to get their voicemail, especially when they were on duty and driving around the mountains, and most especially on a holiday weekend when all the drunk drivers were celebrating by smashing into trees. Finished with my messages to the law enforcement members of my family, I looked up just in time to see Claire coming out of her house. She was carrying two handguns. Wordlessly, she opened the driver's side door, leaned over me, and put them both and an extra magazine in the glove compartment. Then she buckled her seat belt, started the car, and backed out of her driveway. Meanwhile, I was staring at her the whole time, wondering what the heck she was thinking. About two minutes down the road, I finally asked, What the heck are you thinking? Her eyes flicked to mine, then away. I'm thinking I'm not going near that place without a gun. Claire! I have a concealed weapons permit. So do I, Claire, but I'm not bringing my gun to the Dragon Biker Bar. I'm not taking any chances, okay? I said I'd go by myself. Claire slowed at the stop sign, one way leading us down to Green Valley, the other way leading us up the mountain to the Dragon Biker Bar, and turned to face me. Her jaw was set. Her eyes were determined, but the panic fraying the edges of her typically calm demeanor made me nervous. Look, I know these people. I grew up in that place. I know what it's like to be inside that compound with no way out. We're not going in there, and we're not getting near the place without a plan, a weapon, and a means to escape, and I'm not letting you go without some kind of protection. I called my brother and my dad. They know where we're going. You can't tell me these guys are dumb enough to do anything to the sheriff's daughter. Honey, they're dumb enough and dangerous enough to do just about anything. Then... What should we do? Should we wait for Jackson or my daddy? She sighed, her fingers flexing on the steering wheel, then turned the truck up the mountain. No, no, we need to get to Tina before it's too late. Too late? Should I call 911? Claire hesitated, then shook her head. We can call 911 when we get there, but maybe it won't come to that. Maybe just the threat of your brother and father being on their way will be enough for them to hand over your stupid cousin. Plus, they won't do anything to me. Nothing lasting, anyway. What? What does that mean? It means I know too many of their secrets. Claire pulled her Nissan truck into the parking lot of the Dragon, choosing a space near the edge of the lot and far from any of the motorcycles. It was cold, and the weatherman had threatened snow on top of the mountain. Exiting Claire's truck, a gust of frigid wind whipped my hair in all directions. It was going to snow, sooner rather than later. That meant all the leaves would fall and autumn would officially be over. I would miss the vibrancy of color, but part of me was looking forward to the white blanket of winter, when everything is either desolate or covered. It would match my mood. Claire put both weapons in the back of her jeans, along with the extra magazine, covering them all with her bulky sweater. We walked to the main entrance together, holding hands. I'm not sure which of us reached out first, but I was glad to have her next to me. I'd never been to the bar before, though I knew where it was located, perched at the tippy top of the highest peak. Everyone knew where it was and what it was about, and to avoid it unless you were looking for trouble— a giant dragon was painted along the front side of the cinderblock building, and not one of those friendly Chinese dragons used in parades. This dragon looked mean, and it had metal spikes coming out of its tail, and the top of its head is horns. Its claws were also metal spikes. I surmised all the metal spikes were iron, which explained the name of the club— the dragon was in the midst of decapitating a person, blood gushing over the mystical creature's claws in a gratuitous display of artistic violence. Real nice. Row after row of motorcycles were lined up in front, and loud music reverberated from behind the closed doors. 
A rough interpretation of the iron wraith's emblem hung in the window is a neon sign, right next to two other neon signs advertising Bud Light and Jack Daniels. Certainly, the music, the murderous dragon mural, the rows of motorcycles, plus the austere cinderblock exterior gave a less than friendly aura to the place. But the outside was tidy, no trash in the lot or littering the building, and the surrounding area was covered in trees and underbrush. As we approached, I spotted two men coming around the side of the building, apparently deep in discussion and also apparently related to giants. These men weren't big. These men were huge. Like basketball player tall plus rugby player wide. I was more than a foot smaller than the shorter of the two. Claire must have seen them as well because I felt her stiffen, then pull us abruptly to a stop. We're close enough, she said, even though we were a good twenty feet from the building. I glanced at her in question, but her eyes were fixed on the two men and her stance was rigid, primed to flee. Listen, you go back to the car and I'll... No, you're staying right here with me. She shook her head, but before I could object, she called out to the men. Catfish drill, hey, over here. The two giants, who apparently called themselves Catfish and Drill, glanced up. Neither frowned, nor did they smile, but it was obvious they were surprised as their gazes moved over Claire. Almost reluctantly, they broke away from the side of the building and crossed to where we stood. They glanced behind us and around at the woods lining the perimeter of the lot, as though checking for a trap or potential hidden accomplices. "'It's been a long time, Scarlet. You here to see your daddy?' the shorter of the two asked. His head was bald, and his eyes were a sharp blue color. Maybe they appeared so sharp because he was dressed in all black. Black leather pants, black leather jacket, black leather boots, black shirt beneath. That's close enough. She lifted her hand when they were about ten feet away, her tone stern. I'm not here to see anyone. This is Jessica James. Her daddy is Sheriff James, and her cousin called her earlier from inside the dragon and wants to be picked up. The two men stopped where she'd indicated, approximately ten feet from where we stood, and their eyes moved over me again. The shorter one asked, "'Your daddy is a law?' I nodded. "'Yes, sir, but all we want is my cousin. She called about twenty minutes ago.' "'What's her name?' This time the taller one spoke. His skin was dark brown, but his eyes were nearly hazel, and his voice was so baritone it was almost too deep for my ears, making his words sound slurred together. Tina, her name is Tina Patterson, I supplied. She dances at the Pink Pony, Claire added, and I saw recognition ignite both of their expressions. Claire continued, her explanation sounding like a command. She called. She wants to leave. We're here to get her. The two men exchanged a look that I didn't understand. Then the shorter one made like he was going to reach out and offer his hand to me. I'm Drill, this here's Catfish. Automatically, I moved to step forward, but Claire pulled me back and somewhat behind her. She had steel in her voice as she ground out. She don't need to shake your hand. She just needs her kin. Come inside, Scarlet. Have a drink. I'm sure your daddy would... What's going on here? A third male voice interrupted Catfish's overtures, walking quickly from the entrance of the bar to where we stood. He was about six foot, no taller, and was older than the other two, but they both stepped to the side as though deferring to his authority. I recognized the newcomer almost immediately as the biker who'd been talking to Duane the night we stopped by Daisy's nut house for pie. His dark brown eyes snagged on mine, and his steps faltered, his mouth parting. He was definitely surprised, and he definitely recognized me. Scarlet is back, as she brought a friend. Drill motioned to me. I am not back. From my vantage point, I could see Claire was speaking through clenched teeth, and her blue eyes flashed as she appealed to the newcomer. Repo, this is Jessica James, and her daddy, I know who her daddy is. What are you two ladies doing here? The man Claire had addressed as Repo still hadn't taken his eyes off me, and his stunned surprise seemed to have morphed into disapproval and anger. We're here to pick up my cousin Tina. Repo's eyes narrowed, and he didn't respond for several seconds, opting to scrutinize me instead. 
Meanwhile, Drill and Catfish were looking at Repo as though they were waiting for direction. What makes you think Tina is here? Repo finally asked. She call me? She call you. He sounded doubtful. Yes, so I called my brother and my daddy and told them I was coming here to pick up my cousin. At this point, Repo's glower turned into a smirk. You called the sheriff and the deputy. They know you're up here? Yes, Mr. Repo, they do. Now, for the fourth time, could one of you please bring Tina out? Then we'll be happy to leave. His smirk widened into a smile when I called him Mr. Repo. Then he chuckled like he thought I was funny. Smart girl, he said under his breath, shaking his head. He turned, the smile waning from his face, and lifted his chin to drill. Go get Tina, bring her here, and don't go volunteering the Scarlet's here. That ain't nobody's business. Drill seemed surprised by the orders issued, but said nothing to contradict. He nodded once. Then Catfish and Drill walked back to the building. They didn't use the main entrance. Instead, they took the same path they'd come from and disappeared around the cinder block corner. This left Claire, Repo, and me standing outside the bar. Claire was glaring at Repo. Repo glared at Claire. I split my attention between the two of them. I figured we were going to spend the next several minutes in silence as we waited. Neither of my companions seemed inclined to talk. Dislike as thick as sausage gravy rolled off my friend. Whether her ire was pointed at this man or this place or both, I had no idea. She didn't discuss her childhood. Just a few slips and scraps of information here and there. Enough for me to extrapolate that she'd never had it easy and considered the wraiths part of a dark past. But then Repo cleared his throat and said to me, I heard your, uh, your aunt died. I nodded once. That's right. He studied me for a long minute, so long I thought he was finished. Unexpectedly, he said, I knew her when we was kids. I'm sure I looked as surprised as I felt. My aunt? Both of Franklin's sisters in Texas. Your granddaddy was my daddy's boss. At the ranch? That's right. Huh. I frowned at the coincidence and said, Small world. Not so small. He mumbled under his breath, but I caught the words. My curiosity was piqued. In fact, a prickle of cold something slithered down my back, so I asked, So what was she like? My aunt. His small smile was framed by a well-groomed salt-and-pepper goatee and reflected in his dark eyes. She was very pretty, beautiful, and smart. Smarter than me. And she was funny. She used to make me laugh. I narrowed my eyes at him. The cold, slithering something settled in my belly. Really? How'd she do that? What'd she do that was funny? Play tricks. Pranks, mostly. She got me good a few times. I huffed a humorless, disbelieving laugh. I can't imagine all Louise being funny. She was. She was wild. And she sure liked to take the piss off her daddy. He responded absent-mindedly, like he was talking to himself. His gaze lost focus, turning inward with nostalgia. Sounds like you, Claire whispered, nudging me with her elbow. I blinked. It did sound like me, and I felt an odd lightness in my chest, but it wasn't a good feeling. I'd always considered myself an outsider in my own family. All my relatives in both Tennessee and Texas were the traditional type. Well, everyone but Tina. But Tina and I weren't much alike either. And now I knew Tina and I shared no blood. My relations thought I was a bit strange. My sense of humor awed, my ideas about traveling the world a phase, and that my good sense would eventually prevail. Maybe my birth mother had been like me when she was younger. In her case, I suppose that good sense did eventually prevail. She'd settled down, never got married, but she'd grown roots. After making millions with her ingenious patent, she spent her life organizing charity functions and getting her nails done. I shuddered at the thought. 
She changed, I said and thought at the same time. Pardon? Repo asked like I'd woken him from a trance. A harsh gust of wind sent my hair flying, so I gathered the chaotic strands at the base of my neck and twisted them, raising my voice over the music and the sudden breeze. She changed. My aunt changed. I never saw her wild side. His expression blanked, then shuddered. He studied me for a beat, then shrugged, his voice sounding abruptly distant as he said, She did change. Do you know why? Did she... I mean, did she ever have any boyfriends? That you remember, like a high school sweetheart or maybe someone in college? I ignored Claire's confused expression as I interrogated Repo. He didn't answer. His eyes darted away, then back to mine, more distant than before. You ask too many questions. A woman should know her place. I lifted an eyebrow with this odd shift in subject and the sudden impatience in his voice. Of course, I'd heard the phrase, a woman should know her place, before, always from an asshole. But something in me couldn't help playing dumb and poking a stick at this particular asshole. So I asked, deadpan, a woman should know her place? You mean like her address? No, baby girl, a woman should know her place. You know, on her back or on all fours, wherever her man wants to take her. I grimaced. You're joking. I ain't joking. Claire huffed. You're serious. You really think that? My voice raised a half octave, unable to contain my disgust. Hey, serious. Claire deadpanned from her place at my elbow. I sneered at him. And your, your old lady, she thinks this way too? He shrugged. I don't have an old lady. Not anymore. What happened to her? Claire tugged on my elbow and warned, You don't want to know. I ignored her, horrified and curious. No, tell me. What happened to your old lady? She didn't like my fun, so I cut her loose. Repo's dark eyes seemed to be watching me closely as he said this, gauging my reaction. Your fun? He means his woman didn't like him... Claire struggled for a moment, like she didn't know how to proceed. Finally, she settled on. She didn't like him fucking the club girls, so he told his old lady to get lost. That's revolting. Repo grinned, his white teeth now menacing. Baby girl, that's club life. That's revolting, I repeated, then added, and you're revolting. I don't want to look at him anymore. I didn't want to talk to him. I wanted to find Tina and get the hell out of there. And just at that moment, Catfish and Drill reappeared. This time they came out of the main entrance to the bar, and four other bikers were with them. I felt Claire stiffen at my side and take a step back. What the hell? I heard Repo say, glancing over his shoulder. He turned completely around as they neared, his hands on his hips, standing between us and the approaching gang. What the hell is this? The men kept advancing. Something about the set of their jaws and the steel in their eyes made my stomach drop. We need to go. Claire backed up another step, pulling me with her. Shit, we need to run. Run! But we were too late. They read our intentions before we could gain distance, and these men moved like athletes. I'd only managed ten sprinted steps before I was lifted off my feet, big arms closing around my torso and turning me back to the bar. I heard Claire screech and cuss, realized she was also being carried. Drill had thrown her over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. I heard Repo rage against the giant who was carrying me. What the fuck is this? You get your goddamn hands off her right fucking now or I'll break every finger in your fucking hand. Sorry, Repo. Catfish's baritone rumbled behind me as I fought fruitlessly against his hold. I might as well have been clawing at a boulder. Razor wants a girl. Chapter 27. Travel Far Enough, You Meet Yourself. David Mitchell, Cloud Atlas. Dwayne. Have you called Jess yet? I shook my head, staring out the driver's side window of Bo's GTO. It was the Friday after Thanksgiving. Instead of heading to the jam session and delicious coleslaw, we were on our way to the Dragon Biker Bar, 
unannounced, and uninvited. We were presently stopped at the convenience store because Cletus needed duct tape. Jethro escorted Cletus into the store to ensure that he didn't dawdle. And I was driving because I was by far the best driver in case we needed to make a quick getaway. I heard Bo curse under his breath next to me, then say, You're such a dummy. I didn't say I wasn't going to call her. I just haven't called her yet. Well, why not? Because I don't have a plan yet, that's why. I need to come with her with a plan, not just being stupid. You are being stupid. What you need to do is call her. Tell her you were wrong. Beg for her forgiveness. Say you're ready to go whenever she is. And then meet someplace for makeup sex. That's how you do it. She's not going to forgive me that easily. That's why I need a plan. Besides, I want all this mess with the iron rates over and done with before I set things straight. They've taken too much of my time, been too much of a distraction. You need to stop waiting for everything to be just right, Dwayne. Haven't you wasted enough time already? I'm not asking for your opinion, I ground out. Bo shook his head and sing-songed under his breath. You're making a mistake. The buzz of my phone offered an alternative to Bo's meddling. Tina. My message to her yesterday was clear. She was no longer needed. She hadn't responded. Not till now. Tina. Tina can't come to the phone right now. You should probably call your Uncle Razor. He's got something you want. I frowned at the short text, reading it twice, then cursed. What? What is it? Bo glanced between me and my phone. I showed him my screen. He cursed, then said unnecessarily, I bet she got herself caught. Luckily, Jethro and Cletus walked out of the Piggly Wiggly at just that moment and made a beeline for the car. Sorry that took so long. They had a wide selection of duct tape, and Cletus bought silly string. Jethro sounded irritated as he settled in the car behind me. You can't rush a duct tape purchase. In my rearview mirror, I saw Cletus clutching the shopping bag to his chest. Duct tape is a man's answer to electrons and protons. It's how we keep matter together. Once Bo was back in the car, he grabbed my phone out of my hand and passed it to Cletus. We may have a problem. Cletus frowned at the message, then nodded, pushing his thick-rimmed glasses farther up his nose. Well, okay then. You can't make an omelet without heat. You mean you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs? Bo corrected. No, I meant what I said. You can't make an omelet without heat. If you have no heat, then it's just watery, raw eggs. That's not an omelet. Why are you wearing those stupid glasses, Cletus? You don't need glasses, Bo asked impatiently. It's a fashion statement, Cletus responded while he typed something into his calculator watch. And to think, I was actually missing y'all last week before I got home. Jethro's sarcasm was cool whip on whipped cream, completely unnecessary. Whatever, Bo said, straightening in his seat. He was anxious. I should have been, but other than hoping Tina hadn't done anything too crazy, and measure guilt for involving her in the first place, all I felt was impatience to have this mess sorted. I wasn't anxious, not at all. Not until the moment I spotted Jessica James and Claire McClure being carried against their will into the Dragon Biker Bar by two huge men in black leather, trailed by four more men in the shouting repo. The situation didn't look friendly. What the fuck? Jethro's voice was tight. I knew he recognized Ben McClure's widow by her red hair. Part of me suspected Ben's death years ago had been the catalyst for Jethro's abrupt desire to clean up his act. Park the goddamn car, Dwayne. Jethro's voice was now frantic. Give the man a minute, Cletus reprimanded. Can't you see his woman is up there too? But she wasn't. Not anymore. They'd both been carried into the bar and swallowed up by the black doors. I raced the GTO as close to the entrance as I dared and had already parked when Cletus spoke. I didn't move my seat up to let my brothers out. Instead, I ran to the entrance and yanked the door open, scanning the inside for any sign of them and paying no heed to the dozens of bikers staring at me. I heard Repo's angry voice but didn't seem, so I charged toward the sound. My way was immediately blocked by several gang members. Out of my way! I growled my frustration, ready in my fist for a fight. Somewhere in the background, honky-tonk blues rattled over an old speaker system. Wait, wait a minute! I heard Bo from behind me, but I ignored him. 
Get out of my fucking way! I shouted, drawing my hand back. I didn't really register the men's faces. Didn't need to. Whoa, hold on! An older woman with flaming red hair jumped between me and the wall of bikers. Her hands held up. Just cool your shit, Winston. This ain't no way to show respect. I'd never hit a woman before, but this woman was between me and Jess, and that meant she might as well have been a man. Before I could take action, Jethro was suddenly there, standing in front of me. Christine, we just saw your boys grab Claire McClure and Jessica James from the parking lot and carry them inside. You need to bring those women out here right now. Christine shoved her face into Jethro's and spat. You don't order me, Jethro Winston. Claire's my daughter, and I'll remind you who you're talking to, boy. Coming in here acting crazy? You want to die today? I gave the woman another look and immediately registered the resemblance between Claire and Christine. I remembered that I'd met Christine before, years ago at a club picnic when I was a kid, and I'd seen her around town many times, never realizing who she was. But none of this information was getting me any closer to Jess. I took a deep breath and gritted my teeth, forcing myself to talk even though all I wanted to do was burn this place to the ground. Look, we're here to see Razor, I cut in glaring at Claire's mama, then the barrier bikers behind her. I got a message he has something I want, and I guarantee I got something he wants. So enough of this standing around chit-chat bullshit. Which one of you's gonna take us to see the big man? Christine's eyes moved to me, face still twisted in a sneer. Her glare traveled down, then up, as though appraising me for a fight. The bar was eerily quiet, and I noticed the music, wherever it had come from, had been turned off. I also noticed we were the center of attention. No man was sitting, and no woman was talking. I know he's expecting you. Her tone was cold and measured. But he wasn't expecting four of you boys, just the twins. Well, we're all here, and we're all telling the same story. So let's go. She studied me, her shrewd eyes moving over my face like she could read my secrets. At last, she nodded once. Fine. Follow me, Winston. Christine turned and the impenetrable barrier of bikers split down the middle, creating a straight path through the crowd. I looked beyond Christine, saw we were headed toward a hallway at the back of the bar. I heard Cletus from someplace behind me say, Gentlemen? Ladies? The walls were black. The doors were black. Everyone was dressed in black. Moving through the crowd was like swimming in a midnight sea surrounded by sharks. I could feel their eyes on me, their stares menacing and hostile. Once we entered the hall, I glanced behind me. Though the wall of bikers loitered at the edge of the hallway, eight were following us. Christine stopped abruptly, turned, and lifted her chin toward me. Put your hands on the wall and spread your legs. Clenching my jaw, I did as instructed, realizing we'd made it pretty far into the club without being frisked. My three brothers also complied. But then, after a half a minute, I heard Cletus say, That's silly string. I glanced over my shoulder, watching the interaction between Cletus and one of the bikers patting us down. What's it do? The biker asked. It's silly. Cletus responded. And it makes a mess. The club member glanced at Christine, and she shrugged, addressing her question to Cletus. You planning on making silly messes? No, ma'am. Then why do you have it? Just in case you have cameras in the room where we're being taken. She frowned at Cletus, her eyes narrowing. You planning on covering the lenses with silly string? Yes, ma'am. No, you ain't. She lifted her chin and the silly string was confiscated. Once the pat-down was complete, Christine led us further into the winding corridor. We descended a flight of stairs, passing more black walls and more black doors. Nothing was labeled and all the hallways looked the same. I had no idea how we were going to get out of here without a guide. With every step, my fear mounted, a sensation I wasn't accustomed to. Panic threatened to either choke me or send me into a blind rage. All I could think about was Jess, somewhere in this hellish labyrinth. But I stopped myself from imagining the worst, because if I did, then I would most certainly yield to blind rage. Finally, we stopped in front of a door. I strained my ears, heard voices on the other side, and the shot of adrenaline traveled through my system like a lightning bolt when I recognized one of the voices as Jessica's. I had to clench my jaw and ball my hands into fists to keep from charging forward. 
After you, handsome, Christine said, opening the door wide and giving me a sinister smile. I didn't need to be asked twice. I walked into the room and scanned it, my eyes immediately latching onto Jessica. She was sitting on a black leather couch and next to her was Claire. They both looked pissed, but unharmed. My chest eased. Some of the panic I'd been fighting dissipated. The girls weren't looking at us. They were looking at the man on the adjacent couch, a man I recognized as Razor Dennings, president of the Iron Wraiths. So you boys made it, he said without turning his head. Razor's eyes were on his daughter, but he lifted his chin toward Jess. I knew you'd come here if I invited your girl here for a visit. Jess's attention finally moved to where I stood, her eyes telling me most of what I needed to know. She wasn't surprised to see me, and she was scared and feeling stupid for some reason, trying to apologize without saying the words. I don't see why all this was necessary. Repo drawled. I glanced to my right, found him sitting on a stool in front of a black lacquer bar. He had a whiskey or a bourbon in front of him, but it looked untouched. I forced myself to see beyond my Jess tunnel vision and took a quick survey of the room. Besides the eight biker escort behind us, Razor and Repo, there were two other Wraiths members in the room, both as big as mountains. I recognized one as Catfish. I knew him because he liked to fish and sometimes went out with Hank Weller and Bo. He was difficult to overlook. This is all necessary, Repo, because you take too fucking long to get shit done. Christine spat as she strolled past me and crossed her old man, giving him a sloppy kiss and whispering something in his ear. I have the situation under control. Repo responded through gritted teeth, glaring at the back of Christine's head. Enough. This shit needs to be settled. Razor pushed his old lady aside and she fell into the couch. He stood, stepped over her legs like she was a nuisance, and scanned us. Razor was tall, but he wasn't big. He'd never been thick or burly. He was lanky and reeked of evil. Looking into his blue eyes, I'd always felt like I was looking at death. Repo had told me once, when I was just a kid and he was over for dinner, that Razor got the name from his preferred method for punishing insubordination. His dead eyes settled on me, his face without expression, and lifted his black beard. You. What's your answer? Yes or no? No. I didn't hesitate. This fucker was scary as hell, but bullshit and their delaying was only going to piss him off. No. He didn't sound surprised, more like he wanted to confirm my final answer. No. From the corner of my eye, I saw Repo's face fall into the palm of his hand and he shook his head. Razor nodded once, again with no expression. Then your brother is going to federal prison. But first, my boys are going to fuck you all up. No, I said again. None of that's going to happen either. You're going to give me a compelling reason, son? The first note of inflection entered his voice. He sounded interested, like he hoped I would surprise him. Yes. And what is that compelling reason? When Jethro installed the traps, he alerted the law, sent pictures of the cars, VIN numbers, and a letter stating he suspected the traps were being used for the transport of drugs. Razor's eyes narrowed just a tad, and something like a small smile made his lips curve. Is that so? Yes. If that's so, then why hasn't the law interfered with our operations? I paused, thinking about Cletus's confiscated silly string. He obviously thought we were being recorded or videotaped. I didn't want to say anything incriminating. No answer? Razor's smile grew. To my relief and surprise, Cletus stepped forward and answered for me. The law hasn't interfered with your operations because they've been informed... But they don't know it. The certified envelope is in a safe place at an off-site facility, and we have copies, including a receipt, dated three years ago, of the certified letter signed for by the law. All we need to do is place a phone call, or you could murder us. Say what? Repo asked. He'd abandoned his stool and crossed to stand next to his boss. Murder us. Cletus responded slow and loud like they were hard of hearing. If you murder us, then the police will also be notified about the location of the certified package, 
as well as other information pertaining to your activities. Other information? Repo sounded skeptical. Cletus nodded. Yes, that's right. I make a hobby of covert surveillance. And I imagine no one in this room wants the police to know what happened on the night of January 7th, two years ago. Razor's earlier humorless smile melted away. His eyes no longer looked dead. They looked murderous. Are you threatening me, boy? Not precisely. Cletus started, and I knew it was time for me to cut in before Cletus explained the semantic differences between a fact, a promise, and a threat. We're not here to threaten you. We're here to decline your offer. If you push the issue, then we'll have no choice but to call the law. I spoke plainly because it was clear the club president didn't respond well to anything but plain speaking. Now, we'd rather not do that, for obvious reasons. If you leave us alone, and Miss James and Miss McClure alone, then we'll have no reason to go sharing. Razor's eyes flashed as he returned his attention to me. I clenched my jaw, bracing for whatever came next. This guy was crazy enough to hold Jess, the sheriff's daughter, against her will. He was likely crazy enough to do much more than that. You don't think you can just walk out of here, do you, boy? I can't let y'all leave without one of you receiving a souvenir. I swallowed a fair amount of dread, but also relief. We would be walking out of here, not limping, not carried out on stretchers. Walking. If the rumors were to be believed, Razor's boon of choice was a cut, or several cuts, usually on the lower back and in a cross hash pattern. Sometimes he wrote his name. I could do that if it meant all of us, especially Jess and Claire, were going to walk out on our own two legs. I felt, rather than saw Cletus stiffen next to me, knew he was about to object, but I lifted my hand to stay his outraged speech and address the club president. Fine. I see you need to save face. That's fair. Jessica's strangled squeak met my ears and I ignored it, fought the urge to look at her. That's not fair, Cletus objected through clenched teeth. I'll do it. I stepped forward. Dwayne! Bo's protest was choked and I heard him say, No, I'll do it. A hand closed over my shoulder and I turned my head to find Jethro behind me, his eyes unusually serious. It should be me. The president pulled a straight razor from one of his pants pocket, flipping it open at the hinge. He was smiling again. Should I give y'all a few minutes to decide who gets the honor? No, Claire shouted, standing and bringing Jessica with her. No one will have the honor. There won't be any of that shit today. Dearest daughter, I didn't mean you would be leaving. Remember what I said. You ever come back here, you ain't leaving again. This is where you belong. She shook her head slowly and lifted her hand and that's when I saw the 9 millimeter handgun in her grip. My eyes darted to Jess, and despite looking scared, she didn't look surprised. She looked determined. In fact, at that very moment, she lifted her arm as well, and in her hand was another 9 millimeter. You didn't frisk her? Razor thundered at Catfish and the other mountain-sized biker. What the fuck is wrong with you? She's my daughter. Of course she's got a weapon. Truly. You could have knocked me over with a feather. We're leaving. Those Winston boys are coming with, and no one is getting carved today. Claire's voice was unnervingly calm. You try my patience, baby girl. Razor took a step toward his daughter, and she responded by flicking off the safety, murder in her eyes. He stopped dead in his tracks. You dare raise a gun to your daddy. Christine stood as well. Her eyes and voice were full of loathing. Like I said, we're leaving, and there will be no retribution either. Claire ignored her mama. She and Jess moved in unison to where we were standing. Jess's gun was trained on our eight biker escorts, and Claire was covering Razor, Repo, Catfish, and the other mountain-sized Wraith's member. Boss? Catfish questioned, his eyes darting between us and Razor. The club president squinted at his daughter for a long moment, his expression unreadable. At last, he shook his head. Let them go. All the way? Yeah, all the way. Razor nodded once, his eyes still on Claire as he addressed her. 
I'm only doing this because you're my blood, girl. I still got a soft spot for you. But don't you forget, you don't come back unless you plan to take your place. Claire shook her head, her lip curling with disgust. I won't be back. But don't you forget, Cletus ain't the only one who knows where those bodies are buried. Chapter 28 A good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. Lao Tzu Duane Claire saved us. She guided us out of the compound via a much faster route than the maze we'd taken. It exited through a pair of above-ground cellar-like doors, opening to the outside at the edge of the parking lot. The temperature had dropped in the last half hour, and we were dusted with big, fat snowflakes. Once we were all outside, Jessica handed her gun over to Jethro, her eyes cut into mine for the briefest of moments, and then the two of them were off running to Claire's truck, which was parked nearby. Wait! I started to follow, but Cletus stopped me with a hand on my arm. No time for that right now. Claire knows what she's doing. We need to leave. I pulled out of his grip. No, no fucking way. I need to see. Dwayne, let her go. We ain't got time for this and she ain't got time for this. Claire will keep her safe. I wasn't so sure. Not because I didn't trust Claire or have faith in her level of badass but I had a choking need to be the one to save Jess. I needed to see her to safety, witness it with my own eyes, hold her, and know with certainty she was okay. But Claire and Jess were already in the Nissan Frontier, and Claire was already maneuvering it out of the lot. Cursing, I nodded. Cletus was right, and I hated it. We sprinted to the GTO, Jethro covering us with the gun Jess had passed him. I heard rather than saw Claire's truck peel out and the engine rev as she sped away. The outside of the bar was vacant, no soul in sight. The four of us quickly piled into Bo's car and I sped off like a demon, hoping to never lay eyes on the godforsaken Iron Wraith's headquarters again. Twenty minutes later, no one had said a word, and we'd had no sighting of Claire's truck. I was still glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see motorcycles trailing us. But I didn't. I saw only tourists, rental cars, trucks, and campers. I couldn't stop thinking about Jess. We were just about 15 minutes from home, but I couldn't take it anymore. I needed to know she was safe. So I broke the silence. Jethro, I need you to call Claire. Find out where they are. I texted Claire five minutes ago. They're good. Jackson's meeting them at the James's house. He read them both the riot act over the phone, she said. Claire's staying with Jess for the night in their guest room. I blew out of breath, nodding, a new wave of relief passing through me. For the first time in my life, I was thankful Jackson James existed. Good. That's good. Jethro turned in his seat and addressed his question to Cletus. What I want to know is, what happened two years ago the night of January 7th? Cletus? That's the night Tommy Bronson went missing. A.K.A. Lube. Lube? Bo asked. I saw Cletus nod in my rearview mirror. Yeah, his biker name was Lube. An unfortunate nickname. But he got it because he was so slippery. You have proof? The wraiths killed him? No, I have no proof. I was bluffing. But everyone knows Razor did it. He waved his hand in the air like this was a fact, and this fact was common knowledge. Well, what I want to know is... Bo met my eyes in the mirror briefly before turning to Cletus. Why did you tell Razor all that stuff when you were so sure we were being recorded? About how the police have been informed about the traps but don't know. Can't he just use that to blackmail us again? Cletus took off his thick and unnecessary glasses, handed them to Bo. You see this? This is an FPV video scrambler. It renders recording equipment useless. They might have been recording us, but all they'll get is static. Jethro huffed a laugh and shook his head. Then what the hell was the silly string for? Like I said, it's silly, and it makes a mess. I like to be prepared for all eventualities. I didn't know what to say. Apparently neither did anyone else because everyone was silent. Naturally, my thoughts turned back to Jess. 
I needed to speak to her. Instinct told me to go to her, wrap her in my arms, and take her away from all this craziness. Take her back to our cabin and keep her there until things between us were sorted. I wanted her to look at me with certainty again. Not anger. Never hurt. But first, I needed a plan. You want us to drop you off at Jess's? I glanced at my oldest brother, then shook my head. Why the hell not? I tightened my grip on the steering wheel and gave Jethro my stony profile, and said nothing. I agree with Jethro. Cletus chimed in, then added, For the record. Me too, Bo agreed. Jethro continued to push when I remained silent. That woman loves you. I saw the way she looked at you when we walked in. Saw the fear in her eyes when you volunteered to get cut. I shook my head, rejecting his words. I have no plan. I've got nothing. I need to figure things out first. Figure out. Jethro cut me off. See, this is your problem. I don't have a problem. Yeah, you do. You're always planning, but getting nothing done, waiting for a sure thing. You love that woman? You go get her, Dwayne. You don't wait till the time is right. Pot? Meet Kettle. Bo's retort sounded almost cheerful. Shut it, Bo. We're not talking about me. Jethro turned in his seat, facing me, and added in a more persistent tone. She loves you something fierce. She does. You don't wait for that kind of love to cool off. Believe me, you strike while the iron is hot. It was the middle of the night, and I was about to throw rocks at the window of Sheriff James's house specifically at his daughter's window. Now, these were small rocks, pebbles really, and I wasn't trying to break anything. I just wanted her to let me inside. I didn't know what I was doing. This kind of recklessness was completely foreign to me. I had no plan, no idea if I was about to make things a hundred times worse. But something about Jethro's pushing, when he'd said, you don't wait for that kind of love to cool off, you strike while the iron is hot, rang true. Jethro's odd words of wisdom, plus a restlessness that felt like heartburn, pushed me to make my second spur-of-the-moment decision in the last month, the first being tricking Jessica James backstage at the community center. I jogged over to Jessica's house, with no strategy, no confidence that this would work, only knowing I needed to see her. I needed to make this right before she'd slept another night on the angry words between us, and decided I'd pushed her away too many times to forgive. I tossed three pebbles at her second-story window, waited, then threw two more. She didn't appear, so I tossed another two. I was worn with doubt and eyeballing the tree next to the house, considering the likelihood of climbing it without killing myself. When I saw her light flip on, I didn't know whether I was relieved or distraught when she opened the window. She poked her head outside, her long blonde hair dangling over one shoulder, and scanned the rooftop. Not allowing myself to think about it, I cut my hands to my mouth and loud whispered, Jess, down here. I saw her frown in my general direction, but no focus in her features. She couldn't see me. Dwayne, is that you? Yes, it's me. Her eyes were still searching for me as I again studied the hemlock tree next to the house. I decided to climb it. Where are you? I'm coming up. You're... What? I didn't answer because I was already climbing the tree. Now, this tree was really two trees, split down the middle. I was able to leverage myself between them using my upper body strength exclusively. Luckily, there was a branch just out of reach, so I jumped for it and grabbed on. Oh my god! I heard her whisper, and she sounded frantic. Please don't tell me you are climbing that tree. Hush, I'm almost there. I pulled myself up until I was finally kneeling on the branch. Dwayne Winston, you are the craziest person I've ever met. I don't think she meant for me to hear those last words, but her voice carried. They made me smile and gave me hope, because along with exasperated, they sounded affectionate. I climbed one more branch, though I wasn't sure it would hold my weight. It made a cracking sound just as I straightened and I heard Jess squeak, which made me laugh. Are you laughing? She accused with a harsh whisper. I can't believe you're laughing. After what happened tonight, you are the only person on the face of the earth who would laugh while risking a broken neck. 
Everyone knows hemlock trees aren't climbing trees. Her tirade continued as I stepped on the steepled roof and carefully made my way across. She was still fussing at me as I climbed into her window, keeping my footfalls as soundless as possible. All this risky behavior? You're going to kill yourself. Or I'm going to kill you for making me a witness to it. You are completely thoughtless about your own safety. I closed the window behind me and surveyed her room. I crossed to the light switch and flipped it off. Then I moved back to where she stood. Her hands were on her hips. The slant of her mouth was even more pronounced now that she was frowning. She was still talking, something about medical insurance and hoping I had a good policy. So I kissed her to hush her. And also because I needed to. I needed to know she was safe, whole, unharmed. I needed to feel her body, her heartbeat against my chest. I missed her. Oh, how I missed her. After a stunned second, she kissed me back. My fingers slipped under her nightshirt, another silk button-up that fell to her thighs, and hers fisted my sweater. I loved her petal-soft skin, her curves, how hot she felt beneath my hands. She burned up every place I touched. I needed to touch her everywhere. I loved her taste and how responsive she was, like she couldn't think past what we were doing. But then she stiffened and pushed me away, maybe just realizing what was happening. She turned and darted to the other side of the room, placing the bed between us. The back of her hand came to her mouth and Jess stared at me with big eyes. What are you doing here? She asked, shifting from foot to foot like she was ready to bolt. My mind wasn't prepared for talking, so I said stupidly, We didn't finish our conversation earlier. When? Before now. When before now? You mean when you walked out on me at the cabin? Her chin lifted, like my walking out was a sore spot for her. Or when we were trapped at the biker compound? Being reminded of the cabin made my chest hurt but being reminded of the danger I put her in at the compound made my blood pump cold and furious. Both, I managed through my self-loathing, hating she'd been in danger because of me. Now, in the middle of the night, at my parents' house? You know my daddy is the sheriff, right? Yes, I know. So, what's the plan, Dwayne? Do you think it's a good idea getting caught sneaking into the house of a man who shoots people for a living? I flattened my lips into a straight line so I wouldn't smile, because she sounded so serious. Your daddy doesn't shoot people for a living. Well, it's in his job description. I ignored her irrelevant but funny statement and put the conversation back on track. The truth is, I have no plan. I came here with no plan. And I know you can scream bloody murder at any moment and your brother and daddy will come flying in here, maybe with their guns, shooting first and asking questions later. But I need to talk to you, not later, right now. And I'm asking you to listen. She was frowning at me like she was concentrating, or torn, or both. Abruptly, she blurted. Tina showed me her phone over Thanksgiving. She implied you were calling and texting her because you wanted her back. We're still in love with her. I was never in love with Tina. She was convenient and willing and a headache. When I found out you were coming back to town, I called things off with her, and I haven't looked back. And you were right. I should have done it years ago. I believe you. I told her on Thanksgiving to go to hell, that I trusted you, she said, but she was frowning. But I don't understand. Why did you go to the Pink Pony last Friday? Did you really want her to spy on the raids? I stiffened. Where did you hear that? When Claire and I were downstairs in that room with her father. Claire's daddy told Repo that you and Bo had visited Tina at the Pink Pony last week. Asked her to spy on the raids. She was the reason I was even there tonight. She called me and pretended to be in trouble. Tina called you tonight? Yes. Well, she called late this afternoon while I was with Claire. Tina acted like she was in trouble and asked me to come to the bar to pick her up. But Claire's father said it was a setup. Tina set me up so you would go to the bar. Jess then proceeded to fill in the blanks, explaining that she'd called Sheriff James before approaching the bar and that Claire had insisted on bringing the guns. She also told me Repo didn't seem to have any idea that Jess was being used as bait. I'm sorry, I said, 
shaking my head and biting my tongue. What I wanted to say was, if I ever see your cousin again, I'm going to kill that bitch. For what? For getting you involved. For putting you in danger. That wasn't you. That was my shitty cousin. She waved away my apology. But I'd like to know what this was all about. I couldn't follow most of the conversation. Something about traps and drugs. I gathered a deep breath and returned her frown with one of my own. I needed to tell her the truth, but couldn't tell her the whole story. You don't want to tell me, she said. Her tone held a sharp edge of disappointment. You still don't trust me. No, I trust you. But part of the story isn't mine to share. I can tell you that the Iron Wraiths were blackmailing Bo and me for the last month or so, trying to get us to do something illegal. We'd been stalling, and I thought maybe Tina could help. She wouldn't return her calls or text messages, so Bo and I went to see her. I asked her for a favor. She said yes. What was the blackmail? Her frown deepened, and she appeared uneasy. I pulled my hand through my hair and scratched the back of my neck, knowing she wasn't going to like my answer. I can't tell you. She stiffened, her eyes narrowing into slits of distrust, so I quickly added, But I can tell you, it was about Jethro. It had nothing to do with Bo or me. Just Jethro. Her expression cleared and a knowing smile curved her pretty mouth on one side. Ah, that makes sense. I'm guessing it relates to some missing cars? Not exactly. Long story short, it turns out what they were trying to blackmail us with wasn't actually illegal. So we were going there tonight to set the record straight, tell the wraiths to back off. And Tina double-crossed you. I nodded. I never lied to you, Jess. Not about how I... What I want. I know. She responded softly, looking unhappy. I know you. My hands ached to hold her, touch her, but she was still so far away. Jessica glanced around her room and gathered a deep breath before lifting her eyes to mine. Thanks for coming here to clear up tonight's events. Uh, thanks. I acknowledged her thanks with a short nod and stared at her. Uncertainty clogged my throat. I didn't know what to do next. Well, you can use the front door instead of the tree if you want. My daddy isn't even home. Jackson is, but he's not going to make a fuss, especially if you're leaving. Her eyes dropped like she couldn't look at me anymore. I didn't want to leave. What I wanted to do was eliminate the distance between us. I hadn't taken any time to prepare, so I stood there, in the dark, watching her, knowing I needed to say something. So, finally, I said something. I don't want to let you down. I don't want to let anyone down. I don't want to take without asking permission or deserving what I get. I need to take responsibility. For me, for my family. I don't want any handouts or free rides. Once again, I had her eyes, but now she looked surprised. Her voice was halting as she asked, Is this why you won't even consider the possibility of coming with me? Because it wouldn't be like that. I'm the one who wants to travel. How could I ask you to pay for... Please, let me finish. She bit her lip and nodded, though I knew she held her tongue with a great deal of reluctance. I want to... I started stopped and shook my head because the word won't was wrong. I started again. I need to go with you. She gasped, her hand coming to her chest and her pretty lips parting in surprise. I had no earthly idea how she could be surprised. Even so, having confessed the truth, I said, You've been it for me since you threw my shorts in that tree and left me naked in the lake, laughing at your prank and my misfortune. Though I admit... I deserved it. You were right. I was trying to court you on our first date, nice and slow. I was trying to do everything right, guarantee my own success. I had a plan, one that wasn't ever going to work because I didn't take your dreams into consideration. Dwayne. And then I came up with a new plan. I thought if I could dictate the how and for how long we were together, then I would be able to walk away, risking nothing I can't live without. You were right again. I wasn't all in. I wasn't even half in. I was ready to leave the whole time, looking for a reason. Because every second we spent together was better than the last. 
Jessica took a step forward, like she wanted to rush over, but stopped herself and gathered a quick breath. We don't have to end. And I know I'm being selfish, asking you to leave when your roots are here. Unable to stand the distance between us, I crossed to her, needing her skin and warmth. But you did ask, and I'm glad you did, because I wouldn't have. I won't ask you to stay, and I would never ask to go with you. But since you asked her eyes grew round and she pressed her lips together like she was afraid to make a sound and she let me touch her she let me hold her in my hands and it felt so good i never wanted to let go since you asked and since i need you and if you're still willing i am i smiled down at my girl pulled her body against mine even though nothing was really resolved and we had no plan and i had no clue how this was going to work I said, then let's go. But what about the shop? What about your brothers? I've talked to Cletus and Bo. We'll work something out with the shop. You already talked to Cletus and Bo? About leaving? Yes. What will they do? We'll figure it out. They want me to be happy. But do you think you'll be happy? Really? I've been thinking we could compromise. Stay here during the school year and travel over the summer. I'm not okay with that. I'm not asking you to compromise your dreams. But what about your dreams? You're it. She blinked, her mouth parting a whisper. You're it, Jessica James. And that's the truth. Not racing or going fast. Not fixing up old cars. I want to spend my life with you. And maybe that makes me wrong in the head and unhealthy or old-fashioned. But when I think of my future and what I want, all I see is you. Her smile was wide and hopeful, so the tears in her eyes didn't alarm me much. Seeing her so happy took my breath away. And looking at her now, something in me shifted. Actually, it was more than that. It was a blow to my chest, an earthquake, a fundamental rearranging of my foundation. Not thinking about anything other than what I wanted right then, at that moment, I kissed her. I kissed her like I meant it, because I did. I kissed her and moved my hands under her shirt to the hot skin of her stomach. I pressed my hips against her lower belly and tugged at her underwear, grabbing and squeezing handfuls of her body as I worked them down her thighs. She gasped against my mouth as my hand cupped her sweet spot and stroked her with my middle finger, a long, assertive touch. Fucking hell, I wanted her beneath me, needed it. I needed her fighting sweet moans as I filled her, her hands held hostage, bare to me, taking and claiming this woman as mine. I wanted her fast and hard, and I wanted her slow and sweet. Dwayne! She pushed lightly against my chest, breathing my name on an exhale. Wait a minute, wait, what are you doing? My mama's right downstairs, Claire's next door. I filled my other hand with the weight of her breast and massaged her through the silk of her shirt, all the while fondling her heat. I want you, I said simply. Maybe I paired it with a growl to show my desperation. Her big eyes moved between mine with a question, even while her breathing came in short, chaotic bursts, her hips rocking against my hand. Was this part of your plan? She panted. Jess, like I said earlier, I have no plan. All I know is I need inside you. Now, I want you. And I'm not thinking about who's downstairs or next door. Her pretty mouth slanted upwards with a dreamy smile, even as a shudder and breath escaped her lungs. You're really going to climb in my bedroom window in the middle of the night and have sex with me in my parents' home? Yes, that's what I'm doing. I bent to claim her mouth again, but she tilted her head to the side, giving me a sly gaze. Jessica's hand smoothed from my shoulder, down my chest. Then she grinned, cupping and rubbing me through my jeans with her palm. I didn't want her teasing. I wanted satisfaction. I pushed her, advanced until her knees hit the bed and she was forced to fall backwards on the mattress. She gazed up at me with enormous, excited eyes, her mouth slightly parted. Take your shirt off, I said, nudging her knees apart, and open your legs. I dispatched my shirt, took off my boots, unbuttoned and unzipped my jeans, and pushed them to the ground. 
All the while, her hungry stare watched me undress. And fuck me. I loved it. Jess's fingers unfastened her buttons, giving me a glimpse of the valley between her breasts, and she whispered, Dwayne, you're being terribly disrespectful. I climbed between her spread thighs, spreading her wider, stroking her need with mine, then whispered in her ear, If you're willing, I'd like to disrespect you all night long. What are you thinking about? I blinked at the ceiling. Her question unexpected only because we'd been laying in silence for so long. We should have been asleep. I was tired enough. And though we were still in her bedroom and I just spent the last three hours disrespecting the hell out of her, my mind was finally content. Yet she kept reaching for me, mostly for kisses and touches, petting and embracing. And I wasn't inclined to deny Jessica anything. So I waited for her to settle, for her to relax her to sleep, and I used the time to appreciate the feel of her in my hands. I was just thinking, your skin is awfully soft, I answered honestly. Really? Jess's leg was between mine and she was on her stomach, one arm over my chest. Her face was turned toward my neck and I felt her breath against my shoulder. Yep. She propped her elbow on the mattress and lifted her head, held her cheek in her hand and gazed down at me. Do you want to know the name of my moisturizer? I can get you some. Maybe for Christmas. A stocking stuffer? I made sure my expression was as flat as my tone. My stocking doesn't need stuffing. She gave me a little smile, one that didn't quite reach her eyes. I would have missed the subtle sadness if I hadn't been able to see so well in the dark. Jessica shifted like she was going to lay down again, but I stopped her by gripping her arm. Hey, What's wrong? She blinked. Can you see my face? Yes. How can you see my face? It's pitch black in here. I just can. Why don't you tell me what you're thinking? Can you see in the dark? Now her eyes were narrowed. I'll answer you when you answer me. Jess hesitated, and in her hesitation I saw more unhappiness. My chest constricted with dread. But... Then she said, My Aunt Louisa, she was my mother. Before I had an opportunity to process these words, her face crumpled and she sucked in a breath. Tears and sobs soon followed. Jessica flung herself down on me and I automatically wrapped her in my arms. I was confused, but once I'd sorted out what she'd said, I was mostly astonished. She was your mother? Jess nodded, burrowing herself against my neck. How long have you known? Just found out last Thursday, came her muffled response. I cursed, holding her tighter, my chest again constricting. I wasn't one for regrets, but if I could have rewound the last week and done everything over, I would have. I'm so sorry. I should have. I'm so sorry. She shook her head and pulled away, sniffling. No, no, it's fine. Really. It's just, I should have been there for you. I should have gone to Texas for the funeral. She continued as though I hadn't spoken or she hadn't heard me. It's just, I don't know why she never told me, you know. She gave me to her sister, treated me like an employee every time I visited. Which, technically, I was. I know that. But I don't understand why she didn't want me to know until it was too late. What does Mrs. James say? Or the sheriff? Jessica's eyes came back to mine and she wiped a tear from her cheek, her lips pressing into a wobbly smile. My daddy says it changes nothing. He says I'm his. Have been since the day I was born and he held me. Though it was a strange thing to remark upon while naked in bed with Jessica under the man's roof, I said, I've always liked Sheriff James. She nodded, then continued. Mama says Louisa never gave her a reason. One day... Louisa called and said she was pregnant. Said she wanted to give the baby up for adoption, but wanted to check with her first to see if she wanted me. And your mama and the sheriff wanted you? Yes, they did. And mama said Louisa never wanted to talk about it. About me. She heaved a watery breath. My birth mother didn't want me. And when she was alive, she... She made me feel so inferior. 
Is it wrong I'm so sad about this? Is it strange that it hurts so much? I shook my head, cupped her cheeks between mine, and gave her a firm kiss before responding. No, it's not wrong. Our situations aren't the same, but I might as well have been a goat to my father. Jessica half laughed, half sighed. The Wayne? It's true. All his kids were property to him. He didn't want us, except when he did. I know a thing or two about being left, discarded. But I've had my whole life to grow accustomed to it. Even in her sadness, Jessica grew fierce and angry. Your daddy is a pathetic excuse for a human being, not worth your time or thought. If he couldn't see how amazing you are, then he should be horse-whipped, then covered in paper cuts and lemon juice, then shot, then... Hey now, Annie Oakley, settle down. I slipped my fingers through her hair and brought her cheek back to my chest. All I'm saying is that you get to live through this however you decide. There's no right or wrong. She nodded and heaved a full breath. I don't know if I want her money. It feels like a payoff. Her words settled around us, both heavy and light, making me frown and smile. She was so stubborn. If you want my vote, I think you should take the money. Hmm. My smile widened. Just because it came from bad beginnings doesn't mean it can't be put to good use. How about I only take it if you agree to spend it with me? Nice try, Jess. She shrugged. It was worth a shot. We were silent for a stretch. Though we were two people, in that moment we were really one unit. We were unified. I didn't like Jess having this new sorrow, but I was glad to help. Maybe it was selfish on my part, but I liked that she needed me. As though reading my thoughts, Jess kissed my chest and said on a sigh, You know, you're essential to me now, right? There's no escape, Dwayne Winston. Good. I felt her small smile, still a bit sad against my skin. Do you promise? Do you promise you'll always take my calls? Do you promise you'll always be there for me when I need you? Yes, I responded straight away. No matter what? No matter what or when, I promise. With that said, Jessica settled. She relaxed. She fell asleep. And so did I. Chapter 29 It is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters most in the end. Ernest Hemingway Jessica One month later I was nervous. With Bethany Winston's passing, Ashley was now the matriarch of the Winston family, and I really wanted to make a good impression. I'd known Ashley, Dwayne's only sister, when I was a kid. She and Jackson had been real good friends growing up, and I'd been his annoying younger sister gawking at the local beauty queen. I hadn't seen her in years, almost a decade. And now she was home for Christmas. Dwayne had spent all of Christmas Eve up at Drew Ruinus's house on Bandit Lake with his brothers, Drew, Ashley, and some of Ashley's friends from Chicago. He'd invited me, but I'd felt strange about it. I figured the family needed time together to remember their mama without the introduction of new girlfriends. But I did accept Dwayne's invitation for Christmas Day. Therefore, I was nervous. Basket Case by Green Day was on repeat in my head. I'd been so anxious I'd made four pies and hadn't checked first before stepping out of my shower. Sir Edmund Hillary, once again, had tried to murder me with his litter box. Dwayne came over for Christmas brunch, visited with my daddy, and swapped dirty looks with Jackson. When I was satisfied that the man time had been adequate, I pulled him into the kitchen and showed him my pies, asking which one he thought Ashley would like best. He shrugged one shoulder, kissing my cheek, then the back of my hand, entwining our fingers and drawing me close. Ashley likes all kinds of pie, as far as I know. These look great. I sighed, lamenting his lack of specificity and helpfulness. Well, then, maybe pie isn't the answer. Pie is always the answer. He grinned down at me, lowered his mouth to mine, and gave me a sweet, soft kiss. You need to relax. Ash is good people. She's going to love you. I swallowed, pressing my lips together. It's just 
I'd really like for us to be friends. I mean, if she's moving back here from Chicago in March, then I'd like for us to... She is moving back. She and Drew will probably get married sometime this year, start working on a dozen kids of their own. Dwayne's mouth hooked to the side and his gaze grew fuzzy and warm. I squeezed his hand, the look on his face making me feel fuzzy and warm. Over the last month, Dwayne and I had been making plans. Lots and lots of plans. I hadn't expected him to embrace the idea of world traveling with such gusto, but he had. He texted me links during the day, articles or blog posts discussing potential destinations for our world tour or travel tips for non-tourists. When asked, he flat out told me he wanted to go to Italy first, specifically Maranello. In fact, he'd purchased the Rosetta Stone software and started learning how to speak Italian. I was confused by his choice until I realized Maranello is the home of Ferrari and the Scuderia Ferrari Formula One racing team, of course. So, that was our plan. We found a few villas for rent just outside of Modena, an ancient city in North Italy dubbed the Capital of Engines, and Duane was researching potential employment possibilities. I didn't know Ashley and Drew were a thing, not until you told me two days ago. When did that happen? When Mama was sick and Ashley was down here taking care of her at the end of the summer. But I don't reckon either of them were ready to admit it. Not until a few days ago. A pair of dummies, both of them, wasting all that time. We should have just locked them in a room together back in September. I smirked at his pronouncement. You know, the same could be said for us. We wasted a lot of time, too. Dwayne's gaze cut to mine, and his mouth was curved in a half-frown, half-smile. And whose fault was that? Yours, I answered immediately. His eyes narrowed, but now the curve of his mouth was a full smile. That's right, and don't let me forget it. We held two pies each, and I carefully picked my way along the path leading to the Winston's front porch. I was in my fancy boots and didn't want to track mud into the house, so I tried to step on thicker patches of dying grass to avoid puddles. The tops of the mountains were blanketed in snow. However, moderate morning temperatures lower down in the valley had melted most of the overnight precipitation, leaving some ice on the ground, but mostly just cold mud. I glanced toward the house and smiled, seeing that the Winston boys had left up the garlands, holly and white twinkling lights lining the porch and the roof on the house. As well, the wreath I'd made still dawned the front door. I'd been over to the house last week to make dinner with Duane and had been appalled by their lack of holiday decor. They didn't even have a Christmas tree. That night, Duane had made chicken and dumplings. Meanwhile, I tasked the brothers, set them to work adding wreaths and lights and garlands to the house facade, as well as the big staircase and fireplace. Cletus, in particular, had grumbled the entire time, calling me an interfering female. I wondered if they'd kept the bow of mistletoe hanging up between the kitchen and the dining room. Regardless, despite the mess of the front yard, the grand old house looked great, festive and welcoming. It does look nice, Duane said at my shoulder. I saw he was looking at me, reading my expression in my mind. Yes, it does. I'm glad we took the time to do it. Me too. Thanks for being such a bully. I flattened my expression. I wasn't a bully. I was merely a persistent peddler of holiday cheer. You told Bo if he didn't help put up the Christmas lights on the roof, then you wouldn't make him apple pie ever again. I shrugged, climbing the steps to the porch. So? He needed some persuasion. And he's a complainer. Dwayne laughed, a good, robust, rumbly chuckle, and the sound made me smile. Besides, I added, he only complains and resists because he likes being threatened. Is that so? Yes, he needs a firm hand. Dwayne stopped laughing, but I heard teasing in his retort. You keep your firm hands where they belong. And where is that? On my drive shaft. Now I barked a laugh, almost dropping the pumpkin pie in my left hand, then snorted because I was laughing so hard. Dirty automotive double entendres were now my favorite. I remembered my nerves just as Dwayne leaned around me and knocked on the front door with his boot, calling, Open up! Our hands are full of pie! 
Not three seconds later, almost as though he'd been lying in wait, the door flung open, revealing a grinning Jethro in a hideous reindeer sweater. Well, hello, beautiful. Before I understood what was happening, Jethro bent down, wrapped his arm around my waist, and planted a big old kiss on me. My eyes bulged and frantically cut to Duane, who looked startled at best, murderous at worst. I felt Duane's boot brush past my leather-clad calf on its way to administering a swift kick to his eldest brother. What the hell are you doing? Duane's boot must have connected with Jethro's shin, because the kiss abruptly ended with Jethro stumbling back two steps, his grin now a happy grimace. Ow, damn that hurt! Duane stepped in front of me, balancing a pie in each hand, and bellowed, I didn't know you wanted a broken nose for Christmas, Jethro. Relax, Duane. Jethro laughed, bending over to rub his shin as he pointed toward the ceiling. We moved the mistletoe, it's right there. Duane, you're standing under the mistletoe and you have pie. This comment came from Cletus, who'd appeared out of nowhere, swooped forward and grabbed a pie out of Duane's hand. Then he called over his shoulder, disappearing with the pie. I'd kiss you, but I don't want our beards to tangle. Duane glanced at the ceiling briefly, then back to Jethro. I could see my man was not amused. Meanwhile, I had to roll my lips between my teeth to keep from laughing. Bo sauntered over, leaning to the side and giving me a smile, though he addressed Duane. Well, come in, dummy. Don't keep your woman waiting out in the cold. Duane shoved the remaining pie at Bo. Then he turned, took both pies out of my hands, and gave them to Jethro. Then he turned again, wrapped an arm around my waist, and kissed me. Actually, he kissed and dipped me. My arms automatically went to his neck, and I kissed him back with fervor. When we finally straightened, I was dizzy and smiling like a well-kissed goof. There, now she's been kissed under the mistletoe. Duane pressed me close to his side. No need for any more liberties. She's been kissed under that mistletoe. Jethro corrected, his mischievous hazel eyes, which looked almost green this evening, shifting to mine just before he gave me a wink. But we got mistletoe all over the house. You can thank Jess for the original idea and Cletus for running with it. I felt Duane's hold on me tighten, saw his jaw work and clench just before he abruptly pulled me forward, giving his brothers the stink eyes we passed. Come on, Jess. Where are we going? We're going to find all the mistletoe in the house and disarm it. We'd managed only a few steps before the sound of new arrivals made him stop and turn. Ashley Winston and Drew Ruinous had arrived. The Winston boys grew suddenly both alert and boisterous, pulling their sister in for hugs and passing her around like she was a national treasure. The noise brought Billy, Cletus, and Roscoe out from wherever they'd been hiding, not that they'd actually been hiding— I suspected Roscoe had been hovering near the front door, probably ready to pounce on me as part of their staged practical joke. Billy and Cletus came from the direction of the kitchen, so I guess they'd been busy cooking. It was nice to see that all the Winston boys appeared to be just as eager to greet Drew as they'd been to greet their sister, passing out profuse handshakes, smiles, and salutations of Merry Christmas. I stood stock still and waited for my turn, certain I looked like an indecisive statue as I debated what to do with my hands. Did I try to give her a handshake? Or was I expected a hug? Or some combination of both? Kiss on the cheek? Kiss on both cheeks? Drew made it to us first. I'd seen him only a handful of times before and always from a distance at the community center for jam night. He played the acoustic guitar and sang when the occasion called for it, but he wasn't the outgoing sort. If he wasn't singing or playing guitar, he wasn't making noise. As well, Drew Ruinous was a tall man, taller than all the Winston boys by an inch or more. His beard was bushy and blonde, and his eyes were a steely gray. He reminded me of the Viking god Thor, if Thor had been a reclusive federal game warden from Texas with excellent manners. Dwayne, Drew said as they shook hands, and Dwayne bestowed one of his rare smiles on his friend. Drew, do you know Jessica James? Drew's attention swung to me, and he offered his great paw. Jessica James, you teach at the high school, and your daddy is the sheriff. I nodded, slipping my fingers into his, expecting a firm and efficient handshake. Instead, he held my hand in his, not moving it. 
That's right. I teach math. She teaches calculus, Cletus said from someplace, and she doesn't grade on a curve. I laughed lightly, and Drew gave me a smile that made his eyes shine. Then he pulled me forward into an unexpected bear hug. Welcome to the family, Jessica, the big man said as he set me away, sounding and looking more sincere than a man had a right to sound or look. To my astonishment, I felt my chin wobble. I didn't get a chance to respond because Ashley was there, bumping him out of her way with her hip, saying, Jessica James, is your cat still trying to kill people? I opened my mouth to respond, but she cut me off by pulling me into a warm, soft, lovely-smelling hug. In truth, she smelled like pancakes. Delicious, buttery, fluffy, vanilla pancakes. And when she'd finished with our tight embrace, she slipped her arm through mine and pulled me away from the congregation of beards, walking us toward the living room. You're a sight for sore eyes. I'm so glad you're here. I was hoping to see you yesterday, but I understand you had a family commitment. Dwayne was telling me about your plans to go to Italy in the summer, and then after that he said something about Greece? Yes, but Greece might be next year, depending on how long we stay in Italy. Well, if you're still in Italy next summer, then maybe I can talk Drew into a trip. She grinned down at me, her big blue eyes excited. I've always wanted to go, and there's this yarn from Italy, 100% cashmere, called S. Charles Collezione. I turned and glanced over my shoulder as Ashley told me about this special yarn she wanted to procure from Italy, and I found Duane standing next to Drew. The two men were watching us with mirrored expressions of amusement and adoration. I gave Duane a bright smile, which he returned, and I found myself truly at a loss. He was giving this up. This amazing family, with their holiday pranks and steady love and support, just to be with me, just to travel the world and share adventures. I felt both astonished and blessed. But most of all, I was humbled. He was giving up his home. And so I made him a silent promise that he'd never regret giving up so much, not for one second. Duane went through the house and systematically removed all the mistletoe. Well, all the mistletoe he could find. He missed a bunch in the pantry and had to fight his way to the front of the line to rescue me from his brothers, all of whom had lined up except Billy. Billy had caught me earlier under another bunch hanging just outside the downstairs bathroom. However, like a gentleman, he'd been content with a kiss on the cheek. Ashley pocketed every bunch Duane removed, slipping them into her bag. She planned to hang them up all over Drew's house. She wanted to catch him unawares for the next week before she had to fly back to Chicago. She really was planning to move back to Tennessee and hoped to return for good no later than the end of March. I was glad to hear it because it would give us a few months of getting acquainted before Duane and I were off. Plus, I still thought these boys needed someone. They needed a good woman to keep them safe, and Ashley already loved them with her heart and soul. Dinner was nice. Actually, it was great. The boys were lively and animated, telling stories about Ashley and Duane, hoping to embarrass their siblings. This may have worked for Ashley, but I already knew most of the stories they told about Duane. Therefore, I didn't hesitate jumping in and adding details they missed. My eagerness earned me high fives from his siblings, but only heated glares from Duane, and it was totally worth it. Each hot look ignited a simmering thrill low in my belly because each promised delicious retribution. I had a feeling I was going to enjoy his version of revenge. After dinner, I served my four kinds of pie. When all the dust settled, not a single slice remained— Truly, there is no feeling quite like making four pies and leaving with no leftovers. Dessert was followed by an impromptu family concert. Cletus played his banjo and Drew accompanied on his guitar, while Billy and Ashley sang folk duets of Christmas classics. They looked like twins, Ashley and Billy, and their harmonies were beautiful, like they'd been singing together all their life, like they knew each other from the inside out. I guess when I reflected on it, they did. From the time the music started until it ended, Duane had me wrapped in his arms on his lap. I leaned into him, enjoying his easy affection. 
He touched me with contentment, with wistful sighs and smiles, melting my heart with each cherishing pass of his fingers through my hair and stroke of my back. Midnight came and went. At around 1.30 a.m., Duane told me it was time to go. Leaving took another twenty minutes as sleepy hugs were handed out, and Ashley made me promise to have lunch with her before she flew back to Chicago. The entire brood gathered on the porch to wave as Duane pulled the Mustang out of the drive and turned on Moth Run. I yawned, eyeballing Duane in his bucket seat. I miss the road, runner, I said, my words a little slurred because I was dead tired. Why? Because it was a bench seat. This car has bucket seats. Fair point. He nodded solemnly, then took the turn off for the cabin. I gave him a small smile and shook my head. He hadn't mentioned we'd be staying the night at the cabin, hadn't discussed his plans with me, but I couldn't say I was surprised. He'd been doing this with regularity over the last month, taking us out to his fortress of solitude. Sometimes we'd have picnics, go on walks, talk, play cards— the cabin was where we'd discuss my Aunt Louisa and my feelings on the subject. I'd lost it a few times, cried tears I didn't know I needed to cry, and he'd held me close, reassuring me that I was wonderful and her absence in my life was her loss. I talked through my messes and he listened, giving advice if and when I asked. He talked through his frustrations and I listened, giving advice if and when he asked but most of the time we ripped each other's clothes off. Yep, that's what we did. And I finally got to spend some quality time with his buttocks, thighs, and calves. They were wonderful. Dwayne pulled up to the stone steps and cut the ignition, then jogged around to my side of the car. I was barely on my feet before he swept me up into his arms and kicked the door closed behind him. I snuggled against his broad chest and placed a kiss on his neck, Meanwhile, he had the keys ready and unlocked the cabin door, crossed to the bed, and placed me gently on top of the covers. I sat up and fumbled to remove my clothes, the room spinning a tad, likely the effect of too much moonshine eggnog in the late hour. Dwayne quickly built a fire and turned back to me when he was done, giving me a pleased grin when he saw I was naked except for my socks. "'Get under the covers,' he said, peeling off his own clothes." I did as he instructed. My eyes were heavy, but I managed to keep them open long enough to watch him undress. Sleepy tipsiness meant I was saying and thinking in tandem. I like watching you take off your clothes. It's like unwrapping a present. My stream of consciousness nonsense was rewarded with a broad smile, his glittering sapphire eyes just visible in the dim cabin. How do you think I feel? Having you to myself, naked, it's like winning the lottery. I giggled at this and turned my face into the soft pillow. A moment later, the bed dipped and I felt him climb in next to me, one of his legs moving between mine, his strong arms bringing my chest against his and his hands smoothing down my body. Go to sleep, Jessica, he whispered as he stroked my hip. Go to sleep and have sweet dreams. So, dream of you and your hot looks, I mumbled, relaxing into his skin, my eyes already closed. His hand paused on my hip, and I felt his lips curve against my temple. Or dream of you and your sexy back talk. His smile grew. Or dream of you and your goodness, your yeah, irksome integrity. This earned me a chuckle and a squeeze. Or maybe I'll just dream of us, like this, forever. I shifted against him so I could get closer. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll dream of home. Is this place home? He kissed my cheek and I discerned the lingering smile in his voice. No, Duane. I shook my head and confessed just before tumbling into blissful sleep. You are. The End I'm Chris Brinkley, and along with Joy Nash, produced the audio version of Penny Reed's Truth or Beard. Soon after production was completed, 
Penny and I sat down and discussed the book. My first question for Penny was, what was the inspiration for Truth or Beard and the Winston Brothers series? My parents have a house up in Tennessee, and we visit them every summer for about one or two weeks. And while we were up there, I guess about two summers ago, I um, we go to church up there. We go to the jam session that's at the community center on Friday nights. We go to the dulcimer shop, and um, because there is a dulcimer shop uh, near where they live, and they serve fried pie, which is interesting. But the people up there are so fantastically genuine, and really their own separate character and so different from any place else I've ever lived. So really it was the people in the area of Merrillville and there's a, I don't know if I should admit this, but there's a city called, uh, or an area called Happy Valley, Tennessee. And we were driving from my parents' house to the jam session on a Friday night and we, there was this house that was several acres and backed right up against the park and it was this really cool old house and they had all these machine parts around the house and and then there was also like a sewing machine in the front yard like all set up as though somebody were sewing and i tried to imagine what kind of family lived in that house and i that's when i decided that i was going to write ashley's book that she was going to go back down to tennessee but it couldn't just be just her house there had to be a lot of different kinds of odd characters who live there as well. So that's when I came up with the idea of she'd have to have six brothers and they'd all have to have beards because everywhere we went in Tennessee, everybody had a beard. So um, that's kind of it. I started daydreaming about the house. Penny, do you, do you have any brothers? And if so, did that help you write about brothers? <laughs> yes, I do. I have two older brothers and I hope they never hear this interview. But a lot of my experiences with my brother's they're older, as I said, and in terms of just being, and no offense, but just being gross, just like total, just being gross. And so they they were the inspiration for a couple of the scenes that took place both in Beauty and the Mustache and then also Truth or Beard. I used to make, my, well, my dad has this recipe for pancakes and they're French pancakes. And what you do is you add the egg whites at the very end. And my... um my second oldest brother, he was always after my dad on how to make those pancakes. And it just became somewhat of a joke in our house because um, he called them fluffy blueberry clouds of awesomeness. So, yeah, I, I drew I drew upon my uh, experience with my brothers a lot. Penny, I'm always intrigued when a female author writes first person male or vice versa. And that has to be a challenge for you. But again, as the narrator of this book and as Dwayne the male... So many times you got it just right. I mean, I thought to myself, Penny wrote this, but this is just exactly what a guy like Dwayne would say. <laughs> How challenging was it for you to do that? Well, it was really challenging. This was only the second book I've ever written where I wrote from the male perspective. And I put it off for a really long time. I didn't really want to write the male perspective because I didn't feel like I could do it correctly. I mean, what do I know about being a guy? So just some tricks that I did was um, actually had my husband read it and he'd say things like, yeah, guys don't think like that. But also he would give me a couple of lines of dialogue instead. And then I would use that as a seed into maybe the male perspective. But I think he got tired of doing it because I think he thought I was psychoanalyzing him after a while. And I kind of was. I mean, to be fair, I was. But it's not terribly easy for me. And when I, interestingly enough, when I write from the male perspective, I start getting really surly and short-tempered. So sometimes my husband will ask me, so you're writing for a guy today, right? And it's like, yes, yes, I am. So, yeah, but it's fun. It's it's a challenge. One other thing you did, I mean, each chapter is from either Jessica's point of view or Dwayne's point of view. And even though the plot continues, I was interested that you picked Jessica to do some chapters that I thought might be Dwayne's and vice versa. How did you decide now in this part of the plot it needs to be from Jessica's point of view or from Dwayne's? Well, the first question you have to ask yourself is, well, obviously, is this the only character in the scene? So obviously, if the other character isn't in the scene, then it needs to be from the character's perspective who is in the scene. So that's the easy, that was the easy part. But then when they're both together, I would choose whichever character would heighten the suspense most, meaning that if it, if it were in the best interest of 
from the reader's perspective to feel more suspect. Oh, I don't, I don't know how to. No, I understand. You didn't go with the obvious, right? So I, I, I didn't go with the obvious because it's important when you're plotting or pacing a book that the reader always be kept in the back of your mind, and so I didn't want the reader to have all the answers to begin with. I wanted there to be some element of mystery, which keeps the reader continuing to read. But also, the reader is allowed to then draw their own conclusions about what, let's say, Dwayne is thinking or what Jessica is thinking. And then I like either proving them wrong or proving them right. And um, it's gratifying to be right, but it's also fun to be wrong. So that, I guess that was what was in the back of my mind was building the suspense. You did that so well in this book with the mystery aspect. And the neat thing to me about this book is there are so many different genres that are woven together in Truth or Beard. Romance, mystery, drama, comedy, quirky, <laughs> male point of view, female point of view. Uh, is, is that the way you like to write? I do like to write with lots of different genres because I, I think when a person is reading a book or when my readers read books or when I read a book, I don't like to be spoon fed and I don't like to feel like the author thinks I'm stupid. <laughs> so I um, treat my readers the same way. I, uh, I assume that they're intelligent. I do like writing like that. I like for there to be a lot of interesting things going on in a particular book. I also really enjoy having uh, some element of current events in the book in whatever book I'm writing. And so the mystery portion of the book really came from an article I read in The Economist about a man in Los Angeles who used to put traps in people's cars, the um, secret compartments. And he ended up getting into big trouble with the federal government and is now serving a life sentence because he put these traps in cars. And so ultimately the question was, who is responsible for, in terms of technology, who holds the onus of uh, how that technology is being used? Is it the person who creates the technology or is it the person who uses the technology? And I wanted that to be actually a larger part of the book, but I ended up having to kind of scale back on that. But typically with any book, there is some sort of central current event theme that's going on, and I try to weave that into whatever action is taking place, whatever romance or, as you say, quirky part of the book. And that's because I know people like to think. I know my readers like to think and they like for there to be surprise and something that they weren't expecting. They don't really want a formula and I don't really enjoy writing a formula. So yeah, there's a lot going on. On top of your plot, Penny, your characters are so real. Um, I feel like I know them. As a writer, how do you make them jump off the page like you do? I am an observer of people. So a lot of the dialogue that makes it into my books that my readers pick up on as, you know, this this really sounds like something somebody would say is typically something somebody has said. And so I carry a notebook around with me and whenever I pilfer conversations for content <laughs> really is the short answer. Uh, whenever... I go out with friends or whenever I meet with family, I'm listening to the conversation, but I've always been that way. I listen to conversations to use it for, well, because I've always written short stories. So I'd always use the content of the conversation to enhance whatever character I was writing at the time. If I ever encounter writer's block, then typically what I'll do is go call my friends and ask if they want to go hang out. And they're all really wonderful fantastic, intelligent human beings, and typically will end up laughing over lunch. So I guess the reason is because a lot of the dialogue comes from actual people. So are you that person sitting alone in a restaurant <laughs> also listening to the people at the table beside you? <laughs> no, that's, that's uh, you know, not yet. Let's just say not yet, <laughs> because I may one day become that super creeper person who just goes around and eavesdrops on conversations. I don't want to rule anything out. I feel like I shouldn't rule that out yet unless I can get arrested for it. In that case, I will. I don't think you can get arrested for eavesdropping on people. I don't think so. Well, no. OK. Well, in that case, maybe after this, I'll go to the Starbucks and see what everybody's <laughs> talking about. But uh, no, not yet. Not yet. But um, as I say, I'll never rule it out <laughs> as a source of. Well, it's really for the benefit of the reader, isn't it? So That's right. That's yeah. right. It's all in service. Totally to, justified. That's right. Completely justified. Let's talk about these characters, uh, Penny. First, I want to talk about Jessica. Tell me about Jessica. 
So Jessica is actually based on a friend of mine from college who had Fenwa and didn't really recognize it until after she'd gotten married and realized that she'd made a mistake that this individual she'd married, who was a wonderful, fantastic human being, she just didn't want to be married. She didn't want to stay in one place. And she felt very unhappy. And so, well, she ended up getting a divorce. But the character of Jessica, that honesty, that the Fenwa, the need to travel, the need to see places, uh, the heart never really being content or happy, that was all based on my friend. And it, she's a fascinating individual because she's joined the Peace Corps and she's lived in Madagascar and South Africa and she speaks five languages, but she's restless and she's always moving. And so I thought it would be interesting to write a character similar to that. What what is that person? How does that person think? And how can you justify that in a society where staying put and forming roots is really what's considered normal? Yeah, Jessica was an interesting character for me to write because I am such a hermit and <laughs> I don't like leaving the house. So to write a character who really had that hunger to travel was uh, interesting for me. And I hope that I did her justice. She's very likable, and I think we all pull for her to ultimately to live the life that she wants and needs to, to live. Yeah. yeah. I I mean, I, I think about my friend, and I didn't really understand her decisions when I was younger. But um, as I have aged and see that it takes all kinds of people that make up this great world that we have, um, she just became really fascinating and fantastic to me. Now tell me about Dwayne. Dwayne is also a very interesting character, although in different ways. Yes. So something about Dwayne uh, in the original story. So in Beauty and the Mustache, he is the brother that everybody forgets existed in the book in Beauty and the Mustache. When I told my readers that I was going to be writing the Winston Brothers series, they were all very excited. And they were hoping that the first book would be Cletus or Billy or Bo or Jethro or Roscoe, but nobody mentioned Dwayne. And I really liked that the first book in the series would be about the brother that everybody forgets. And what is that guy like? Who? What is that guy like who everybody forgets? <laughs> He's so quiet and unassuming and not demanding and um, just really happy with who he is and what he's up to and doesn't need the attention. And so I think we all know people who are like that, that you forget that person was at the party or you forget to put them on your Christmas list just because they're never demanding. They never require your attention. But when you give it to them, it's always such a gift. Their returned attention and their time is always such a gift. So that was his premise. When my when I found out that my readers had forgotten about Dwayne, I was like, well, okay, then he's number one. He's the first one to come up. And he's an identical twin with less charisma. <laughs> right. He is an identical twin with significantly less charisma and no patience for BS, like, whatsoever. And I really enjoyed that about his character because three of the brothers have the charisma. And, I, and I'm looking forward to writing their stories as well. But... Uh, it's always fun to write a character who just doesn't put up with any brown nosing, any false praise, or really just put up with anybody's uh, back talk. And so I, I really appreciated that about him. He was he was great to write. So maybe that's why I was so surly when I wrote him is because he's kind of a surly guy. So yeah. and and let's be honest, we all have a little bit of Dwayne in us. I think we, so. We're just not necessarily willing to let it show. Right, we filter it. I think so. Let's talk about Cletus now. When when we first began production of this audiobook, you mentioned that Cletus truly had become a fan favorite. What yes. a great character you've created. Tell me about Cletus. Well, in every series that I write, there's always going to be a character who's similar to me. And so Cletus is that character in terms of the dry things that come out of his mouth and his observations and the non sequiturs and... Um, in my first series in Knitting in the City, I would say that Janie is the character that's very similar to me, although I'm not, I don't know as many random facts as she does. But Cletus, how he's curious about how things work and really, honestly, somewhat devious and <laughs> uses people to his own game. Um, I, I guess Cletus is the character that I, I wish I had the chutzpah to be. <laughs> but have too much of a 
social conscience <laughs> to actually become that person. But um, yeah, Cletus is a lot of fun to write. He's also, and, I, and I, I've said this to both my readers and my husband when I was writing Cletus. Uh, actually, when I write Cletus and his his lines come out, I'll actually sometimes stop and laugh and wonder where that came from. Sometimes this is almost as though he's whispering in my ear and he's like, hey, you know what would be a good idea? So he, he feels alive to me in a way that a lot of, well, most characters don't, to be honest. He he feels somewhat separate, but at the same time, I feel like I know him best. I was very gratified to see that readers had taken to him so much and that they appreciated his very unique perspective so much because it's a, it's a risk when you write a character that's as unique or strange as Cletus. And I think his story, which is going to be book number three, is going to be very unexpected for people. I've already plotted that out. Um, as unexpected as he is, I think his book will also be. Let's talk about the entire series and, and how many books will be in the Winston Brothers series. There will be six books because there are six brothers. So um, the order of the books, if I'm not mistaken, is Dwayne. And then uh, Jethro, Cletus, Bo, Roscoe, and then Billy. And when does the next book come out? The next book, which is called uh, Grin and Beard It, comes out next year in 2016. Penny, with your characters now, the beard almost becomes a character in this book. When I see someone in public that has a beard, I think to myself, which Winston brother is that? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of your fans do. Do you do the same thing? I actually, I do. <laughs> I do. And um, when we went to Tennessee the last time, there was a man who looked so much like what I picture Billy looking like. I was tempted to surreptitiously take a picture of him, but I didn't. So I'm not, again, I haven't escalated to that level of creeper, but I remember what he looks like. So there you go. When I, especially when I'm in Tennessee and I hear people talk and I see them at the jam session or I'll go to the Piggly Wiggly and we'll be picking up groceries. And there's a fellow there who's driving a pickup truck who has a beard. It's hard not to use that and absorb that for inspiration, but uh, maybe not so much in Florida, where I live, because most of the beards he you see here are um, hipsters. So <laughs> I don't know that any of the Winston brothers are hipsters at all, not even a little. But when I'm in Tennessee or if I'm someplace where the landscape is remarkable and it makes sense for a person to have a beard, I think that I, I definitely do that. And another thing we've seen, Penny, on the web, uh, we've seen a lot of people uh, take Dwayne and match him with an actor or a famous person or a model with a beard. That's also got to be fun for you to see. It is fun. It's fun for me to see because I, my readers in particular will send me emails <laughs> of pictures of people and say, uh, oh, look at this guy. This this is definitely Dwayne. This is exactly what I imagined him to look like. Or I'll get um, a fan mail from somebody who says that they've never written an author before, but please take a look at all of these pictures of beards that I have attached. And so that's a lot of fun because to see that the readers connect in that way. I actually have a male reader who grew a beard and then took a picture of the beard and said, you know, I hope this isn't weird, but I really enjoyed the book. And I, in deference to the book, I grew a beard, which I thought was really cool. So, well, yeah. don't you know, Penny, since narrating your audiobook, I haven't shaved. Are you serious? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not would, as much. <laughs> that would be completely bizarre. Well, and also, yeah. how does that work when you record? I mean, does the beard get in the way? I mean, inquiring minds want to know. If you well, had you a have, beard. Uh, you'd have to be quiet. So if it were to make any kind of noise whatsoever, it would be a distraction. Oh, geez. So it probably wouldn't work so well for you. Right. Well, don't tell my readers that because okay. – <laughs> <laughs> They're super excited to hear um, the audio book, and they keep asking me who's playing Dwayne, and I haven't told them yet. I want it to be – I want them to hear your voice and for them to um, picture Dwayne with your voice. So. Let's talk about production of the audio book because that's a whole different experience for an, an author and a, and a whole new way, I guess, for you to reach new fans. Yeah, so um, with – I had never actually considered doing audio books at all when I started to write uh, – books when I started to write novels. That probably was because at the time writing books was just a hobby and really truly just a hobby. I wrote my first book on a bet. So uh, and then the second one I put out there thinking nothing would happen and 
people started to enjoy it. And and when I wrote the third, I started getting uh, a quantity of fan mail. And in those messages, people would ask, are you going to have an audio book? I would love to have the audio book of this. And I didn't know where to start or to begin. So I did some research on it and found um, a website where I could actually produce the audio books, which I really like that idea of having all of the control and picking the voices and having them match the voices in my head. So um, finding you and finding Joy was just uh, – Joy narrated Beauty and the Mustache and did a phenomenal job. So I knew that I wanted to use it for Truth or Beard and also a number of the Winston Brothers books moving forward. But when I heard your audition, which I think I got your audition on the second day or the first or the second day, and I thought to myself, wow, this is too good to be true because Chris sounds exactly like Dwayne, like exactly. And so that was a little freaky and weird. So I took a step away from it and I didn't message you for a while because I thought, okay, well, again, too good to be true. But then um, as the other auditions came in and I found myself just really comparing everybody to your voice, I knew that you were the right one for the role. And then at one point, I think you and I spoke on the phone and that was extremely surreal because you sound, and I told you at the time, you sound like what Dwayne sounds like in my head when I write the, when I write his character, when I write his perspective. So, um, and even talking to you now is a little strange. I got to be honest. It's, um, it's a little off-putting. Um, but and, and let me let me jump in here, Penny, for a moment because when I when I first began narrating the audio book, I overthought it and changed the delivery just a little bit. And you call or I called you and you said, "You have to be you. Right. You, have to, you are Dwayne. Don't change you." That's right. I said uh, I I was when I received the first couple minutes, I uh, became very concerned that you were trying to act rather than just speak, and. Um, you, as I said, your voice and how you speak and your inflection and all of that. I mean, that is that is the character of Dwayne. So that was really, um, that was fantastic. And then the other character that you and I had a conversation about was Cletus, since he was such a fan favorite. And he is so odd. Um, making sure that his voice was just right was was absolutely key. And the third voice that I hadn't, well... It wasn't part of the original couple minutes for approval, but then when I listened to the book and I just was amazed, uh, how you did Jethro was exactly on target and exactly what he sounds like in my head. Because there is that subtle difference with Jethro, that he's older and um, he's a little, he's a little smarmy, but in a really lovable way. And so, um, yeah, so that was fantastic. I didn't, when I heard the book and I heard the completed book, it was just awesome. And then Joy has this talent for doing male voices where um where and, and also the other the other female voices and she has such a there's such a distinguishing sound between each of Joy's characters. So Claire sounds like Claire and Jessica definitely sounds like Jessica and she's got that comedic timing. I mean just amazing. And she had it in she had it in Beauty and the Mustache, and she had it in Truth or Beard, and um, Jessica is so different from Ashley, and she just did an amazing job with it. And then also the male, as I said, the male voices, you can really tell when it's a, a female versus a male, and it's not just lowering the voice. She she thinks about each of the characters and how different they're going to sound, and she really sketches it out and does a great job. So I'm really proud of this audiobook. I think that both of you did a phenomenal job. Thank you, Penny. And I want to say Joy and I would talk a lot while we were producing it together and that she was a joy to work with and is a very talented actress. And if you made the characters come off the page, she certainly made the characters come to life in her delivery because she truly is a fantastic performer. She really is. I I think we should send her a cake. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's with with a guy with a beard on with it. With a guy with a beard on uh, it, yeah. right. Speaking of that, the cover of Truth or Beard. Uh, how did you come up with that? It's very odd. Did you cross stitch that? I didn't cross stitch it. So I do all of my own covers and all of my own graphics. And just because I like to do it, um, it's really a sickness. I enjoy Photoshop quite a lot. So when I was thinking about the covers for the Winston Brothers series, I knew that I wanted them to be different. And a lot of my author friends said to me, oh, 
ha ha, now you have to put a shirtless guy on a cover. And I'd always like swore to myself that I would never put a shirtless guy on any, on any of my book covers. Not that there's anything wrong with having a shirtless guy on a book cover, but I, I feel like it would be, um, misrepresent, it wouldn't represent what the content of the book is. And since it was a series about six guys, the author community at large, um, had assumed that was the direction that I was going to be going was putting those kinds of covers together. So I thought to myself, what could be, what would be the opposite of that? What would be the absolute opposite of what is expected? And I ran across a tutorial on how to do cross stitch in Photoshop. And so I started messing around and, um, I got a graphic off of Shutterstock. It was just a, a vector graphic of just a beard. And I started mixing and matching the beard graphics with the hair graphics and came up with a graphic representation for each of the brothers. And I thought, okay, well, maybe Bethany Winston, um, their mother, might have cross-stitched um, silhouettes of each of her sons. And so I could even picture her hanging those up in her house. And so I just started messing around thinking I would just use it as a promo graphic. But once it started coming together, once I started doing the cross stitch for Dwayne, which I thought was going to be a promo image, started coming together, I realized that it would make a very recognizable and memorable book cover. And so I just decided to go with it. I um, I think that we're in a golden age of publishing and I think that authors have more control now than they've ever had before if they're willing to take it. And I like to do what's unexpected. And I like to even I even like I mean, I like to be weird. I mean, there it is. And so I don't think anybody was expecting a cross stitch book cover for a romance novel. Well, um, I think for me personally, the, everyone that I've come in contact with that's seen the book, they pick it up and they look at it and they go, <laughs> truth or beard? And then they see the cross stitch pattern and they say, what is this? Right. So I think intrigued is exactly right. Right. It, it, it's, it's intriguing because it's not, again, it's not what you expect. It's like the Spanish Inquisition. My book covers are like the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody ever expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> and uh, I don't think anybody expected a cross stitch book cover. And it was just so much fun first of all, to put together, but then also to see people's reactions. When I go to signings, as you say, people will come up and walk up and pick up the book and say, what is this? And then um, I think they really like the idea that we can be so creative and not be subject to maybe what a publisher thinks the market wants to see. So, No, I think you nailed it. Okay. And, you know, you hit, on, you hit on something that I think that we should hit on in case someone is listening to this right now that might want to be a writer someday. Uh, you talked about where we are in the world of publishing. You also said that you didn't think that you would become the writer that you have become. So if someone is out there listening and they think, maybe I could write, I want to do this, what would you tell them? I would say absolutely. I mean, as I said earlier, I wrote my first book on a on a bet. And I'd always written short stories. But prior to maybe just three or four years ago, all authors were beholden to New York and publishers. And they were the gatekeepers for what it was readers wanted to see, and they really got to make that decision. But now through independent publishing, which used to be a joke, I mean, honestly, um, it was what a lot of people would consider, well, you couldn't get a publishing deal, so I guess you can throw your career away and self-publish this book. Not that my books are of this ilk or of this type, but with Fifty Shades of Grey was a was maybe started the entire the movement of um, self-publishing. I think she was with a she was self-published on Wattpad or one of those um, fan fiction websites, and then moved to a small press and had such a giant following. And then you have people like Colleen Hoover who felt compelled to write books, and she just threw her first book up on Amazon as a self-published novel and hit the New York Times bestseller list. And I think what's really great is that readers are now in control of content rather than publishers. And personally, I've been approached by a number of the big five in um, New York about acquiring at first the Knitting in the City series and then acquiring the Winston, Winston Brothers series. And I've always been told without fail by um, the publishers that my my female characters in particular aren't very relatable, that they're um, 
they don't use the word too smart, but that they have too much personality. And so as, as long as I can tone that down, as long as I can make them more palatable to a larger audience, that they would be very interested in acquiring my books. But, you know, readers don't want dumbed down characters. They want to be treated like intelligent adults, which they are. So now with self-publishing, you can have a lot of niche markets and you can hit a lot of readers that you would have absolutely no access to in the past. So it's if anybody wants to write a book, if they feel that as a passion, if they feel that as something compulsory that they must do, now is absolutely the best time to do it. How does it work for you? Do you write every day, in the morning, at night, whenever you feel it? How do you plot out a book and make it happen? I try to write every single day and hit at least a thousand words a day, and that doesn't always happen. Um, I just recently had, we just recently had our third child, and so she's two and a half months. So I'm lucky these days if I get if I get a thousand words on a great day. But prior to the arrival of our latest tiny dictator, I would write at night after work. I would um, at work. And then writing is so much different than the analytical things that I would do during my full-time job. Writing is very much a creative endeavor. So I didn't really feel the mental exhaustion at the end of the day towards writing that I might feel towards looking at a SAS data set or running an analysis. So at the end of the day, I would just sit and write and, as cheesy as it sounds, let the characters speak through me to the page. Yeah, that does and, sound really, really cheesy. No, it sounds real. And okay. it sounds like you, you, your husband was very supportive also. Well, he, yeah, he's very supportive. I'm not much of a TV watcher. Um, I knit. Um, I cross-stitch. I do a lot of, like, crafty hand-making make, things. But I'm not really one for banal conversation or chit-chat. And neither is he. So we each have our own pursuits and at the end of the day, it helped me relax. And so um, I think you saw the benefit in that. And then as things started to become successful, I think it was just as strange for him to see as it was for me to see that there is a market out there for for these smart romance novels. So that was fun. That's one of the things I was going to ask you, too, also, is that when you write do you see that perfect reader that might be reading your books? Do you write for guys or for girls, or is it just anybody? I write for anybody. Um, there are my largest male audience actually, I think, lives in um, Sweden. I've received a lot of letters, email messages um, from Northern Europe from males, which is interesting to me. But no, it's it's really written for anybody. Some of my books might be better suited to females uh, just because of the nature of what we're told to expect growing up, that I think growing up girls are Disney princesses and boys are playing football. But I'd like to think that there's just as many romantics who are of the uh, XY chromosome as there are of the female chromosome. So I, I don't discriminate when I write my books, and I hope that the content is is of a nature that it would be appealing to both. In my other series, in the Knitting in the City series, I have books that the central focus is on Bitcoins and um, the creator of Bitcoins and the NSA, and there's some intrigue there. And that seems to be my most popular book with men, is uh, that one. What are you working on right now? Right now, I am writing the fifth book in the Knitting in the City series, and it's entitled Happily Ever Ninja. And it's about Fiona and Greg, who are a married couple. They've been married for 14 years. And uh, what that looks like, a snapshot in a in a married couple's life, what, what that looks like. So again, something that I like to do is not write what's expected. So I thought, well, what could be less expected than writing a romance novel about a couple that's been married for 14 years and has kids? And I guess the main question is, we have all of these books about first love or falling in love, the beginnings of love. And why is that so attractive? Why is being in love something that, and I guess I could speak from the female audience, why is that something that's appealing and something that we long for. And I guess it's because, from my perspective, because there's a long game after that. The most exciting part of 
any relationship I don't think is the beginning of the relationship. I think it's the enduring parts that come after. And so I wanted to write a book about that. Penny, on the final thoughts, you have a very strong following of fans and readers. And I know you have uh, some, some social networking. You're on Twitter, and you've also got a blog that they can go and see. But what, what do you want your fans to know, those who have uh, enjoyed so many Penny Reed books? I guess, what do I want them to know? Oh, geez, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Uh, my first thought was about like the refugee crisis going on in Turkey. But that's not, I think, what you meant. Um, but I hope that they all know about that. Um, I guess what I would like for them to know is that I'm never going to write to a formula and I'm never going to write what's expected. And I take my brand seriously. And I also have no intention of, I have no intention of changing the content of my books in order to make them more palatable to a greater audience. So just FYI. So don't expect it because it's not ever going to happen. Well said. But that's why we love your work. Thank you. That's nice of you to say. On behalf of myself and Joy, I want to say thank you for letting us be a part of this project. It it was very exciting and uh, and both of us truly enjoyed it a whole lot. Well, thank you so much for um, respecting the work and doing a phenomenal job with it. This has been Truth or Beard, Winston Brothers Book One, written by Penny Reed, narrated by Joy Nash and Chris Sprinkley. Copyright 2015 by CypherNot LLC. Production copyright 2015 by CypherNot LLC. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. 